Yes, it is that time once again, the captain's cast. Captain is back, even on Easter Sunday. Why, hello. Hi, how are you? I am Captain Garrett of the Swords and Starship Channel, and you are watching the captain's cast live on YouTube, Rumble, and X, formerly Twitter, and we are going to be talking about uh, Gamergate cringe. <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. The Gamer, Gamergate strikes back. Dude, the loons, the loons are losing. <laughs> they, they're losing, and they're, they're losing their minds. They're going nuts, man. <laughs> and uh, Godzilla X Kong, or is it Godzilla versus Kong, or Godzilla and Kong? I, I don't understand this title. Why is it Godzilla X Kong? I just, you know, I've never been less interested in seeing a movie in my life, so I have not seen it. So maybe, you know, let, we'll take a look at the the Rotten Tomatoes scores, but uh, we got other things to talk about. I've been watching Three Body Problem, and uh, you and I, Full Man Blue, we we got to have a conversation about Three Body Problem. I'm so fascinated. Your thoughts on this? I have thoughts on this. It's this, again, sort of like Rebel Moon, this is one of those things that I wanted it to be good. I wanted to just, there. there's, I thought it was going to be good. It was kind of pulling me right in, just like, like tractor beam sucked me right in, I thought. So we got to talk about, we got to talk about the problems with three body problem. And, uh, and also, you know, I have had fallout on the brain a lot lately. If you don't know your captain has decided to compete with Amazon. <laughs> and that, that, that's a fool's errand if I ever heard one. However, hear me out. Hear me out, brah. So, like, I think the Fallout series is going to be crap. Like, I, I'm on the record. This is a bold prediction. I'm telling you, I just, I'm reading the tea leaves. And I'm telling you, I've got a gut feeling that this Fallout show is going to be shit. So why not do something better? Well, I'm doing it. So in April, we're going to be launching Fallout Dead Man's Cash, which is a t tabletop RPG, a role-playing game. I will be the game master, and some of you in the audience will be the players, and we will be creating our own adventure. And if, if you have ever seen, and you haven't, I don't think. If you've ever seen me run a RPG game, you know that I'm a little bit insane. I'm a little bit crazy. I run it as if I'm writing an HBO series. So we're going to have a lot of fun. Or it's going to be a cringe disaster. Either way, it'll be great content. So how, how are you, chat? What? Anthony Rondelli, he's playing in Fallout. He's going to be a character. Ahoy! And welcome aboard. So I just felt like, you know, I'm so tired of the bad news. I might just, you know, blow off all the news and we'll just talk Fallout the whole stream. What do you think about that, chat? Starfury is in the chat. A proper British tar is Starfury. And uh, he's more of a, a space tar than a, you know, nautical, well, maritime tar. But uh, Starfury is here. Says all aboard, toot toot. <laughs> you got that from Tom, Starfury. You got that from Tom. This is your influence. I blame you. Wrangler says, Happy Easter and hail. Yes, Happy Easter. Uh, he is risen. I'm not. I'm not much of a holy roller. So, <laughs> but, but, but you know something? I'll tell you, I, I went through a full blown atheist phase in my life and uh, I wouldn't call myself uh, religious. I, I don't, I don't see myself ever returning to, let's just say, the old religion. Uh, however, however, um, Seeing, seeing, going all the way to the very farthest uh, extent of the atheist arguments and living in that uh, paradigm for many years and then sort of watching how those arguments utterly failed in the world of reason and civilization and liberty, 
uh, it, it, it convinced me. It convinced me there's something deeply wrong with these arguments. And, and believe me, I know all the arguments on both sides very deeply and intricately. So I could, I, I literally could spar, I could spar with either side. Pro, you know, is there a God, isn't there a God? I, I could argue either case very effectively. But where I'm just at a point where I'm like, um, I absolutely believe in empirical science and empirical data. And, but, but that is like saying, you know, um, it's like reading one page of the novel and then refusing to turn the next page. There's so much more to the universe than we know, so uh, we'll just wrap that up. I believe in God. I do. I've changed my mind. And I'm sharing that just with you, my dear audience. Stormcrow is in the chat. Stormcrow, ahoy, why, hello there. That's a very affectionate emoji you sent. So, <laughs> that's, uh, yeah, it's well, uh, yeah, but yeah, uh, you know, you should have a stiff upper lip in the Navy. There's, there's such a funny line of, like, NPC dialogue in Mass Effect 3 in the Citadel DLC. You're like, you go to this charity ball as Shepard, and you're undercover in this mission, and there's these two Asari, who are the kind of thousand-year-old, ageless, and kind of superior types, and they're just these two rich Asari women, because they're all women, and uh, they're just talking amongst themselves, and they're basically like limousine liberals. That's basically what they are, because they're like, oh, you poor humans, you're so brave. And then, <laughs> and then Shepard says, uh, she's like, do, do you have a place to stay, dear? And Shepard says, yes, I have a place to stay. <laughs> and she's like, so you had nothing before that? Oh, you humans are so brave. What's that expression of yours? A stiff one in the lips? <laughs> and then Shepard's like, uh, that's a stiff upper lip. She's like, oh, of course. What did I say? <laughs> I was like, I love stuff like that. I love little... Dude, the, the Citadel DLC was amazing in Mass Effect. It really was. Uh, Stavjari says, At Wrangler had a great stream yesterday. Well, cheers to Wrangler and a captain salute. And uh, yeah, I had some fun on the, the Wrangler stream on Monday as well. So that was cool. Anthony saying, how are you? Uh, to the chat and to the captain, I presume. And I am well, Anthony. I, you know, I've had, I also, AKA Rondo. I know we talk, I have had, uh, I've had ups and downs the last couple of weeks. I won't lie. As, as the captain, uh, the, you know, it's, I've, I've been in a weird mood lately. I, so I've, uh, but that being said, the street, the, the YouTube channel is growing. Dude, dude, we clocked in over 5,000 views last month on the Sword and Starship channel. 5,000. Now, that may not be much to someone like, uh, you know, Critical Drinker, obviously, because he does 5,000 in a minute. But but you got to start somewhere. But but that surprised me. I was like, 5,000 in a month. We can work with this. So the, the channel is growing, and that's due to you, my dear sailors and starnuts. I would not be here without you. I would not. And Wrangler saying, hail Crow, hail Rondo. Three body throwdown. I do you like it or do you not like it, Fu Man Blue? Let me know. <laughs> I'm I'm not gonna tip my hand just yet. I'm kind of you might my thoughts might surprise you. Uh Rondo says been playing Fallout 4 in preparation for Dead Man's Cash. Absolutely, as well you should. Fallout 4 is, uh, I know it's a bit, con a lot of people don't like it for some reason. I think there's a lot of diehard Fallout fans that do not like that the character talks, that your character talks. I do like that. I do understand the case, the argument against, like, the. there were more dialogue options in some of the, pre like, Fallout New Vegas and Fallout 3, and I understand that argument, and that definitely makes sense. I also think that one of the problems is your character doesn't have quite, you know, the range of of dialogue choices isn't quite as good in Fallout 4. So I think that's like the most clear criticism I've heard. But like, I love Fallout 4. My only critique of it is the story was a little bit thinner than in Fallout. Like New Vegas is like got a huge story with a lot of moral choices and Fallout 3 also pretty good. But yeah, but then again, uh, I really enjoyed all the factions. I love the Commonwealth. The environments are gorgeous. And uh, I thought that the, the core story just had a brilliant hook. I think the Institute was brilliant. 
I mean, this is crazy because I played Fallout 3 again recently and I had not played it in years. We're talking like over a decade probably. And uh, dude, there's a Fallout 3 takes place 10 years before Fallout 4. In Rivet City, in the Capital Wasteland, you run into a guy who is from the Institute and he's hunting down a fugitive synth. And I was shocked. I was like, damn, I forgot about that. So, so they already were... Dude, the lore was already there for the Institute and that whole conflict in Fallout 3, which is damn impressive. That is damn impressive. So it's a great series. Uh, Stormcrow says, uh, Captain Garrett, it was a fool's errand to fight Goliath. And tell me again how David won. You just need one good shot. You're damn right. You're damn right. Shepard is a, you know, Commander Shepard in uh, Mass Effect is a David and Goliath story. Godzilla minus one is a David and Goliath story, a brilliant one. Uh, and he says, HBO series, there better be some spicy scenes. That's how you make real money. We're on YouTube, Stone Crow. And also, you know, <laughs> like, you know, I have my limits, okay? Uh, the captain, the captain will, let, let's just say nothing, nothing is going to be more spicy than Mass, than a mass Effect. Let's just put it that way. Probably less so, you know, I'll just be like, and... Stormcrow goes off into the tent <laughs> and has a great night. And that's probably the extent of the roleplay you're going to get in that area. <laughs> but but there you go. But that being said, there will be wonderful NPCs. You can become friends with them, allied with them, whatever. Y you never know as a GM with NPCs. Like, I used to design NPCs, and I used to, like, create, like, all the reasons the characters were going to like them. And it just never worked. It just never worked. They'd like this character that I was kind of a throwaway character, and then they would hate characters I had all these plans for. So I kind of just try and create a range of interesting characters that have a purpose in the world, and we'll just see what the players do with them. So so you create the story as much as the GM does. Stafiori says, shouldn't it be three girl boss fix everything problem? We're going to talk about that, Stafiori. That's a great point. And uh, <laughs> I may need your help with Fu Man Blue today. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to. You know what, though? Uh, Stop, Yuri. You mentioned on Wrangler Stream Weekly Wing It uh, that if we did a Mass Effect RPG, you would be there. And uh, stay tuned, Stop, Yuri. Stay tuned. Uh, first things first. That's all I have to say. Do I? I'll do a. I'll do a Mass Effect story any to any day. Uh, Stormcrow says, sir, just don't become a woke religion fanatic. Trust me, you are more spiritually healthy than anything the woke parasites will ever be. Well, a dubious suggestion, but I appreciate the sentiment, Stormcrow. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Wokeness is the best argument against wokeness I've ever seen. Like, the way they behave as people is, to me, perfect. That Like, that's perfect. They've, they've... In fact, I even would argue that to the extent wokeness is losing, it's more because of them being who they are and people seeing their behavior than anything that, you know, a conservative movement or a moderate movement or anything else has, has actually done. You know, so so in, in a, I really do think they are analogous to Gollum in the Lord of the Rings books, you know, stealing the ring and, and the ring sort of through Gollum destroying itself. I just, I think that, and I, by the way, and I love the Peter Jackson films are the greatest films ever made. However, I did not like it that he changed it so that Frodo kind of tussles with Gollum at the end. I thought that was, that was, I understand the cinematic reason for it, but it, you know, it kind of stole some of the, the glory from that beautiful uh, fable ending that Tolkien had in the book. So, you know, but the imperfect, but still what a blessing to have those. Look, all I'm saying is, um, I, I, I don't try, I don't believe or disbelieve anything with regards to religion. I just simply look for what I feel and know in my gut. And, uh, I, I'm not, I'm not going to be starting up a, a televangelist stream anytime soon. <laughs> But that being said, uh, I just know that to believe that 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 like all we are is what we see scientifically is silly. Like that's silly. 
Because science doesn't know shit. Science does not know shit. I'm not saying, I believe me, I love the scientific method. It's how we figure out how to, how to live in this world, and it's a valuable tool. It's a valuable investigative and, and diagnostic and intellectual tool. And it is, a, is it, a, it is a foundational component and pillar of reason and civilization. I'm not denying any of that. But what I'm saying is it's only one pillar. There are other pillars to our existence, and most of them are invisible, and we don't even know, we don't even understand what they are, which is sort of the point of science, you know? Uh, so, yeah. There we go. Wrangler says, when it comes to theology, the captain can box. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> let's not get crazy, Wrangler. Uh, Stafiari says, by the way, I have gone full uh, relig relig-tard? What does that mean, Stafiari? <laughs> I, I've I like where that's relictard. Okay. Stop here. He's gone full relictard. All right. We'll get into it. But Fu Man Blue with a $20 super chat. My goodness, Fu Man Blue. Hey, where is my applause? There it is. Thank you, sir. You're, you're too generous, Fu Man Blue. Just promise me. <laughs> promise me. That you only donate what you have to donate, okay? You never have to donate anything on the stream. I'm, I'm trusting you <laughs> that, like, 20 bucks, no big thing, all right? So, But but that being said, I appreciate the support, Fu Man Blue. I really do. It means a lot. I appreciate all your support. You're here on a Sunday, on an Easter. And if you got things to do, I understand. But if you're here, it means you're making an investment in this channel. And uh, I planned... I plan for this channel to be a return on investment for your time. So we're working on growing it. We're working on expanding it. We're going to have a great Fallout RPG. But let's get to Fu Man Blue's Super Chat. Now, the problem is I may not have gotten to this part in the show, Fu Man Blue, but here we go. Quote, I'll go. And then the other character replies, who are you? Edgar. Don't be a retard, Edgar. I'm talking about serious people. And Fu Man Blue goes on to say, anything bad you have to say about Three Body is going to have to be more damning than that line is amazing to change my to change my mind. I don't think I got to that part, Fu Man Blue. I, and I'm not I'm not saying the show is a total fail. I'm not I'm not actually pronouncing a final judgment on the show at all. Uh, what I'm more gonna do is give you my reaction. And uh, I'm going to share with you some of my frustrations with it, which uh, which actually are kind of part of a larger issue in in these types of shows rather than anything. It's you know I'm not gonna I don't it's not like the wokest show ever, um, but I definitely I definitely sense a lot of women and STEM energy in this show. It's like they they have the obligatory scene when a dude comes up to two of the scientist ladies at the bar. And he's like, can I buy you a drink? <laughs> and, of course, you know, and he, he's not like he's not like unattractive or anything. You know, he seems like, a you know, reasonably attractive guy. And can I buy you a drink? And they're and uh, and I forget. He says something to him. He's like, oh, what do you do? And, and then they're like, well, I and just vomits out a bunch of tech talk. And I investigate string theory and quantum, you know, photonic environments and whatever. And then the second and then the other scientist lady gives her spiel of like what she does and then he's like oh these are smart women is the look on his face i have to go now i got served and he just walks away and i was like of course a fucking course he did it's like here here's my issue with that right i don't have that's actually that's actually kind of a uh that's a classic trope in storytelling uh getting caught with your pants down as a character you know, you misjudge someone and they turn the tables. That's all fine. I'm not actually arguing with that. What I'm arguing with is the trope of him slinking away in shame. That's what I think is stupid about it. Because what if this? What if instead he were like, damn. Uh, you know what? Take back that drink I bought him. Yeah, the bottom shelf. The good stuff. Yeah. And, and he was interested in them. He was like, all right, let's do this, you know? So tell me about string theory. You know, and, and, uh, and maybe he joked with him a little bit, like, oh, my highest math education is uh, addition, you know? And, and and then he was funny, and they were a little delighted. All I'm saying is there's only ever one scenario that plays out in modern storytelling now, which is uh, girl boss have to girl boss, and then man have to get served and slink away in, in defeat. 
And and what this implies is that the the man has been humiliated because he's in the presence of intelligence women, intelligent women. And I think that is stupid as hell. I think that's stupid as hell. And it portrays men in a stereotypical way as if as if all men want to date a woman that's dumb. <laughs> like that's not true. That's not true. And there's plenty of great interactions in like old school, like movies and stuff where like kind of a dumb guys with a smart girl and whatever. So, so why not play with that? Why not be playful? Um, what I'm getting at is it's boring. It's just, it's boring. So there's that, but, uh, but we'll get into it. Fu Man Blue. Thank you for that very fine super chat. And my goodness, stop Yuri, stop Yuri with two pounds sterling. Two pounds sterling says some money for Easter votive wine. Well, thank you, Stop Yuri. Just coffee for me today. Cheers to you, Stop Yuri, and all of my dear sailors and star. Well, I'm s I misread that. I'm so used to you sending two pounds, Star Yuri. I totally misread that. I apologize, my good sir. That's five pounds sterling. Five pounds sterling sends Stavyari. Well, thank you. Thank you indeed. That's like a hundred dollars American. <laughs> That's a lot of money, Stavyari. That's like because you know the pound, the pound is a lot more than the dollar these days. So. Uh Stavyari says he's an he's an N7 Alcor. <laughs> I love that. Uh let's see. With amusement and mirth, Star Fury, you are such a character. I find that very humorous. Uh, Fu Man Blue says, <laughs> I didn't know you had finished it. I have not. No, I've not finished uh, Three Body Problem. Oh, you said Hatton. Right. I haven't finished it. And, and that's part of my problem with it is... Uh, I'm getting this feeling that I'm being played. That's what I'm getting at. So we'll just jump into it. But uh, Fu Man Blue says the bar scene was cringe as frack, but it's a it's a believable scene because these women would have no interest in him, nor would he care for them. I, uh, well, that is a plausible scenario. That is a plausible scenario. What I'm saying is it's equally plausible that that's how it starts. But that's not how it ends. So, so I guess what I'm saying is, you know, when you're when you're writing dialogue as a writer, your goal should be to create situations in which the characters surprise each other with with their reactions to things. And all I'm suggesting is, yes, that's one way it can go. By the way, it's the way it always, always goes in current day. Right. That's my issue. It always, always goes that way. Also, I don't actually find it that realistic because the reality is just because that guy is not a scientist does not mean he wouldn't be intrigued. In fact, they're probably more interesting than most of the women he runs into. He probably runs into, hey, shots. And it's like, he's bored of that. What if this time he's like, well, I kind of struck pay dirt. And then what if he turns the tables on them? They think, oh, this is the part where he slinks away, but he turns out to be kind of funny and witty. And even though he's not as smart as they are, he's also charming and he's got a sense of humor. Like, I just think that that, that could have been a more interesting scene. So I'm not disagreeing with you that it's plausible. I'm just saying I'm tired of this. I'm tired of them spamming this trope in every stupid show. So Fu Man Blue says, it makes no sense to try to make time with someone that isn't your people to that extreme, but he didn't try. He was a deer in the headlights, which is which is understandable in that uh, he he was surprised by how intelligent they were. And if you don't know, I'm talking about a, an early scene in the three body problem when two of the women and STEM, uh, two of the two of the two of the particle collider scientists are sitting at a bar talking amongst themselves. And they just sneer at this at this young man who tries to buy him a drink and chat him up a little bit, and the, and it's like the, the scene is so it's so played as though like like the worst thing to a man is to encounter an intelligent woman like like he has nothing after that like his whole life is over if a man encounters a woman that's smarter than him uh 
reality has broken <laughs> in front of his very eyes. The entire false delusion he'd been living in his entire life has been shattered and he'll never recover. I mean, this is the attitude of the writers, right? And it's stupid it, because in a way it almost implies that it's unusual to encounter intelligent women in the world. It's like, no, it isn't. No, it isn't. Uh, you know, so I dislike that they are they are stereotyping men this way. So my issue is not that he's not interested. My issue is like he's he 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 doesn't even try. He doesn't even say anything funny. The only purpose of the scene is the message. That's the only reason for that stupid scene. It it is the lowest common denominator interaction between characters in a strictly story sense. I'm saying, right? And there's more shit later in the show. There's a scene where those same two, I think it's those same two women are at a funeral for one of the other women, uh, or no, 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 for one, yeah, it was, it was another woman in STEM. <laughs> Look, I'm not, that's going to sound, whatever. You, you understand the captain. Uh, another brave, stunning woman in STEM who killed herself in the show, uh, they're at her wake. And uh, one of them says, and uh, one of the, what are the names? I guess I should get the names of these characters because I'm telling you, it's such a snore fest that I had a hard time remembering the names of the characters in this. Uh, three body problem, there it is. Character number one, character number two, character number three. I mean, that's kind of how, what, what? What are you giving me here, IMDb? All right, I had it linked. One second, delay of game. Um. Let's grab some character names. Uh, Isa. Okay. Isa is hallucinating a countdown, right? She's hallucinating a countdown. And she's talking to Jess, I think. I think it's Jess. And, uh, oh, wait, no, those are the names of the act. Never mind. Augie. Augie is the chick who's talking to Jin. And uh, she's talking about how she went to the neurologist to get checked out. And then Jin says... Oh, what did he say? Meaning the doctor. What did he say? And then Augie says, uh, she. And then Jin says, oh my, oh God, help me. And she's horrified. She's she's basically, oh my God, it's my internalized misogyny talking. And I'm like, oh, fuck off. Just fuck off. I don't care about, you know, it's like, <laughs> there is this tweet. <laughs> there is... Uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I'll show this. It's a Douglas Adams tweet that just dismantles the whole problem with DEI, with DEI, the mindset of it and where it comes from. He basically says, this is a female mindset. Like being a victim all the time is a female mindset. It's a, it's also a child mindset, right? And he says, uh, and it can be a male mindset. The difference is, uh, when men do this, it is deeply unattractive to other men and other women. So men have to learn to stuff that shit down. Men going around crying about their problems makes them deeply unattractive to women, right? Makes them deeply, and it frankly, it makes them, uh, you know, it, it, it betrays weakness. It betrays weakness. And in, in the world of maleness, that's just not, not a good thing. And so men learn from an early age not to go around, or they usually do anyway, they learn that there are consequences for going around whining all the time and demanding people's sympathy all the time and demanding people's affirmation all the time. Men don't have that luxury. And so Douglas Adams' point is this entire philosophy is a female, is a female philosophy. And he's not saying all females. He's, he's saying like based females don't think this way. Based women, alpha women, don't think this way either. They don't like this mindset either. So his point is not to paint women with a broad brush, but he's saying that this is a leftist female's way of looking at the world and that it's a luxury they can afford because they don't care. <laughs> like, they don't care if they're perceived as weak, you know, whatever. Men can't afford that luxury. Now, you may not like my opinion on that, but that's the reality. It's like, that's just how it is. That's just how it is. That, you know, so I think that's an interesting take on it. Um, it's turning every single show into, uh, you know, just weak, sniveling men <laughs> and, uh, and, and unhappy girl boss women who are bitching all the time about the patriarchy. You know, five years ago, you never would have heard me speak this way about this stuff. Uh, I was I was much more interested in those days in the kind of intellectual arguments of the story. And it's like, 
I've arrived at a point in my life where I'm not taking this shit anymore. I'm not taking this shit anymore. You know, I if I see this crap in a show, uh, I'm going to call it out. I'm just about that point, And I don't care. <laughs> I just don't care about, you know, well, let's just have a good time. Let's just enjoy things. And if you enjoy things, fine. And more power to you. I'm just not going to sit there, and 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 I'm not saying this is you, Fu Man Blue. Don't misunderstand. I'm speaking in a general way. I'm just not going to sit there and accept this crap anymore. I just won't. So anyway. Oh, geez. You guys are you're hitting me with too many things in the chat, all right? Um, <clears throat> let me just get to the... Let me just get the bottom line for Fu Man Blue so we can kind of get our discussion going here. Here's my issue with Three Body Problem. It's, it's, uh, it's extremely fascinating at the beginning. I love the idea of the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Uh, I think that's great. I, but I will say this. This is something very good in, in the show, and that is the absolutely bone-chilling, stunning portrayal of Maoist communism in China. Like, like the, the first scene in the show is absolutely incredible, and it totally sucked me in. I was totally into this show for, like, the first episode. And I'm still kind of... I'm still interested. I'm still kind of half in, despite the things that are bothering me about it. I'm still kind of half in. But they show this struggle session in the beginning uh, during the communist revolution in China, where this man is, he's a scientist. He's a scientist who is being beaten to death in front of a, of a group because he will not bow to the message. And it's like, it was so chilling because I'm like, dude, this is... This is the world that the Wokies, if we don't stop, if we do not push back, this is the world they are building for us. And, and there's not a doubt in my mind. That's where that's headed. That is where, that is where wokeness is headed at its furthest extreme. Um, because quite frankly, they already, during a couple of years ago, they were, rem they were banning doctors and scientists they were Squarespace. The, the, the web hosting service Squarespace was removing licensed medical practitioners' websites who dared to question the science on you-know-what in 2020. Okay, so my point is there's evidence galore that this is already the way they think. That if you think a scientist in a struggle session is not going to happen if the Wokies get control of everything, oh, it's going to happen and a lot worse than that. So so I appreciate that element of it. So, so there, it, it unintentionally criticized wokeness. I appreciate that. Then we go to the future, and I do like I do like that character also. And uh, her older self is played by Keiko O'Brien. Uh, I mean, the fictional character, Chief O'Brien's wife in uh, Star Trek, Keiko O'Brien. She plays the older version of that lady. Um, what's her name? Let me see, Rosalind Chow. Yeah, I think it's Rosalind Chow. And uh, Jonathan Price is in this, which is kind of interesting. I'm curious to see what he's up to. Um, yeah, she plays this doctor who's in communist China and she kind of winds up working on this SETI kind of project and now she's in the present and she's retired. So there's something going on with her. Uh, so I like her character a lot. I'm kind of fascinated by what's going on there. Uh, the problem I have with the show is I start to get the feeling they're stringing me along. There's not, there's a lot of, there's a lot of mystery box going on. And what I'm starting to feel is that what's going to happen is I'm going to get to the last episode of this. And I've heard other people kind of say this already who've seen it the whole way through, which is part of why I'm kind of nervous. I'm going to get to the end of this. Very little will have happened, and I'm going to feel cheated again. And uh, and I'm just sick of that feeling. I'm just sick of it. I'm tired of investing eight hours in a show and getting nothing out of it. I'm tired, and, and I mean this in a strictly storytelling structure way. If you are not going to pay off the promise of the premise, I've got no time. I've got no time for your show, movie, whatever. If you are not going to pay off the promise of the premise, that's the fun and games. That's what we came to see, right? It's a it's an alien movie where you never see the alien. It's a it's a Godzilla movie where Godzilla never attacks the city. You, that's what I'm getting at. The promise of the premise. This is a alien intelligence contacting us story where I'm getting the feeling we're never going to see any aliens. There's never going to be any real payoff to that. I'm not saying I could, I could be wrong. I'm just saying I, if that's what happens, I'm going to be mad. I'll finish it. I will finish it. But, but there are other shows that have done this to me, such as there was a show called, um, what the hell was the name of that show that was on Netflix years ago? The OSA or something. It was, uh, 
Netflix show about NDEs. What was the name of that show? I would think it would pull it right up. Um, Near Death Experiences. No, it's not Surviving Death. Come on. It it was a show about a girl who survives. Um, I think she survives an attempt at suicide, and she winds up in this evil scientist, played by Jason Isaacs, by the way. She winds up in his lab as a kind of lab rat, and he's this mad scientist who's investigating near-death experiences and their ability to, to cross over and see the other side. Um, and it was really, really interesting, but it... but it just kind of went nowhere at the end and I just felt cheated. And so there's just a lot of shows that wind up like that. And I hate that. And, uh, you know, Loki season one kind of wound up that way for me. And I was into Loki season one when I started watching it. And it just, at the end, it was nothing. It was nothing. And it's like, I get so tired of that, that, uh, you know, I, I, that's my problem with three body problem is I'm into the idea. I just feel like it's not a very, I feel like they don't want to give me what I want. You know what I mean? I feel like they don't... I, look, I I love the film Contact with Jodie Foster. I'm a big fan. It was written uh, based on the novel written by uh, Carl Sagan. And it's a it's a brilliant movie. I, the, the ending leaves some things to be desired, I will admit. But but the ride to that ending is, is excellent. The ride to that ending is, is beautiful. So uh, Contact is an example of a kind of story like Three Body Problem that I feel mostly pays off well and is and holds up because I've watched it again recently and I still really like it. So that's kind of my issue. So we'll get into it, Fu Man Blue. Now, Storm Crow had some questions. What were your questions, Storm Crow? You said, who is the best girl of Fallout 4? That's a tough question to answer. You're, you're speaking, of course, of uh, companions you can romance. Mm. I really like Kate, the the redhead that you meet in the combat zone, and she's basically just like a pit fighter. And she's got an Irish accent. She's got this this cute Irish lilt. So I, I'm tempted to say her, but honestly, I think it's Curie. I think it's Curie. And I if you I don't want to explain exactly where that goes because it is it would be kind of a spoiler but you you find this uh this miss nanny robot who's a scientist named curie in in an old vault in fallout 4 and she has a cute little french accent and she and she's she's you know she's she's curious about the world and she wants to like save lives and stuff and you can go on kind of an arc that results in her becoming a companion and i don't want to say more than that if you haven't played it because it is a, it is a really wonderful twist with her story, but I, I think it's probably Curie. It's probably Curie. I like Kate a lot, though. I like Kate a lot. So there you go. I know Fu Man Blue. I, we're, it's not really an argument. <laughs> we're not arguing here. I mean, I think I agree with you. I think you mostly agree with me. I'm just, I think we're just in different places because I, I, I feel I have less patience for this. You know, it's like, I don't want to get burned, you know? And I know that's probably not a helpful mindset with these shows, but like I've watched two episodes and uh, I'm working on the third episode and I, I'm frustrated with how much it strings you along. Let me give you an example. Okay, there was that show Lost years ago. I was deep into Lost. I watched every episode of that show. I was always curious. Now, I was, I even then I had my suspicions. I'm like, they're never going to explain why there's a freaking polar bear on the island, are they? They're never going to show us what the smoke monster is, are they? But around season three, they finally started showing you answers to those questions and they kept it going. And, but the characters were interesting and likable enough that you kind of kept going. But we get all the way to the end of the series, and while they answered a lot of questions, uh, the ending was so off its rocker, and there's th there, the most important questions of the story, I felt, were still unanswered, and it really pissed me off. That's a J.J. Abrams show, by the way, uh, and it really pissed me off. Alias, <laughs> that was another J.J. Abrams show that really pissed, and I've told you about that before, the Rimbaldi device. Um, and back, and that was that was years ago. Now it's like when I get a whiff of that in a show, I'm like, oh, are you gonna are you gonna J.J. Abrams me on this? You, you, <laughs> I almost just I almost just went on a rant right there. It's like I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. I'm not gonna sit here and uh, actually. Oh, perfect example, 
perfect example, Fu Man Blue. The, this is my problem with the boys. This is, a, and, but specifically Gen V. Like, I really liked Gen V. I really liked it all the way up until the last 10 minutes of that season. The last 10 minutes of that season ruined it for me because uh, it shows up with this weird um, day. I think it's worth safe to spoil the ending. Spoilers for the end of Gen V, but... It's this it's this marvelous institutionalized story with with a bunch of young uh, college students who are kind of discovering, you know, where they fall in the spectrum of morality in the very sick and twisted boys universe. And they're very likable characters, most of them. And uh, well, pretty much all of them, actually. I really liked all those characters. And I thought that they had a really fun dynamic of like discovering the truths about Vought, but also kind of trying to trying to defy that and become a sort of a superhero team. So one of them goes on this rampage and starts murdering all the humans. Or what does she just start slaughtering? Yeah, that's right. She starts slaughtering all the humans on the campus uh, because the humans have cooked up. They've experimented on the soups and they've cooked up a virus that'll kill all soups, basically, and spare all humans. And so she's basically, she's just going to kill all humans. And uh, the main character, uh, what was her name again? It's been a while since I watched that. She's the one with the the blood power. Um, Gen V. You pr help me out, Fu Man Blue. What what was the name of the main character in Gen V? My memory is like ever. It's like Garrett remembers ever Marie. That was her name, Marie Moreau. Yeah, she was like Bloody Mary, and then. Uh, Oh, I loved Emma. She was great. Okay, so Marie is the main character. Uh, she has the blood powers, decides to stop. And she kind of rallies this little Avengers team. And they have this big battle on the campus, and it's pretty cool. And they even had to have the little warning at the beginning of the episode because it was kind of very similar to, uh, you know, situations that have happened on campuses. So they had to kind of warn the viewer, like, this could be traumatic. And I got to tell you... It was chilling. Like, it was very chilling, uh, the whole portrayal of the rampage through the through the college of these super these superhumans. And it and it's suitably bloody for the boys. Well, it just ends with Homelander comes down. He just wipes out, he just wipes out all of the, the bad guys, and then he just he he just and he is malevolent as ever, and he just basically tells Marie, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> Are you killing your own kind, you traitor? And then he basically just puts them down. And, and then what happens is she just wakes up in a lab and that's the end of the season. And I'm like, that pissed me off because it denied Marie any kind of resolution with her character. It was a mystery box just to keep us going until the next season. It did not really give the characters any meaningful send off. And that really pissed me off. And it made me feel cheated. Silo. Silo's another one. You've got the marvelous Jessica Ferguson. I always confuse her name. I just got to make sure I've got this right because I really hate getting her name wrong. It's because I got another name stuck in my head. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I got it right. Yeah, Jessica Ferguson. So Jessica Ferguson plays the main character in Silo. She She's magnificent. Um, and... Uh, the show's pretty good. It's a slow burn, like Three Body Problem. Silo is a slow burn, and it takes time. But the problem with Silo, it's mostly good. The problem with Silo is you're kind of ahead of it, though, because you sort of suspect what the real deal is, and you're just waiting for the characters to find out. So a lot of the show is watching the characters to find out what you already know, or at least what you think you already know. And, uh, and finally, it ends with basically an ending that mostly kind of confirms what I already thought and and just says, and now you're going to find out what you really want to know in the next season. And I'm like, I don't want to wait till the next season. I wanted one. I wanted one serious story payoff at the end of this. Okay? All I wanted to know is, <laughs> you know, you know, I, what was even my question? It was basically like, is the is the silo really protecting them from a wasteland or whatever? And uh, what's really going on when they go up there and they die? And uh, I just hated I just hated the answer to that, which uh, was basically mostly in line with what I already expected. Um, and it didn't it. You know what it is? They answered the what, but they did not answer any of the whys. 
And this is key because if you know, in the Blake Snyder Save the Cat 10 genres, he does not call it a whodunit. A mystery or a detective story is not a whodunit. It's a why done it. Because if you're if you notice, every actual murder mystery or detective story, uh, or a, a film like Seven, for example, you know, we're not actually interested in who the killer is. We're interested in why the killer is doing it. That's actually where the real drama of a good mystery comes from. So my problem with Silo is, yeah, they answered the what, they just didn't answer why. Why? Well, you have to wait till the next season to see that. So this is my problem with Three Body Problem. I'm getting that feeling that I that that I'm going to wind up with the same thing that I got with Gen V and with uh, Silo and with Lost and with Alias and with all these other shows that I've watched over the years. And that is why I'm irritated. That's why I'm I'm frustrated with with three body problem, because there actually is a lot to like about it. There's a lot there. I'm just tired of being swindled. That's all. That's all it is. I'm just tired of being swindled, you know. <laughs> We've swerved into a captain therapy session. It's unbecoming. It's unbecoming of an officer in the service. Uh, but uh, we have. We, uh, let, let's. We'll catch up, Fu Man Blue. Uh, but first, Erigmar. Ahoy! Erigmar is in the chat. Greeting, Stormcrow. And uh, good to see you, Erigmar. Three body problem is boring and cut. <laughs> Are there not enough, like, uh, uh, slaver slaver kit massacres happening in three body problem because if that's your critique eric mar i agree with you that would be eric mar author of the star shatter series on amazon and of the valen novel valen the lothorian who is a badass uh sort of a barbarian in space character which i dig and uh yeah a lot of fun there so yeah i we needed a lot more valen and a lot less uh scientist women in bars <laughs> Dude, there's something strange about, you know, the, you know what the real the real tragedy of the woke mind virus is the the specifically the intersectional feminist mind virus, uh, the anti patriarchy mind virus. The real problem is it ignores the the very basic truth that everyone knows, which is that opposites attract. Also, in storytelling, opposites are a good thing, right? Having the brawn and the brains, beauty and the beast, you know, foils. Opposite personality types. So, so the idea that you could never, you could never have romantic chemistry between an intelligent woman and maybe a charming and comedic man, like th that, that's silly. You know, think of Peter Venkman and Dana Barrett in Ghostbusters. That's actually a perfect example. Dana Barrett is in every way <laughs> higher class than Venkman. You know, Dana Barrett is intelligent. She is a world-class cellist who plays in the symphony. She lives on, you know, at Central Park West. Like she she is a very affluent, intelligent and cultured woman with a very uh a very high-browed profession and a very classy job, you know, a very high-class job. Fankman is 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 essentially a possible crackpot scammer, <laughs> a ghost exterminator. And as she puts it, he's more like a game show host than a scientist, <laughs> right? He's a discredited scientist <laughs> running a ghost catching service. She is a cellist in the symphony. And yet, and she, she brushes him off. She tells him, she's like, uh, no, no thanks. And she pushes him out the door. But what happens later in the movie? She winds up finding him kind of funny and kind of interesting. And she goes on a date with him and they get and they kind of get together. And my point is opposites attract. That's what I'm getting at, specifically with this scene of the guy trying to chat up the intelligent women. And oh, my God, they're intelligent. That would be like if Peter Venkman had discovered that Dana was a cellist in the symphony and was immediately emasculated and uninterested in her. That's what that would be like to me. That's my issue with the scene. It's stupid. It's not human nature. And it's bad storytelling. It's bad storytelling. 
That's the problem with it. And that's why wokeness is terrible at storytelling because it, it is so obsessed with its stupid worldview. It can never under, it, it's, it doesn't see the diamonds that are slipping through its fingers. That's the exact problem. You could actually make a case for progressive value, by the way. By the way, every show from the 60s to the to the early 2000s was tilted progressive, okay? So you could do it. Gene Roddenberry's Star Trek is a pre, is a show that 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 carries progressive themes in it. You can do this, but you can't ignore the basics of good storytelling and character work. That is the issue. That is the issue. Uh so so yeah, wokeness is a loser mindset. Intersectional feminist is for whiners. Feminism is uh intersectional feminism for whiners. And uh, and bad writers. So uh, Ultimate Kahuna is in the chat with a one dollar ninety nine super chat. Welcome, Ultimate Kahuna. And let me just say, you are watching, and thank you, my dear Ultimate Kahuna. You caught the captain in the middle of a rant, but I will take a break. <laughs> I'll take a break. But what I would say is, um. This is the Swords and Starships channel, and our mission here is to is to restore the primacy of the story. I truly believe that, like, I I do not want to see the opposite of woke storytelling. I don't want to see uh, I don't want to see the conservative gospel in storytelling either, as as a matter of propaganda or just pushing a message. What I want to see is character work, complex moral themes, and challenge, and that's basically what I'm looking for. Um, so if you like good stories, you are welcome here. I don't care what your what your political views are. I believe everybody gets a say. I believe in that. I believe in that. My only issue is with people who don't. With people who believe some people get to speak and other people have to shut up. Those are the only people that I have an issue with. Um, so, so I welcome disagreement. I welcome dis uh, debate. And I welcome all story lovers to the Swords and Starships channel of all different walks of life. Doesn't matter to me. Uh, if you are, if you think you're a sailor or a star knot, you are, and you are welcome aboard this vessel. Did I miss any? Uh, let's see. Did I miss anything? Okay, good. Got. I got all the super chats. You're so generous, chat. I. What did I do to deserve such fine? Gentlemen and occasionally ladies uh, in this audience. It is an honor. It is an honor. Um, so, yeah, I was looking for one of Fu Man Blue's thoughts on this. Um, I, If you have anything I missed, Fu Man Blue, that you wanted me to comment on, let me know, because I think uh, I think I kind of got basically your thoughts. No, I'm totally with you on this, Foot. The science sucked you in. I love all the thinking it made me do. It was worth the price of the subscription. I totally sympathize with that point of view because I, I have often said that's the problem with modern science fiction is it doesn't actually make you think. It doesn't, it's not, it's not a journey of curiosity. You know, it's not pulling you into a world. And it doesn't have, you know, there's a lack, like Kurtzman track is a perfect example. There, there's none of this. There's, you will not find anything like this in Kurtzman track. So I understand. And maybe I'm being too harsh with three body problem. Maybe I, I'm just saying it's my instinct and it just frustrates me that I'm getting those feelings. But that being said, like I'm, I'm down for a, I'm down for a think piece, you know, I'm down for something that, that, uh, gets the old neurons firing it's well it's the it's what star trek used to be star trek used to be a meditation on these kinds of things you know and stuff here he says we have a decade of being burned by shows so skepticism seems to be the appropriate response yeah i would say i'm going a bit farther than skepticism <laughs> to be fair <laughs> skepticism yes but uh uh me jaded is more like what i'm feeling Stav Yuri, your natural hopeful attitude and worldview must bring me back from the brink. I'm trusting you, Stav Yuri. Wait, what is this, Fu Man Blue? I'm trying to... Gen V just said... Oh, yeah. Gen V just said, F it, we're punting on first down. I mean, I feel like The Boys does this every season. The Boys does this every damn season. I really hated the ending of the first season of The Boys. Um, And it's... <sighs> I don't know how much of that I've got left in me. Uh, I the fact that Queen Maeve survives at the end of Boys season three is so stupid. It's so insane. It 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 literally undoes the entire point of the plot with Soldier Boy. 
which is uh, very frustrating. So, yeah. Um, yeah, Eric Mar, that is true. At least they showed the cultural revolution in episode one in Three Body Problem. I loved that. I really did. Um, I thought that was chilling, brilliant. Um, frankly, I think that probably understated uh, what that what it's like. Uh, I, I don't I don't think like those that are agitating for revolution quite understand how bad it would be for everyone involved. Like it's not going to be pretty for anyone. So. Uh, let's see. What else did we have? I'm just going through the chat, seeing if I missed anything. Eric Mar says, I liked the quantum works. Remember, I write a lot about hyperspace and subspace. I feel you on that. I, I always loved uh, the subspace thing in Star Trek. That was one of the most unexplained things in Star Trek. It's like, what actually is subspace? I mean, I know how it works in the show, but it kind of just did whatever the plot needed it to do. Uh, Eric Mar says, one day you will have to continue the Valen series, sort uh Swords of Starships, and read Valen and the Bunker of Death. I will. I will continue it. I will absolutely. Darth Merlin is in the chat. Darth Merlin says, the woke things you mentioned, like the bar scene, is definitely woke, but it's really low level and easy to ignore. For the most part, there is very little wokeness and three-body problem. Well, Darth Merlin, I, yes, that is a very temperate and uh, fair analysis. And I agree with your last sentence there, that there's very little wokeness and three-body problem. Um, I suppose it's a question of degrees, and it's a question of, like, um, I, I would say that it, it less bothers me that it's kind of a sort of a an obvious, you know, intersectional feminist trope, for example, the bar scene. It's less about that. It's more about that because of that, they're ignoring what I think might be more interesting storytelling. And that's what bothers me about it. It's actually more down to the bad writing side of it, you know, just the bad character work. It's like we, ju we just want this scene where the girls can show off and, and humiliate a man. We just want that, right? And it's like, but you're, you're ignoring the fact that I'd actually kind of be interested in seeing a conversation that draws out some of their personality and draws out some of the things they think about things. I'm not saying he has to go home with them. That's, I'm not saying that's what needs to happen in the scene. I, I'm not even saying he needs to succeed at asking him out or anything. I'm just saying, why not extend that conversation into something a little more interesting? That's all I'm suggesting. Um, so I'm actually really not so much concerned about the wokeness in it. Uh, it's more about just that's bad storytelling to me. So I hear what you're saying. Uh, yeah, it, th there's not a lot of, it, there's little things. And look, I've been used to this for decades. Like everything I've watched my whole life, there's always been little things in it, um, all the time that were, that were meant to, uh, you know, to agitate, to agitate against, against the enemy's list of the left, whatever that is. Um, but it used to be that there was balance in a show. There was there were two sides, and there were, at least in good shows, that is. Uh, you know, Battlestar Galactica, one of my favorite shows of all time, has a lot of progressive themes in it. And uh, and I and I think they were all well done. I mean, there were a couple scenes, there were a couple moments in this in the show that got a little cringe, but honestly, uh, I didn't mind because it was a show about a lot of different complex ideas. You know, they they take on a lot of crazy. That was during the war on terror and everything. And they have a whole run of episodes in season two where you've got humans, uh, you know, guerrilla fighting Cylons. Like, I think a lot of that was done so brilliantly. So I guess, I guess it's just, uh, it's down to, I'm mad as hell and I'm not taking it anymore. So, so there you go. It, I'm not, I'm not claiming it's rational, Darth Merlin. I'm not claiming that. Okay. I'm just saying it's where I'm at. Okay. <laughs> I will endeavor. I will endeavor to be more sober in my critique, as you are. Redoubt Productions is in the chat. Says, I keep my digital flamethrower close to the internet at all times nowadays. <laughs> Your Minecraft flamethrower? Yes, yes. And wise you should, Redoubt Productions. By the way, Redoubt and I, uh, as assuming everything's still on schedule, we, sh we will be doing on Wednesday, most likely, another review of Shogun, which is a brilliant series, and... Uh, yeah, so check that out. What's it? <laughs> uh, having fun in the chat, I see. 
Darth Merlin says, regarding your concerns that it doesn't pay off, the source material is finished and pays off in a really good way. Fair enough. Fair enough. Eregmar says, they could have used the bar scene for more proper character work, not boring agenda pushing. The entire thing gave me Captain Marvel vibes. Bingo! Bingo, Eregmar! That's exactly what I'm saying. That's exactly what I'm saying. It was a very Captain Marvel scene. It was like that scene where she says, you know, the guy's like, how about a smile, babe? And it's like, oh, Ugh. <laughs> you know, it's like the scene in Barbie where she's roller skating and literally every single man in Santa Monica. Okay. In Santa Monica it is cat calling her. And it's like, dude, dude. Uh, I used to, I used to uh, spend a lot of time in Santa Monica and I can tell you it's a very, it's a very progressive city. Okay. You can go down the strand in Santa Monica. There's a lot of beautiful women in Santa Monica, like a lot. Okay. So, so, so the idea that that suddenly Margot Robbie is roller skating at Santa Monica and it just brings all of the all the chauvinist pigs to the yard is ridiculous. It's so stupid, but it has to be there because we have to see. So anyway, that exactly that's what I would say. It's 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 a Captain Marvel deal. Uh, Darth Merlin says in BSG Battlestar Galactica, all a lot of the stuff about Starbuck and Boomer would trigger the heck out of us if it were made today. Starbucks. Well, give me an example, Darth Merlin. Let's examine. Give me your best example, and we'll take a look at it. But I, I, my knee-jerk reaction is I disagree. Now, now, here's the deal, though, Darth Merlin. In fact, in fact, let me give you the evidence for why I think that that's not correct. Um, it actually did trigger fans of the original 70s Battlestar Galactica when they announced that Starbuck was a gender-swapped character. That's right. As you well know, I'm sure, Katie Sackhoff was a, was, was a gender swap for the character of Starbuck. Now, at that time, it was not like every single thing was doing it. Um, and I would argue that Ronald D. Moore... Uh, the showrunner did it because it created a foil. It created a foil for Leah Dama that was also a romantic foil. That was really the reason. Now, modern wackos, intersexual feminist wackos, they would never gender swap a character in order for her to be a romantic interest for a man. They would never do that. So that's number one. Um, but number two, there was a backlash. There was a backlash to Katie Sackhoff's casting. A lot of fans were upset about it. They felt that it was ruining the spirit of the original series. Um, I don't recall. That was kind of, I was in co college in those days. I don't really remember a lot about the news around it because I wasn't really plugged into that. I don't remember any giant marketing campaigns that were calling all the fans misogynist. Um, I could be wrong about that, uh, but I don't recall anything like that. But what I do recall is that once the show got going, all of that went away. All that backlash went away. Why? For the same reason that all the backlash against Corliss being a race, essentially a race swap character in House of the Dragon, all that went away. As soon as House of the Dragon turned out to be a good show and Corliss was a great character and there were there were lore-driven reasons why Corliss was the the skin color that he was because he hailed from a different part of the world that fit within the lore it all went away because it was good writing good character work good acting and there was a lore driven reason for why he looks the way he looks fine fine and there's no issues same deal with starbuck like once it was clear that it, by the way katie sackov is lightning in a bottle as that character she's fun she's she does have a little bit of a a girl boss attitude but she's also very vulnerable she also has a lot of flaws she's not a mary sue character that's a very important part of her she's a brilliant pilot but she gets her ass thrown in the clink all the time because she's mouthing off to officers so she's got a lot of flaws to balance out what she's brilliant at She's as much a pain in the ass as she is charming, right? That made people like her as a character. And it turned out, in my view, there were very good narrative reasons for that gender swap because, you know, it she actually became a really good foil for Lee. She became a good foil for other Viper pilots. Um, she, she really, she had a sort of daughter-father relationship with Adama. Like, all of that worked really well in sort of bringing the cast cohesion right a lot of cohesion so that's why i would say i don't think that we would have now we might have a knee-jerk reaction and that's fair because we've been so conditioned lately but i think it would go away i think the minute it was proved 
that she was a really good character as Katie Sackhoff was, I think that would go away. Yeah, there might be some initial rumblings, but once we saw something good, we'd be fine with it. That's my view. Darth Merlin says, for starters, the gender swap themselves, which I've addressed, and Starbuck goes out of her way to be insufferable much of the time, as opposed to being the lovable rogue like in the original. Well, now that's, it is fair if she, you know, I don't know, I watched a little bit of the original and I was not a fan of the original and uh, I'm still not, quite frankly. So that's fair. I'm not going to argue with any fans of the original source material. If they deviated from the source material, I got no argument with that critique. I disagree that she went out of her way to be insufferable. I I saw her as a rebel. She's a rebel. She bucks authority. But the thing is, she gets her ass kicked for it. She gets in trouble. She gets thrown in the brig. She gets uh, taken off flight status. Uh, she gets drunk and does stupid shit that gets her in trouble. You know, th th there's a lot of... There's a lot of uh, prices that she pays for that. And that's kind of true of all the characters in the show. So... Uh, it doesn't hurt that she's sexy. <laughs> that really doesn't hurt at all. Um, so, yeah. I, but if... Yeah, I, I, I don't think that... I think we'd be okay with it if we got good storytelling. I also think the mindset of a writer doing that in the early 2000s is a hell of a lot different than today. They are only doing it for political reasons now. But in the early 2000s, you know, Ronald D. Moore, I think he was doing it, um, and Tony Graffia, you know, other writers, they were doing that, I think, to bring balance to the cast, not, not as in, like, representation. It was as in balance as in characters that can play off of each other. That's what I think they were doing, and I think it worked really well. Um, Darth Merlin says, I'm not saying the changes were bad, to be clear, but I think there would be an initial knee-jerk reaction. Well, I 100% I agree with you. There would be an inert. There was with House of the Dragon and Corliss. There was a knee jerk reaction. Oh, here we go. Here we go. You know, it's going to be just like, but, but it's so funny because Rings of Power did all this, this weird racial stuff. And that was a problem because Rings of Power was trash. It was trash and it pissed all over the lore. House of the Dragon, it was a total different story. Yes, there was a knee jerk, but then we get into it. We're like, oh, Corliss is actually. He's like one of the coolest characters, and it makes a lot of sense. He's he's from this part of the East and whatever. And, and it was not an issue. It was not an issue at all. And uh, I, I think it would be the exact same story. It, it was the exact same story with Katie Sackhoff in the old days. So uh, Fu Man Blue says, the joke about Einstein getting kicked in the nuts by God was pretty current day. <laughs> oh, jeez. I got, well, I'll have to watch that part and see what I think. Uh, definitely. Uh, Darth Merlin says, it, if your point about motive, but in um, in current year, it's so easy to assume motive and we could be wrong from time to time. Yeah, if you're saying that we we run the risk of prejudging things unfairly, uh, guilty as charged. Guilty as charged. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to I'm not going to deny it. And you're right. We, we probably need to dial it back once in a while. I think that makes that that's a fair point, And I take that point. Um on the other hand, can you blame us? I mean, listen, listen Darth, Darth Merlin, uh, I'm just going to tell you that I, I was a very different, I had a very different mindset when like Alex Kurtzman first created Star Trek Discovery and Star Trek Picard. Though I was totally, I was totally, I was skeptical and I had my concerns, but I was ready to love those shows. And frankly, I even apologized for some of the stupid shit they did in those shows um, early on because I was willing to extend the benefit of the doubt. And it's like, but after I've seen all the, dis I mean, they've dismantled so many things. They've dismantled so many beautiful stories that we love and they piss in our face for the, when we complain about it. So, so I feel like one can be forgiven for having no forgiveness for these fuckers. You know what I mean? I'm so sorry to be vulgar. Frackers. Frackers. We'll say frackers. Uh, so yeah, but that, that does not in any way, uh, that's no excuse. <laughs> exactly. I'm not, it's not really an excuse for, for sort of, uh, being prejudgmental about things. Uh, I fully admit like my prediction about fallout, I could be dead wrong about this. I don't think I am. I could be dead wrong about fallout being a, a dog crap show. I could be. 
But I'm just telling you, history has taught me some harsh truths, okay? <laughs> okay. Oh, he's, I take your point. Yeah, I, I get what you're saying, Fu Man. All right. Uh, Darth Merlin. I almost called you Fu Man Blue, Darth Merlin. Uh, Mr. Mind Flayer, welcome aboard, Mr. Mind Flayer, uh, to the Swords and Stars channel. Happy Easter, everyone, and a happy Easter to you as well, sir. Remember, the burden of good writing is on us now. Can't rely on any of them just to write a good story. And that is such a great point, uh, Mr. Mind Flayer. And to that end, I'm not just complaining about the Amazon show. <laughs> um, I'm putting my money where my mouth is, so to speak. And, uh, we are going to be running, I am going to be running on this channel, a uh, tabletop RPG campaign based in the Fallout universe using the Fate Core rules. And we'll have Fu Man Blue is playing, and Storm Crow is playing, Tom is playing, and we're going to have a lot of fun. Um, and my goal is, and, and the reason I'm using Fate Core rules and not specifically the Fallout RPG rule set is because I've I've game tested the Fallout RPG rule set, and I feel like the rules are just a little too arcane for my taste, and uh, a little too complicated, and uh, that's just I prefer a more story driven style. So Fate, you're I, but trust me, you're gonna love Fate. You're gonna love it if you haven't played it. Fate Core is a very story narrative driven system, um, and so it kind of simplifies some of the dungeon crawling aspects a little bit. Um, but it's, it does not sacrifice awesome rules for like, um, you know, having skills and abilities and upgrading weapons and things like that. So you guys are going to love it. And I'm going to show you some more on that. In fact, in fact, I have created, I have created my own custom character sheet for this session and I'll share it with you right now. So this is for my upcoming on this channel in April, my upcoming fallout live stream tabletop RPG show. Let me show you this. Uh, share screen window. Uh, okay, here we go. And it's going to be called Fallout Dead Man's Cash. So, so this is uh, so this is adapted from the Fate Core character sheet. And uh, what I did is I just sort of uh, took a, a Google drawing and uh, I converted it to look sort of like a Pip Boy. And so, yeah, this is what the players are going to have and. Uh, this aspects is a part of the fake core system and uh, i renamed it karma just to give it flavor of fallout and the aspects are going to be narrative they're sort of narrative uh descriptions right they're sort of narrative backstory for the character uh, such as the deadliest uh, the deadliest six shooter in the wasteland right might be an example of a of an aspect and these aspects are meant to give each character a kind of double-edged weapon where they can invoke it for a benefit by spending fate points, or they can have it compelled against them to sort of make them do things that would that would complicate the mission. Um, and, and it's meant to represent that everybody has both advantages and flaws. We have strengths and weaknesses. And so it creates a lot of fun drama in the game. So, and I've adapted, there's gonna be, there's gonna be mechanics for rads. There's gonna be mechanics for action points. I've even adapted the special system to work in this. So it's gonna be a lot of fun. Now, let me show you, uh, well, that's pretty much it. I mean, I guess the second page is really just inventory and stuff like that. It's a really cool system um, and it can be very lethal for the players when balanced correctly. And I plan to make this uh, lethal. So there you go. So uh, check that out. Fallout Dead Man's Cash. It's going to be set 15 years after the events of Fallout 4. I'm not going to not going to go into any detail on any specific endings of any of the games because that's really the player's decision. I do have to select a couple of canon. I kind of have to choose a canon, so to speak, but I sort of chose a very um, just the basic details I need to get the story going. I'm not going to try and like make massive decisions about what happened at the end of fallout four for example so um so check it out it's gonna be a lot of fun i hope to see you there why thank you mr mind flayer yeah I, I worked hard on that it's a lot of fun i honestly i just do this for fun <laughs> i do stuff like this for fun in fact i i did like us i did a stranger things fate rpg for some friends of mine um and it was a lot of fun one one summer we just we just did a little spooky stranger things mystery and uh, it was a lot of fun. Stranger Things works really well in the Fate Core rule set. It, it's very well suited. That's kind of the beauty of Fate is you can do anything. 
you can convert any world into a tabletop RPG with fate. That's why I love it so much. And I've had a lot of fun. <laughs> Foo man, Blitz. speaking of my team, are you in, are you in here somewhere, JD? Uh, JD, I don't think she's usually able to tune in on Sundays, but uh, yeah, that would be a friend of mine who's also going to... Gentlemen, gentlemen, there, there will be a female who will be playing with us. So just uh, just be cool, be cool. <laughs> Actually, she's a fellow author friend of mine. So a a badass babe, who writes uh she writes kind of terminal list kind of stories and and uh, stuff like that. So uh let's all right, awesome. What else? Anything else on three body problem? I don't know if we're gonna do any more three body problem. I was almost thinking we I, I was almost thinking I might want to just watch some Fallout lore and just talk about it because I'm on a Fallout kick. However, however, I've got a bone to pick. Uh, I I forgot to watch this last time. T tell me if I for I feel like I didn't go over this last time. So um here is the if you don't know, Rebel Moon is a film by Zack Snyder. And it was based on a a discarded script, a, a rejected, I shouldn't say discarded, uh, should have been discarded, a rejected script for a Fallout, or sorry, Fallout, a Star Wars series that Zack Snyder was pitching to Disney. And they said no. Wow, who knew they could? <laughs> who knew they could say no? And uh, and the, the, the thought was that, uh, well, if Zack Snyder can just do whatever he wants, you know, maybe it'll be great. So he converted it into his own original universe that just happens to have things like photonic rapiers. And and uh, and it was a disaster. It was an absolute disaster. It's one of the worst movies. It was one of my worst movies of the year last year, actually. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe how bad it is. I have zero respect for Zack Snyder from this point forward. I'm like, wow. He's a he he was good at adapting 300, which is a graphic novel. He was good at adapting Watchmen, which is a graphic novel. Uh Sucker Punch is garbage, <laughs> you know. Uh, I, I kind of like the Snyder Cut. The Snyder Cut wasn't bad, but I can also see in the Snyder Cut a lot of the problems with him as a creative. And uh, and also, I, I've really, I liked Man of Steel when it came out, but the more I think about the fact that, that Jonathan Kent makes Clark let him die, the, the less I like it, the less I like it over the years. So, so let's take a look at the second Rebel Moon trailer and see what we see, shall we? We'll see what I can get away with here. I'll have to clip this out of the stream, most likely. Rebel Moon, the Scar Giver. Okay. So Mahler and the boys pretty much eat or no, it was a uh, <clears throat> Mahler on the neurotic nooner. They efapped this and it was so brilliant because it was like um they paused it every frame. And when you pause it every frame, you can see that like she's not actually there the, the guys that are coming at her aren't doing anything. They're not a, they're not even aiming their weapons at her. They're just walking into her gunshot. But but let me just point out something I really hate in modern trailers. Do you notice how they're timing the music to every gunshot? Uh like it's like this cool it's this cool hip hop beat or something. It's so stupid. I hate this. I hate this in modern trailers. Do 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 She's doing nothing. <laughs> like, let me mute this for a second. Look, look at how these guys, she, they're just walking into her gunfire. <laughs> look, at, look at, look at, watch this again. Watch this again when the guy tries to stab her. Watch this. Dude, this is exactly my critique of the first film. He, he just lazily kind of puts his sword forward while she easily jumps around it. And, and now he's dead. He's dead. They actually don't even show her disarming him, but whatever. Who cares? In the first film, right, uh, she's like 90 pounds, and she takes out an entire squad of men. But here's the deal. She doesn't do it in any clever way. She doesn't get behind cover. She doesn't, like, set traps for them. She, she doesn't do anything. You know, in the first Rambo movie, Rambo First Blood, okay, Rambo had to be clever about how he defeated the cops. He's, he's, he's like... 
He's a mess. He's a muscle man. He's a, a special operative, but he has to lure. He has to lure the the police into the jungle or the forest, I should say. And he has to like set traps for them and he has to survive. So in other words, even even a tank like Rambo has to be clever about how he's going to defeat overwhelming odds, right? This is my point. It's like in the first Rebel Moon, she's standing in the open, <laughs> no cover anywhere. And and they just go, they just go into slow motion. And she just, and of course, all the shots miss her. And she just kills them all <laughs> like it's nothing. And it's like the most boring shit I've ever seen. It's so boring, folks. I can't stand it. <laughs> well, we're not getting any better here, are we? <laughs> yeah, Eric Mark. And the epic tunes. <laughs> I know that. I know. I really hate this. I really. They did this in the Argyle trailer. They did this exact thing in the Argyle trailer. It was like, okay, here we go. And he's like, boom, 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 boom. As he's like beating the, and so all of his hits are timed. Oh, so stu timed with the music. It's so dumb. All right, let's, let's roll the tape. Let me just double check. Am I getting a warning here? Am I getting any warnings? All right, so far, so good. So far, so good. You can tell they've beaten me down. <laughs> they've beaten me down at YouTube. <laughs> Is you and I fighting together? You must know. You cannot win. I often say chat GPT writing. That's what I mean when I say chat GPT writing. Chat GPT could have lifted that line from any of a thousand films over the last 80 years. That's what I mean when I say chat GPT writing. You're all here. Because there is nothing to return to. Gosh, she is so SJW. <laughs> it's like she is so just as just as manly as possible. She is as manly. <laughs> Why do they hate women looking feminine and men looking masculine? Why do they hate this? I don't know, folks. Dark days lie ahead of us all. We will teach you how to fight. <laughs> it's so stupid. Dude, it's so stupid. I, 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 I can never get over this. I can never get over this. They're in this village. It's a Skyrim. It's a Skyrim village. <laughs> it's a Skyrim village. It's like Riverwood in Skyrim, the first little town you come to, you know? There's like 20 people that live in this village, and they they farm like these little plots of land. And uh, as I think someone put it, it's like they're basically at the level of the 18th century. You know, they're at the level of the 18th century in their farming technique. And this massive, <laughs> this massive, you know, fleet of starships descends. The Empire descends on this little tiny village. And like, we need your grain. We need your grain. <laughs> it's so stupid. And, you know, and it's like, it's like the houseplant pirate in uh, Mandalorian season three. You know, they're like the, the, the one pirate ship with a wheel, a, a freaking wheel, a Pirates of the Caribbean wheel is how he steers his starship. It's so stupid. Um, the houseplant pirate is occupying a town of 20 people. And, uh, and it's like, oh no, what are we going to do? And then the, 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 uh, Republic pilot flies to Coruscant and he's like, we got a big problem. Pirates are occupying the planet. And I'm like, the planet? Who's talking about a planet? There is one ship hovering above one town with, with it maybe 20 people, maybe 20 and a half people in it. It's like, how how is the fate of an entire empire dependent on the grain harvest of a Skyrim village? Somebody explain this to me. It's, but 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 it's worse than that, chat. It's worse than that. Because the entire narrative of the first film is she goes and recruits a really good team to defend, to defend an indefensible, 
and let's just be honest, a strategically worthless <laughs> piece of land. This makes no sense. This makes no sense whatsoever. So they are going to fight. These stupid villagers are going to, like, sharpen their, their uh, bamboo spears. And they're going to fight the freaking empire. Dude, the Ewoks were more plausible, okay? The Ewoks were more plausible in the Forest of Endor than this. Roll tape. That's impressive. Okay, let, let me just get serious for a second. Let, let me just get, uh, let me be clear, my fellow Americans. Uh, let me just get serious for just a moment. L let's take this ludicrous plot seriously, okay? Uh, and, and of course, uh, the character there, he was the Roman gladiator in the, in the definitely not gladiator Colosseum where he was recruited. But by the way, none of these characters have any emotional stake in any of these events. They don't even barely know each other. They barely speak two lines to each other in the first film, which is even worse. Uh, but of course, of course, he just is all in to defend this village. Th this young woman that he's training, he says, well, that's very good. Well done. You are marching her into, into a suicidal battle <laughs> that, that, as you put it, she cannot possibly win. You are you are sending her to a meaningless, pointless death in a meat grinder against a highly militarily and technologically superior foe. This is morally, this is morally insane. This is morally detestable. <laughs> like this is, you know, so so I guess what I'm saying is this is not a save the cat. This is a kill the cat moment because this is a kick the cat moment because he's kicking the cat. It, I'm referring, of course, to Save the Cat by Blake Snyder. You always want to save the cat so that you have something that makes you like the character. This makes me dislike this character because he should be telling, he should be talking about how they're going to evacuate this village and escape. That's what he should be talking about. This is our evacuation plan, not we're going to sit here and shoot, <laughs> and shoot straw targets. We're going to get all the teenage, all the teenage uh, uh, women and men in the, in the, in the village, and we're going to have them shoot straw targets, and we're just going to wait. We're going to wait until the next massive <laughs> Star Destroyer with legions of armored, highly, heavily armed soldiers land. Like, that's the stupidest ever. Eric Mar, I'm sure you have many thoughts on this, Eric Mar. I mean, if we're trading the villagers to take on a small bandit gang, I would be okay. Of course, of course. That, that's exactly my point, Eric Mar. It's like, you know, th this is exact. You, you cut right to the heart of the matter, as usual, my friend. Uh, this is the problem with Zack Snyder. Zack Snyder is conflating lots of different stories here. He, he's basically, he's cobbling together a patchwork of different stories, right? There is a story in which a small rebel army defends a planet against impossible odds and it's brave and heroic and it works. That like a guerrilla war on a planet. Um by the way, Halo has a lot of examples of this, such as the battle for reach, you know, things like that. So so that you can do that. There is also a version of the story as you point it where it's a it's a group of villagers and a magnificent 7 against a bandit gang. It's the magnificent 7 the Seven Samurai. Yeah, that that's that's a plausible story. Zack Snyder is he's crossing he's crossing those two stories, and it doesn't work because it's like you have you have a tiny magnificent seven trying to look look. There, there's no there's no rationale for, for for making yourself a sitting duck if you're on the back foot. You've got to like head for the hills. You know, it, it makes me think of the, the the film The Patriot with Mel Gibson, where the whole idea is that he he cannot even he has to conceal his identity because if he doesn't conceal his identity from the British, they can retaliate against his family. So he he goes by an alias. Him and his men live in the swamp. They live in the swamps of Georgia because they can't stand up to the British toe to toe. In fact, that's even a great sort of theme stated moment in the film because um, the, the regular Continental Army is getting decimated by the British Army. Uh, that would be you, Stoffy, all right? And, uh, and the British are wiping them out, and Benjamin Martin, Mel Gibson's character, points out, this is ludicrous. We can't fight them this way. We can't line up against them like this. We've got to fight smart. And that's why he goes to the swamp, and he organizes a guerrilla campaign. So, so, so... <laughs> So what I'm saying is Zack Snyder needs to watch The Patriot. <laughs> he needs to copy The Patriot 
and not whatever the hell he's copying. <laughs> so, who knew Zack Snyder was such a hack? I didn't. I really didn't. I did not until Rebel Moon. I, Rebel Moon. Rebel Moon! Stop here. He says, they should have done the sci-fi version of Magnificent Seven. <laughs> I know. I know. It's what he wanted to do. He thinks it's what he did. But, but the problem the problem with Zack, uh, old Zacky boy, is that... Uh, Yes, Stoff Yuri. He wanted to do the Magnificent Seven. And he wanted to do A New Hope. And he wanted to do uh, Firefly. <laughs> you know? And he wanted to do... He wanted to do a whole bunch of other shit. And it's like, dude, it doesn't work, man. You gotta pick one. You gotta pick a lane. As a story... By the way, this is the problem with Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. Ghostbusters Frozen Empire wanted to tell five different stories. It's like, you can't tell five different stories. You got to tell one story. It's got to be interesting. So I'm getting a warning on my uh, Wi-Fi. I'm getting a warning on my internet. So if I start to like cut out a robot, let me know, chat. I'll keep an eye out for that. But uh, yeah, Eric Mars says, Starships, Mecha, Tanks, uh, Artie, everything. Redoubt Production says, you know it's you know you're bad if you're making me consider rewatching the abomination of historical inaccuracy that is the Patriot. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I view the Patriot as a fantasy version of the American Revolution. Like totally, totally. Uh other than recreating the period, other than recreating um so, some of the sentiments of the time, other than recreating tactics of the time, that movie utterly fails at at painting an act. It's not. It, it's kind of meant to be the Braveheart of the American Revolution. The problem is, it's not even as accurate as Braveheart. And and I know, I know, the Battle of Sterling is not accurate in tactically. I understand all that. Braveheart is much more accurate to history than the Patriot is. Uh, the Patriot, however, is just a fun. It's just a fun movie. Uh, you know, to have a little fun. You know, just you know, go Amer go America, go America. I bet I bet it's Starf Gary's favorite movie. <laughs> Star Starf Gary says, call in an orbital strike. Dude, dude, one hell diver, one hell diver against that village. It's over, folks. <laughs> it's over. One hell diver. Just throw a lip boop and destroy it. <laughs> orbital strike. Uh use a hundred millimeter howitzer from ten miles away. Dude, it wouldn't even be difficult. It's shit, yeah. Uh, Darth Merlin says, but how else would you know he's a pirate? Uh, are you talking about the houseplant pirate in Mandalorian? You, you might be, you might be. Uh, if I missed your point there, uh, Mr. Mindflayer, remind me. Indeed. All right, let's resume with the tape. Let me make sure I'm not getting any warnings. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Netflix is playing ball. I appreciate that. For now. For now. <laughs> I can't get through it, folks. Oh, jeez. Oh, the, the music, the music here is ridiculous. It's so ridiculous. It's, it's like I'm about to see something like super sci-fi and cyberpunk, and what do I see? A, a beautiful stroll through Skyrim. It's like... Is this what you picture? <laughs> it's fucking Skyrim. <laughs> uh, and by the way, that's that, that. That is gold beneath those horses' feet right there. That is the precious gold that could bring an entire empire to its knees. It's, it's all for the grain. The grain in one village? One village! So stupid. All right. <clears throat> All right, here we go. Those this village holds most dear. Dude, dude, look at this. They're not surviving that. Come on, I gotta get to it. Hang on. Here it is. Here's the. Here, there it is. <laughs> dude, dude, this. Oh, they're, they're they're so bone. But but see, what makes me angry about it is uh this character here. Who? What's his name? Who cares? Uh. He has the audacity to look afraid and surprised. 
Do, do you realize the end of the first movie? I swear to God, folks, the end of the first movie is they they barely and quite in a very plot armor way defeat the bad guys. Fine. They all come back to this village. Why? Why do any of these people she's recruited have any reason to come back to this village? I don't know, but they do. And they say this is a good place to fight. What? And they, they basically decide to just sit there and wait until the Empire arrives. How dare you, sir? How dare you have this look on your face? Like, you sat there in an undefensible position waiting for a superior force. A, no, no, no. Not a superior force. A vastly, a vastly superior force to arrive. How dare you? How dare you look surprised? I should destroy them. Chat GPT villain dialogue right there. By the way, that is that is representative of him in every single line. I love this actor. I this actor I think could have been excellent as a villain. Uh once again, a great actor squandered. But he is every line he has in the first film is like that. It is a chat GPT mustache twirling obvious villain line. <laughs> have no choice but to fight that that's not true <laughs> you could have let you could have evacuated the village you did have a choice you you, you could have even you could have even chosen where you could fight well, this is bizarre this is so bizarre man i don't even understand how someone at Zack snyder's level can do this you know i i i say somewhat jokingly that these are stupid people that write this stuff <laughs> If I'm being honest, if I'm being absolutely serious about this, I'm kind of baffled. I don't understand how you can have the list of credits that Zack Snyder has, the films he's worked on, the writers he has undoubtedly worked with, the talent he's learned from. How can you have this resume and not even do basic storytelling? I don't understand that, folks. I truly don't. I don't understand how you can be at this level and not and not establish at a basic level why is this planet so valuable? And yes, it has to be a better reason than one small village's grain. <laughs> Uh, that music is going to kill me. Uh, look, look at this. <laughs> look at this. One strike and they're done for, folks. The Scar Giver herself. The Scar Giver. The Scar Giver. She's the Scar Giver she is. Are you truly prepared? Dude, jeez. <laughs> They've got like these, they've got like these tanks, they've got machine guns, they got all these missiles, and what is it? It's thatch, it's thatched roofs. It's like thatched roofs. This is this is, I swear, this is the this is the uh stormtrooper army attacking a Skyrim village. <laughs> it's unbelievable. You allow this to continue in your name. I'm sorry. I won't allow this place to die for me. Well, you should have thought about that before you advised them not to immediately evacuate and flee. Like, you are, you should have evacuated. You know, that right there is a very Zack Snyder trope. The, the heroic character who is demonstrating his or her strength by screaming in pain very loudly. If you notice, this is what <clears throat> this is what Henry Cavill's Superman does a lot in Man of Steel. He's like, Arr! and it's like <clears throat> you can do that in small doses, but this is a one-trick pony, and he's going to this well way too often, folks. Way too often. God, it's Dude, even even the weird mishmash of music in that trip, that is an odd, like there's a, he can't even get the tone right. Is this like a, is this an almost medieval, uh, what's the word? You know, there's a type of future world called a dying earth, a dying earth future, 
which is essentially like a a kind of post-technological medieval rebirth of society. Um, uh, Joe Abercrombie has a great trilogy of of books on this. They're called the Shattered Sea Trilogy, I think. They're actually really good. Um, so essentially it's a fantasy... I'm spoiling it. I would be spoiling it if I finished what I was about to say. But um, <clears throat> in other words, Dune is kind of like this. Dune is about a sort of uh, post-technological future, futuristic medieval society. I feel like there's a place for that. But then there's also this kind of hyper-technological -tech cyberpunk feel to it. Uh, but then... There's this sort of heavy metal style over substance martial arts future thing going on, and it's like, dude, you gotta pick one, man. <laughs> you get your your mit your it's your mishmashing. <laughs> yeah, all right, I forgot that. That's that is a uh, rebel rebel moon scar giver. <laughs> <laughs> what can I even say? What can I even say about that? It's so stupid. I know, I know. Rebel Moon. I won't be watching it. <laughs> I'm not going to watch it. Uh, maybe if I'm really desperate. I, You know, I might watch it for the comedy value. I will say. I will say that like Madam Web, Mandalorian Season 3, Rebel Moon, kind of fun to watch in a sort of laugh at it, bad movie kind of way. Uh, but then there's films that are no fun to watch, like uh, like uh, Secret Invasion was no fun to watch. That was no fun at all. Um, what's a film that recently... Echo, no fun to watch that at all. What was the film? That, oh, that, yeah, Frozen Empire was okay, but yeah. I'm, 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 my opinion of Frozen Empire is dropping faster than the temperature in that in that movie. Eric Mar says it's it is like Repel Moon. <laughs> the trailer repels the audience. I don't know. I don't know. Would it repel the Disney shells? <laughs> I feel like the Disney shells would be like, "Ooh, that's a oh, she's got a light sword." Okay. <laughs> oh, I'm telling you right now, the Disney shells they would love that whole sequence at the beginning where she just boom, 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 and they'd be like, "Oh, oh, go, girl." <laughs> they would love it. Can you imagine Grace Randolph's reaction to that? Time? Well, I really like that. She's really good with that gun. I hope there's lots of that. <laughs> I, I know you're you're right though, Eric Ma. That's a yeah for Eric Ma. Uh, yes. The chat is correct in this matter. Fu Man Blue says the death spiral of a society. Like San Fran and L.A., I know, I know. Yeah, and by the way, the the um, we are going to be talking in Fallout Dead Man's Cash, the Captain's RPG series, debuting in April. We are going to be setting it in sort of the Nevada, Southern Oregon, Northern California sphere. It's going to be kind of in that area. So like at the edge of the new California Republic, I think you're going to really like it. So I'm very excited. Redoubt Production says whatever. Whenever someone mentions Grace Randolph, I grimace and my head begins to ache. AKA Chlamydia Burns, as Chrissy calls her. <laughs> it's so messed up. It's so it's so messed up. Uh, but I love it. <laughs> if I'm being very honest, I love it. Eric Bar says the Disney shills are clapping seals level stupids. Stupids. I like how you spell that. Uh, did I miss any good comments in here? <clears throat> Stuff here. It says they should have done a variation of the great movie The Secret of Santa Vittoria, where they reap and then hide the grain rather than try to fight the overwhelming enemy. Well, of course, of course. Like there are there are ways to fight guerrilla wars. There are um, you know, quite quite aside from the tactics of it, they never very clearly establish anything about this village that makes it important. They really don't. Like, I mean Say what you want about James Cameron and Avatar, but it was very clear in Avatar why this army was so desperate to take the, the Na'vi's home tree, and it was very clear why the Na'vi were willing to stay and die to defend it. In fact, it became a great part of the tension of the film because Jake Sully knows 
that there is no chance that they can win. There is no chance that Korich is ever going to not take that tree down and get the un unobtainium. You know, regardless of how stupid a plot device you think that is, it's clear. It is clear why unobtainium is so important to the humans. It's very clear why they want it so bad. And then Jake Sully has to find a way to convince them to leave their spiritual home that they have a spiritual connection with and will never leave on principle. You know, Zack Snyder doesn't even do that level of work in Rebel Moon. He, he's, made, he's established nothing even approaching something like that. So, yeah, it's pretty bad. Re yes, Redoubt. Scream! He does this, you know, in Man of Steel. Like, uh, Superman does this every 10, 10 minutes in that movie. Yeah! It's like, okay. Now, it's so funny, because if, if, if I had only ever seen, like, one Zack Snyder movie, I probably would have thought, ah, oh, he's a pretty good film, depending on which film it was. I'd be like, he's a good filmmaker. He really knows his stuff. And then if I saw like two Zack Snyder movies, I'd probably say, you know, he kind of reuses the same thing over and over again in his movies, doesn't he? At this point, I'm like, dude, this guy, <laughs> what does, I don't think he's, you know, he's got style. He does have some, he does, you know, he has style, but you know what's weird is even in Rebel Moon, his style is not great. Like it's very confused and, you know. I, I really, I really wish, I really wish that Zack Snyder had tried to, to update, you know, to kind of update his whole setting and his archetypes for something that was not like literally 2016, <laughs> 2016 girl boss movie. This is, this is seriously, this is like a 20, this is like in the, the 2015 to 2017 era of girl bossery. This is like right there in the, in the era of Ray Ascendant, you know? <laughs> <laughs> that like that's that is exactly what Rebel Moon is like to me. It's old school girl bossery. <laughs> Dark Merlin. <laughs> they don't want to damage the grain. <laughs> I that's actually pretty good. <laughs> Could you imagine? You know the bad, the big bad guy. They're like, "Sir, we'll call in a missile strike and eliminate them all." No, we must not damage the grain. It's what we came for, after all. Send in your troops one at a time. <laughs> hey, hey! At least that's a reason. I'm not saying it's a good reason, but at least that's a reason. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, make sure to only send them in a couple of troops at a time. <laughs> we don't want to damage that grade. And then, of course, that's how they can just, like, you know, ambush them all <laughs> and take them out. Hey, you know, I, I will give you credit, Darth Melvin. You're doing more thinking than old Zacky Boy does. That's all I got to say. Uh, let's see. What's that, Eric? Uh, because others may have d did his work for him in the past. I mean, totally. That's always possible. You know, I've been thinking a lot about that because, uh, you know, I re I rewatched a couple episodes of Breaking Bad recently. It's it's I know it's just it's it's my palate cleanser. It's like I just go to that whenever I'm like frustrated with something I watch. I just go and watch an episode of Breaking Bad. I just I you know. It actually, if Battlestar were still streaming, I would watch that. I'd just go get an episode of Battlestar, but it's not on any streaming that I know of right now. Uh, they used to have all the episodes on Amazon. Anyway, but I was thinking about it because, um, <clears throat> like, uh, a lot of different writers worked on Breaking Bad, a lot of different directors, and many of them, like, some of the writers and directors of Breaking Bad episodes were working on Echo episodes. Right. So so then I begin to wonder, I'm like, I give Vince Gilligan a lot of credit. And I do. I do. I give Vince Gilligan. He's kind of, in my view, the Christopher Nolan of TV writing. He just he's brilliant. But how much of it is actually him? I don't actually know. I tend to think a lot of it is him, though, because I've heard him in interviews on like Talking Bad and other shows. And when he explains his reasoning about Walter White and the characters and stuff like that, I agree with his reasoning. I'm like, that makes a lot. And in fact, rather not so much agree as in like, I'm taking notes. I'm like, oh, that's really good. Yes, that's exactly right. Um, so I, I think he grasped, based on what he said, I think he grasped story structure like really well, like really, really well. 
but still, you know, it's it's hard to it's hard to know because in filmmaking, the you know, it's an army. It's an army of artists that are making it. So so some of it is the magic of the actors. You know, for example, even in Breaking Bad, there's the character of Jack Welker, who becomes uh, Walter White's hitman. Essentially, he's the he's the skinhead. Uh, hitman at the, in season five that starts whacking people for Walter White. And Jack Welker has a nephew named Todd, who's this kind of psychopathic character that works with Walter White, uh, played by Jesse Plemons uh, brilliantly, kind of launched Jesse Plemons' career. And uh, he, he was in Killers of the Flower Moon recently. Well, one of the stories I heard was that in the behind the scenes, the character of Jack Welker and Todd are basically kind of just supporting B characters. They're not really like they do. They're major characters in season five, but that's really their first appearance is season five. Uh, so there's not a lot of backstory for them. So the actors, Jesse Plemons and the actor who played Jack behind the scenes without direction just they worked out between themselves a little bit more backstory for their characters and they came up with this backstory that todd had grown up uh with an abusive father uh jack's brother and that jack had or i don't know if it was his brother or his brother-in-law i don't know which it was basically the idea was todd had an abusive father jack beat the crap out of his father uh, adopted Todd and protected him from his abusive father. And so Jack and Todd have this very close relationship, right? And both actors who worked that out amongst themselves used that to draw from in their performances in the show, right? And the, and it's brilliant because the whole reason that Jack even spares Walter White at a certain point in the show is because he his nephew, Todd, respects and reveres Walter White and and doesn't want anything bad to happen to him. So you can believe that Jack is willing to spare Walter because he cares so much about his nephew. Now, a lot of that was already there in the script that, you know, but the actors added to it on their own accord. The actors w dug deeper and reached even deeper for more motivation for their characters and more backstory to, to propel the, the narrative. So it is hard to say. It is hard to say how much of it is is one creative or another, and maybe, uh, uh, you know, maybe some, maybe Christopher Nolan doesn't deserve as much credit as he gets. I mean, I think he does, but because just because of his body of work being on balance, uh, so impressive. But it is hard to say, and that's a really good point that you raised there. So, more <laughs> talks. Eric, we gotta protect the grade for the grain. <laughs> I know, I know. Like the inter interstellar, you know, faster than light star cruisers with with legions of troops and high tech. You know, they can they can they literally have life support systems that can recycle air and all this stuff. They have no food supplies. <laughs> like they, they have no means of producing. They have, they need to rely on a medieval village's. I know, I know. I think we've quite, we've we've quite gone ad nauseum with it. It's just, it's just so remarkable. It's so remarkable how uninspired that is. Uh, Stoffyari says, "I thought they had disintegrator beams for a clinical removal of bodies." I don't know, Stoffyari. Erigmar says we need we need to mine grain for the empire lands. <laughs> we mine grain. <laughs> I like you mine grain. I, you know what? I wouldn't put it past them to put that line in the next one. <laughs> How much grain have you mined? <laughs> well, it's not so much a question of mining the grain, my lord, as get as putting it through the refinery. We have to have the refined grain. <laughs> Our refineries are running at capacity. <laughs> Stomkrow says this is the crackhead version of Seven Samurai uh, and and heavy metal and Warhammer Forty Thousand and Star Wars and a dozen <clears throat> and a little bit of a dash of Fifth Element just to throw it in there. I, I swear to God, it's such a mishmash of of other things. Yeah, hydroponics. Exactly, Star Fury. Hydra fracking ponics. Snyder is a moron. He's the, has he ever watched one episode of Star Trek: The Next Generation? Like even one. 
it, you know what's funny is uh the, the star trek series voyager star trek voyager you know that they're traveling through the delta quadrant they have no other ships to help them and so there are episodes where Captain Janeway and the crew are dealing with energy shortages. They're dealing with maintenance problems because they don't have any spare parts or, you know, they, they're looking for, you know, they're, they're looking for resources. And so they will go to these planets and they will have to barter with like local civilizations for their, for things like grain or, or, you know, fuel and stuff like that. And it's like, well, yeah, that makes sense for like one starship that's stranded alone in hostile territory with no backup or any no space dock they can go to for for a refit, you know. Wrangler <laughs> vegan. It's to feed all the vegan population. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh so that's Rebel Moon. Are you gonna watch Rebel Moon? <laughs> Rebel Moon. I had high hopes for Rebel Moon. I really did. I I sort of thought, wouldn't it be fun if Snyder comes out with just a really just rocking kind of rated R Star Wars esque Star Wars adjacent kind of story, and and it just embarrasses Disney and Bob. I would have enjoyed that. I really would have. I would have liked that. I think that would have been interesting. You know what's crazy though is like when Snyder goes on Joe Rogan and starts running the math, and he's like, well, because. This many hundred million views were on Netflix, and because the average home is two viewers, that means that if this were in a theater, it made one point seven billion dollars. And I'm like, Zach, <laughs> like, Zach, tell me, tell me you're not that delusional, like, bruv, <laughs> As, you know, Zach, <laughs> you know. We need to have an intervention for this guy. Like, he's delusional. He's delusional. <clears throat> he, You know, he's almost at Jeff Loveness levels of delusion, which is scary, folks. That is scary. It's not easy to get to, to Jeff Loveness versions of delusion. Hey, you know, have you heard of a thing called the Acolyte, my dear, my dear chat? Have you heard of this? Have you heard about this? There is a there is going to be a new Disney Star Wars show called The Acolyte. And we all know in this chat that it's going to be garbage. We know this because first of all it's Disney and second of all <laughs> Dude, that trailer is so bad. But 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 there is a subset of the human species which is in fact very excited for The Acolyte. Um and their, their thinking is somewhat different from the norm. Uh, that, but they they are what are known as shills. And they're very excited about the Acolyte. They think it's going to be great. They have no idea what the story is. They have no idea <laughs> how it's going to fit into the lore. Uh, nothing in the trailer establishes even one main character. It doesn't even establish the titular Acolyte. Nevertheless, this does not dissuade a shill. A shill is still slavishly panting in, in anticipation for the Acolyte debut. And so we are going to study the species. Unfortunately, I do not have a doctorate in shill studies. I'm sorry, folks. I'm not qualified. I am not qualified to study them for you. However, there is a man, a warrior, a scholar, and his name is Grizzy1989, and he does have a, he has a doctoral thesis in shillery. And he studies them for posterity, and he he preserves their motives for the historical record. And we are going to watch this record. We are going to do some grizzly shills. But the captain needs a short break. Stop here. He says, clearly hired the Empire for a thorough cleaning project. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Grizzy! Grizzy is coming up, folks. Grizzy, and uh, the purpose of time has arrived in the chat. Ahoy, the purpose of time. Welcome aboard the Captain's Cast. By the way, if you're enjoying the stream, please like and subscribe. And uh, consider coming back next Sunday the, and uh, bring a friend. The purpose of, uh, preferably a female, uh, the purpose of time is... Uh, says, I think it's amazing and is leading up to something that could create a trend in harder sci-fi. Would that be Rebel Moon, the purpose of time? By the way, welcome. I love disagreement. I really do. I'm like, yes, someone who disagrees with me. I'm so excited. Uh, well, listen, here's what, did you like Rebel Moon, the purpose of time? Tell me what you think of it. 
Fu Man Blue says, Grizzy is the curator of cringe. <laughs> yes, he is. Regular says, we cannot let this moon become untidy because it is made of cheese and might become moldy. Uh, what I would say, the purpose of time, is if you like it, you like it. And uh, all, I, all I can say to that is that I would agree that that's what I would hope. I would hope that it could become a trend in harder sci-fi. I would... Oh, are you talking about the Acolyte? Is it the Acolyte or Rebel Moon? Let me know. All right. I will look for your chat, and we will be back in just a moment. In just a moment. And uh, be nice, chat. Be welcoming to the newcomer. <laughs> Stop, Yuri. I'm looking at you, Stop, Yuri. I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right, here we go. I'll be right back. The Captain's Cast is live on the YouTube, Rumble, and on the Swords and Starships channel. Live on YouTube, Rumble, and X, formerly Twitter. So, uh, and we are at the SNS channel on Twitter. That's SN as in November S. So check that out. Give us a follow. I'm trying to get good at this. I'm trying to level up my Twitter game. Also, we have a Discord, and the Discord link is in the description. If you want to join us and, and help us build this little Swords and Starships fellowship that's going to become small but mighty, uh, join us, because we have Fallout RPG chat, and we have all kinds of cool stuff going on. Everybody's welcome here. Everybody's welcome. If you think I'm wrong about the Acolyte, pull up a chair. <laughs> Let's have some fun. So anyhow... Um, all right, Wrangler with a $4.20 super chat. Well, thank you, Wrangler. That is very kind, sir. Very kind. Never says anything. <laughs> Just $4.20. You could set your watch by Wrangler, and I appreciate that. Truly, I do. So, Eddie, well, where did... Uh... Okay, the purpose of... I'm looking for... I, I wanted an answer to my question from the purpose of time. So let's see here. He said, haven't seen Rebel yet. Okay, cool. Yeah, but you're not missing anything. <laughs> I mean, if you want to watch it, go ahead. I'm just, uh, I cannot recommend it, sir. <clears throat> three, bo oh, three body people. Is that what you're thinking? Oh, okay. Yeah, no. I, I was, I, was like, <laughs> I don't mean to be dismissive. I'm like, someone's going to make a case for the act. I, that's, I'm not going to be mean. I promise. The captain would never be mean to someone in the audience. Uh. So don't misunderstand. I just I just enjoy debate. I do. I enjoy debating people. Uh, the it, it's only the only thing I don't enjoy is cancel pigs. That's the only. Th it's, if someone's trying to get someone deplatformed or some bullshit like that. That's the only person I got an issue with. But if someone disagrees with me, I got no issue. So the purpose of time says I think it's smart they use the characters to represent Earth on a larger scale. It has a deeper narrative on current affairs in the subtext. I think you're talking about three body problem. Am I right? Which is totally fair. I told, you know, um, 
Mm, let's see. And look at that. Fu Man Blue is like, it would be great to see you on Discord the purpose of time. And it would. I'm trying to catch up on kind of the discourse here. Uh, I kind of missed the context there, but uh, people need to open their minds. The visual text handle, handled in it and the mise en scene. Oh my gosh! The purpose of time just used one of my favorite $6 words. Mise en scene, which is a snooty film critic term, which simply means the overall feeling, tone, and and sensation that you get from watching a film. So it, it's kind of a catch-all. But the mise-en-scene, so much discussed visually. Interesting. Interesting. Well, keep it coming, the purpose of time. We will discuss. And in the meantime, we have Grizzy Shills. So take it away, Grizzy. He's doing the work. <laughs> He's doing the work for all of us, folks. He's sparing us. Of AKA Chlamydia Burns is finally discussing the Acolyte trailer. And it looks very good. It looks excellent. I'm very excited. Dude, that doesn't sound very genuine. <laughs> I guess she must have thought that if she waited... It's excellent. It looks very good. I, I'm very excited. <laughs> Jeez. You know, she sounds more excited when she's talking about why she refuses to watch The Sound of Freedom. I'm just saying. <clears throat> she must have thought that if she waited a week... I might not notice. Mama's wrong again. So she begins by <laughs> accusing fans basically of lying in wait, waiting for the trailer to drop so they could immediately jump on it and start hating it. I was surprised that the Acolyte was so low. It trended when they announced that they were going to do the trailer, but it was apparently just for people because they were getting ready to hate on it, which is kind of sad. As usual, she doesn't know what the hell she's talking about. The day the trailer dropped, it did have more likes than dislikes. So it would be more accurate to say that the pro-Disney crowd, the Disney Star Wars shills, were the ones waiting to blast this trailer with likes and false praise, more so than the haters waiting to blast the trailer with dislikes. These pro that's a really brilliant point that Grizzy just made. <laughs> that is exactly the, the, dude, the gaslighting, man. It's like for 12 hours, it was more liked than it was disliked. So a full 12 hours went by and the internet made its judgment. It's like they are, they always love democracy until it's in practice and it doesn't go in their favor. <laughs> like they, they, you know, I'm not, I'm just saying like, these are always the people that are so upset about my democracy but they hate democracy. They hate the idea of people having their say. It's always, if it goes against them, then they got to cry about it. Disney NPCs come. And you know, if I may, just for a moment, it bothers me this straw man argument she's making that people are just waiting to hate on it. Uh, madam, madam, let me explain to you what I am waiting for. I am waiting for a Star Wars series that restores Luke Skywalker to the character that he was at the end of Return of the Jedi. I am waiting for a story that has detailed, rich characters with multiple layers and complex moral stories. I am waiting for the day that I no longer have to watch the heroes that I grew up with being destroyed, deconstructed, and humiliated and pissed on. And also, Grace, as a matter of fact, I am waiting for the day that a D-plus TV series is not written by stupid people who may or may not eat glue. Come up with all their excuses, but the fact of the matter is, is that the ratio accurately represents how the fan base feels about Disney Star Wars. So for those of you who don't know, Chlamydia Burns is a <laughs> radical feminist. So naturally, she will have an orgasm over seeing Carrie Ann Moss. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> he calls her Chlamydia why does he call her that? <laughs> I'm just, does, I'm just, this is why I ask folks, because I'm curious if like there's some obscure news story or something that, you know, that he knows about that I don't, I, I probably not. It's probably just a meme, but I still wonder, like, does he know of like some obscure story about some scandal with her? <laughs> like, like Grace Randolph admits she was diagnosed with chlamydia. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's uh, but it's also funny because it's like no let let never let it be forgotten right 
why are they always upset when the Marvels goes down in flames, right? Because in a normal world, like in a sane world, they would say, oh, it really sucks that people didn't like it. I loved this movie because blah, blah, blah. But what they always, what she said about Marvels is it's really sad day for female representation. It's a really sad day for representation of females. So in other words, why do they defend crap? Well, they defend crap because they're not defending the crap. They're not defending Disney Star Wars. They're not defending the MCU. They're not defending Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. They're not defending any of those things. What they are defending is the message. They're defending their worldview. That's why that that's why the shillery, right? That's really what's motivating it. That that is why they make stupid arguments about Rise of Skywalker, like, oh, uh, like like they they shit on the the original trilogy and try to make stupid arguments about it not working. So, yeah, we have and we have a new member in the Discord. Well, hello. <laughs> Welcome Magic Mike. All right. Well, you know, might be the wrong crowd for Magic Mike, but hey, welcome. All comers, welcome. All right, here we go. Ann Moss looks incredible. She looks so great. Yes, yeah, that's right. Trinity from the Matrix movies. She is a perfect Jedi. Shut up, shut up, you crazy bitch whore. I mean, it's just absolutely perfect. I can't, I just, I, I, it's just, I can't wait. How do you know it's perfect? You haven't seen the show. I mean, the pro Disney crowd is always coming after us for criticizing the show before. That's it. Yeah. So what does this comment say? It would be a huge mistake to go into the acolyte with any preconceived notions or headcanon. Watch the show for frack's sake before you start taking sh uh, making shit takes like this. You, you know what's so funny about this? Well, that's what I would say to you about Ahsoka <laughs> Mandalorian season three. Dude, all the shills have his headcanon. Because whenever they're defending Ahsoka or a Bo Katan, all they ever cite is their own headcanon. They don't actually have a story. They don't actually have a plot or character development. They have no established lore that's being that's being held to a standard in any of these shows. So all they ever do is make arguments based on headcanon. They they and, and they and they claim because they can just make up anything they want, they claim you really can't. You can't disagree with The Last Jedi. You can't disagree with uh, Rise of Skywalker because, well, it's open to interpretation. It comes out, why are you allowed to say it's perfect? Funny how that works, isn't it? You dusty old queef. So here's a Mandela Stenberg. That, that would be Walton Goggins who's going to be playing the ghoul in Fallout. Arguably the only possibly interesting character. She has a really nice beauty shot where she looks great later on in the trailer. Wow, another woke pro-Disney social justice warrior type misgendering Amanda Stenberg. Hashtag cancel chlamydia burns. Okay, so she misgendered her. Okay, I hope he explains how. Is it non-binary? Is that what I'm guessing? Are they them? Are they them? Her twice in the previous clip, and we have the misgender counter set at two. Now let's see how many more times Chlamydia Burns misgenders Amanda Lestenberg. Yeah, there it is. Oh yeah, it's they, them, non-binary. Oh, this is very chat. This is bad. This is very, very bad. Grace Randolph is a bigot, and we need to get the word out immediately. <laughs> These are the rules they created. See, see, this is why it's funny to me that like they think it's only going to be like MAGA people that are going to be in the struggle session. They think it's only ever going to be like uh, Gina Carano that's in the struggle session. Let me tell you something. Uh, when the day comes, <laughs> if it comes, Grace Randolph is going to be in the struggle session for a slip like that. She is absolutely going to be. What did I see in the chat? I saw something. Oh, no. Regular. She's going to fade her in her pants. <laughs> oh, no. She's going to fade her. She's going to fade her in her pants. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you something. There's a lot of lightsabers and they're in a lot of pretty colors in this trailer. <laughs> so, uh, Fu Man Blue says, uh, you know, Fu Man Blue, my respect for you has instantly risen based on this comment. He says the verisimilitude of the mise en scene. And that is something only a super smart person would say. So I appreciate that, Fu Man Blue. 
Have I have I mentioned the mise en scene of Godzilla minus one recently? It's brilliant. It's bri Godzilla minus one, by the way, has ruined me for any American Godzilla film. Like ruined me. I I can't, folks. Even even to review it, I don't want to watch Godzilla X Kong. I still would have, but it's kind of a holiday weekend, and I have other things going on. But that's the only reason I haven't seen it. But I'm telling you, I I'm dreading it. I'm dreading Godzilla X Kong. I don't want to see it. But uh, I will watch it for you, chat, and we'll meme the shit out of it, because I know it's going to be bad. I could be wrong. I could be wrong. It's been known to happen from time to time. Rarely. Rarely. But it's been known to happen. Um, what else in the... I don't want to miss any of your great comments on this. <laughs> uh where was it oh there it is oh there it is this is why folks this is why we call Starfury our sweet prince across the pond you know <laughs> it's it's his gentleness of nature you understand it's his it's his boundless compassion it's his it's his almost blind optimistic belief in the human spirit is why we call him our sweet prince and uh and he demonstrates it with uh, this comment here <laughs> uh, speaking, of course, of chlamydia birds, Starfury says, pass the penicillin. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. I think, you know, I think what's so funny is the sheer unfairness of it. It's the sheer unfairness of that to moniker that makes it so funny. <laughs> like, what? what is your evidence for calling her that? <laughs> it's it's uh it's fracked up folks i take full responsibility i take full responsibility for finding that hilarious <laughs> on an easter sunday of all days i find it hilarious uh stafiari says i wonder if i could get kicked off my own struggle session oh man they'd have their work cut out with you star fury frankly with all of us in this crowd but uh uh roll tape Berg. All right, there's Amanda Stenberg. She does look great. She looks phenomenal. Oh, no. Purple. I guess they're still finding their colors. Uh, she looks great. She looks oh, great. no. I think her hair looks phenomenal. No, stop the damage. Somebody get to this woman. Somebody tell her what's happening. She doesn't even know the damage, the lives, the lives she's imperiling. Oh, my God. This is a full blown crisis, folks. I think she looks really great. You are a bigot. But this character seems like a combination to the uh, apprentice villain in Ahsoka. The Chihuahua. And, uh, you know, uh, the apprentice villain in... Oh, my, no. <laughs> oh, no, Reva? For God's sakes, Grace. Reva. Reva? You're like, you are one of ten people on the planet that, it, that find this character interesting. <laughs> uh, uh, Obi-Wan. Wow, doesn't even know their names. Hashtag fake fan. So oh, God, that's so... Oh, he nailed it. I know. She she loves this character. I knew the name of the character. She didn't. Get folks. I, I can't even remember the name of characters I like sometimes, you know. I remembered the name of Reva, and she didn't. And I hate, I hate the Obi-Wan series. So what does that tell you? So I'm like, well, what about those two ladies? Why don't we just get back to them? How about no? <laughs> All right. Oh, there's a Chewbacca. I forgot what they're called. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Why do you even cover Star Wars at this point? You don't Seriously. know what anyone's name is. You don't know that this is a Wookiee. And you did. She, that's, she said, folks, <laughs> folks. She said, dude, deep, by the way, let there be no doubt. This is why I say these are stupid people writing these shows, because this is the type of person that no hyperbole here, folks. This is the type of person who's writing Star Wars. This is the type of person who is working on the scripts <clears throat> for the MCU. People that say shit like this. Uh, yeah, that's a Chewbacca. I don't remember what they're called. I love Star Wars. It's my favorite thing. Sorry, I, I stepped on Grizzy's brilliant point here, so I'm going to wind it back a little. That this is a Wookiee, and you didn't even remember that Obi-Wan Kenobi dies in A New Hope. But they got to have someone good in there. They got, maybe, I mean, I mean maybe Obi-Wan could show up. Maybe we could find a way, you know, he'd be much older, I guess, at this point. Oh, no. But, uh, you know, no, he died, right? Ah, oh, darn it. Stupid. 
dick. <laughs> Cunt. Fucking whore. Jeez, <laughs> oh, Chris. So darkness rises. That's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> and for the grand finale, this would not be a Disney uh, Star Wars Shills React video if she did not point out that the color of the lightsaber is... Red. That's red. All right, then there's a red lightsaber. What? Where the heck did that come from? Who caught it? Oh, my God. <laughs> Why? Uh, why do I choose to have chlamydia in my life? Jesus Christ, make sure you hit that like button before you get out of here. Please subscribe to the channel, become a channel member, and most importantly, uh, thank you all for watching. Oh, Grizzy. <laughs> oh, dude, please go and if the link is in the description, make sure you throw a like and a subscribe as well. Because oh, that is that was brilliant. I love that was a great finish. <clears throat> Why do I choose to have chlamydia in my life? <laughs> well, well done. I see what you did there. What was it he said? What, how could she say this, though? Like, what, what was her last point? I'm trying to remember what it was. Because, uh, God, there was a lot. Oh, yeah, the, the red lightsaber. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. So that that just made me think. Like, like I have just a little bit of sympathy for the shills on this one area of like when they point out the color of the lightsaber. I, listen, listen. I, I the captain is nothing if not a man of compassion. I, I do not mock the shills out of mean spiritedness. No, nay, I say, nay. In fact, it is out of love. It is out of pity. I pity the shills. I feel sorry for them. I want to help the shills. What can I do? There must be some sort of international charitable organization, something. I haven't found it yet, but it must exist, and I want to help them. And so, and so when they say they love the color of the lightsaber, I pity them. Because what else have they, Chad? What else can they comment on? There's no story. There's no principal character. There's not even a titular acolyte. There's no hook for a narrative. There's no actual tension or stakes. There's no sense of time or place. There's no good visual style. There's nothing new that we haven't seen before in Star Wars. They don't even really remember the lore of Star Wars anyway. What can they possibly talk about except the pretty colors of the lightsaber? I pity them. I, I, I deplore their plight. I, I despair. I despair, Chad. Fu Man Blue with a $10 super chat. My good, he's on a roll, folks. He won't stop. I can't stop him. Uh, he says, it's almost like they're writing shows in a way that makes them easier to shill for by even people that know nothing about the franchise. So they're writing it as shows that makes them easier to shill for by people that know nothing about it. Like that, that is, that's a very interesting point. Cause basically what you're saying is you have, you have people like chlamydia. That, oh geez. He's got me saying it now. <laughs> You've got people like her. She, she loves Reva. Doesn't even remember the character's name. She doesn't even, by the way, congratulations, Grace. Almost nobody else on earth does either. <laughs> okay. Okay. Like nobody remembers that character. Uh, but, but whatever. Uh, so, so she shells for Reva. Meanwhile, the people writing this crap also, also don't know the characters' names. They don't know anything. Leslie Headland, the woman whose face is shaped like an ice cube, as Grizzy correct. Let me just show you this. Let me just show you this. Uh, she says that she hired someone to write on the Acolyte who had never seen Star Wars ever before. Okay. And so, to your point, Fu Man Blue, uh, so... People writing Star Wars that know nothing about Star Wars for people who claim to love Star Wars but don't like it and don't know anything about it, they are creating things for them to react to, which is pretty colors, <laughs> uh, alien, cute aliens that make baby noises, <laughs> and, uh, and shiny objects. Just generally shiny objects like Baskar armor, for example. And uh, representation, and diversity, and uh, lots of gay kissing. Speaking of that, uh, let me just share this with you. This was on Grizzy's Twitter. This was Grizzy's Twitter. Oh, okay. <laughs> now, folks, this is an unaltered, totally accurate photo that has had no 
alteration whatsoever. And he says, why is Leslie Headland's head shaped like an ice cube? <laughs> Probably the same reason that Ryan Johnson's head is shaped like a soccer ball. <laughs> and, then, and then it's got like the caption where she, her quote, as a queer ally, I felt it necessary to queer code my queerness into the story because is no queer representation in Hollywood, which is now 90% queer. Anyway, there we go. I don't think that's a verbatim quote. <clears throat> uh, you know, just to keep things on the up and up, I will leave it there. Redoubt Production says, what if we had Star Wars without conflict? <laughs> that means you have no story. I know. I will say, you know, like one of the big challenges with Star Trek The Next Generation was that Roddenberry was very adamant that in the Federation future of Star Trek, there, there, he, he, he would say humans don't have interpersonal conflict anymore. Humans don't have conflict like violence, war, poverty. It's all gone. And, uh, and so it presented kind of a challenge for the writers in the early episodes. Cause they're like, well, we got to have something. And it kind of shows in that first season. Cause that first season of next gen was a bit rough. There were some good episodes in there, but there were a lot of rough ones. And you could tell that, like, the writers are sort of grasping, you know? It's like, and listen, it's an idealistic idea. I sort of admire the the, the goal of it. But at the end of the day, you have to, you have to strike a balance. I actually think, uh, and eventually, Star Trek really did find its footing with being able to show an enlightened humanity, but that still has problems. And I think they did that very well later in Next Gen and very well in Deep Space Nine and so on. Um, and I actually think Seth MacFarlane's Orville does that very well. They, they actually have some episodes where the characters try to explain how the no money thing works in the future and different things like that. And I thought they were game attempts, if not totally successful ones. <clears throat> yeah, it's, uh, let's see, stop here. He says, cats for all these single women and of course the box wine to cry into. <laughs> yeah, definite linebacker. I hear that on the rocks. Yep. <laughs> Is Leslie queer? I never would have known. I know. It's uh definitely that's a surprise. That's a shocker. And I never would have I never would have guessed that Grace Randolph was such a bigot. I mean, she misgendered that poor she misgendered that poor uh they them so many times. It's very sad. Stavieri says, I definitely call a flag on the headland play. <laughs> I see we're having fun with we're having fun with old Leslie. Old, old former assistant to Harvey Weinstein. Uh, Roddenberry's box. <laughs> Is that like Schrodinger's cat, Wrangler? Fu Man Blue says, former Harvey Weinstein's personal assistant, assistant Leslie Headland. Don't want to dead name her by not including the title anytime you say her name. Agreed. Fu Man Blue says, I love how Gary never misses a beat on that front. You know, that's exactly right. It's like, uh, th this is why this is why I think the term woke is very effective because it used to be their word, and now it's the word normies use to understand them. It's it's a normie. That's the thing. Wokeness is a word that, that speaks to normies, but more specifically, it is a way of never letting it be forgotten that these are these are the things that they they believe. These are the things they stand by. And I would never seek to see anyone deplatformed, but also the word, you know, people should hear what they think because they love to lie about what, she, you know, Grace Randolph in that video lied about fans. She lied. She said that fans were just waiting to downvote the Acolyte trailer. No, they weren't. No, they weren't. Now, they may have expected it to be garbage. Well, that's for good reason. But if the Acolyte trailer had been something like Andor, I think it would have been a different story. Maybe, maybe not. But the point is, either way, their their opinion is about Disney Star Wars, and that opinion is valid. And she's implying that they just hate it for, for reasons. It's like, no, they have good reasons for why they feel the way they do. So <clears throat> if they're going to never miss an opportunity to lie about the fans and use those lies to divide the fans and 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 exclude them from having their opinion heard and their voices heard you know the and uh, expressing their lived experiences all the things they claim to care about well then we should never miss an opportunity to tell the truth 
about their corruption to the extent that it exists. I mean, Leslie Headland is a corrupt person who is part of a corrupt company, which is part of a corrupt industry. So she, she's a dime a dozen. She's a dime a dozen in Hollywood. Yes. Stafiori is very, he is very, pe uh, what is the word? Um, contrite. Stafiori is very contrite about uh, not correctly naming for me, former, <laughs> former head, <laughs> former assistant to Harvey Weinstein, and Leslie Hedlund. Oh yeah, she earned it already. She she earned it. Wrangler says Roddenberry's box was the term that writers applied to the no interhuman conflict rule. They understandably felt confined by it. I no, I totally get that. Roddenberry's box uh, that I had never heard that before. But you're right. That that's a terrible box for writers to be in because you need conflict in a story. And I just don't agree with the premise that Roddenberry was saying. There's never going to be an era where there's not conflict among humans. There just isn't. It's not reality. And I think it's, it is kind of, now there may be an era where certain conflicts that used to be a conflict are no more. And I think that is a reasonable way to get at it. And that's kind of the way I look at it. You know, like uh, we don't really have much of a conflict in our society anymore about, you know, paranoia, paranoia about witches, for example. We're not worried about our neighbors being witches and we're not concerned with putting witches on trial. Um, so that's a conflict that is extinct in modern human society. Fortunately, we have, uh, we have the blue hairs to go find new ones for us. So we, we thank them for that. We thank them for that. Uh, what else we got in the stack of stuff? Oh, it's, uh, dude, Gamergate is, is going full tilt. A uh, Gamergate, Gamergate strikes back. Let's get, so, let's get Jer. Jeremy's report on this. I but also there was something else. Okay, yeah, I got I got something funny on this topic. Uh but let, there has been a development in Gamergate and uh, I would like to highlight it. So here we go. Uh we're going to roll tape on this. Hat tip geeks and gamers. Geeks and gamers and this would be Jeremy. Uh and uh th he has a very nice breakdown here of what the latest is. Talk about your glorious backfires. This one is shaping up to be a legendary backfire. This is a group called Black Girl Gamers. And Black Girl Gamers wants you to know that they do not have discriminatory hiring practices at all. Why would anyone believe that? Why would anyone believe that? Black Girl Gamer says right here, we're addressing the recent allegations published on thatparkplace.com about discriminatory hiring practices within Black Girl Gamers. These claims are false and were made without pri uh, prior fact checking or verification from us or our representatives. <laughs> I love that prior fact checking. What would that have been? Um, is it true that you are a gender centric and race centric uh, organization? <laughs> no, that is not true. Oh, okay. Thanks for fact checking that for me. <laughs> And they continue to go on through this, and they get to this point here where it says, we will continue to pursue further action against anyone who persists in spreading false and defamatory information about black girl gamers, its founder, and its contractors and partners. Well, okay. We value the talent and, contrib and contributions of all of the collaborators, and we are committed to continuing to do so. Thank you to our community for the ongoing support. It's a little bit different tweet than maybe something like this that was uh, a few weeks ago where it says gamers that thought the industry revolved around them and their comforts are now realizing it doesn't. That is from Black Girl Gamers where they got absolutely annihilated and ratioed on social media for disrespecting gamers. And it's just getting better because that park place has an attorney and their attorney. And this is a super chat from Friday night tights that I just got done uh, being on. And we had a great show. Ron Coleman, Ron Coleman says they managed to start up with the only YouTube crew that comes with its own first amendment slash defamation lawyer with 239,000 followers on X. So yeah, I'm guessing DEI in action here. 
do, and if you don't know kind of the, the preamble to this <clears throat> was that you have this group, Black Girl Gamers, and they had basically said, uh, they say on their website, they, they proudly acknowledge that they only have, they, they have a staff that has no white people on it. Right. So that's what started all this. They got roasted for that and they got, well, that's racist. That's racist shit right there. Well, no, 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 that's not racist. We're not racist. You're ignorant. No, you're ignorant. That's not racist. That is from Ron Coleman. We have Ron Coleman. Isn't it, isn't it funny? Isn't it funny? The, the pro democracy, the pro inclusivity, the uh, believe all women, the uh, diversity, equity, inclusion crowd, uh, every voice, every lived experience. They look at the, they get a little bit of push, pushback. They get held to account on one thing that they say and immediately what do they want? They want deplatforming, they want legal warfare, they want lawfare, they want to destroy, dismantle. You know, you, you scratch a Wokey and you will uncover an authoritarian wacko. Every time, folks, every time. Coleman, who's also on Twitter, 230, or now 241,000, um, even retweeted a little segment here that Valiant Renegade clipped from Friday Night Tights. And do you think that somebody like Ron Coleman is going to be messing around? I don't think so. And the fact that they have decided to target literally anyone um, that is having an opinion on them, much less someone that's represented by Ron Coleman, is absolutely hilarious. This is a video from Asmund Gold. Uh, and right here, Asmund Gold pretty much puts it into perspective right here. Check this out. To now gaming companies threatening legal action. Sweet Baby Inc. style consulting company Black Girl Gamers threatens legal action over that Park Place gaming website over defamatory allegations. They go to say that they will pursue legal action against anyone who links to the Park Place's article or spreads it in any manner. I want to read it. I want to see it for myself. Gentlemen, it has been a privilege editing for you tonight. Because, like, whenever I, like, this is, I'm the kind of person that's like, you know, you got a spidey sense, I have a common sense. I feel like this is so extreme, I don't believe it. We're addressing recent applications uh, published on that Park Place about discriminatory hiring practices within Black Girl Gamers. These claims of us are false, and prior to fact-checking or verification from our representatives. Uh, where's the content creator part? Uh, content creators who reshared the false allegations against, about our organization. We will continue to pursue further action against anyone who persists in spreading false and defamatory information against black gold gamers. Well, wouldn't that mean that they're suing themselves because they link to it themselves? <laughs> oh my so goodness. Good. It's so beautiful. <laughs> you linked to it yourself. After you sit there and threaten people that are linking to this site and this article saying you're going to sue anyone for defamation, you linked it yourself. Absolutely glorious. Because, like, they did... Well, folks, this is what happens when you, you eat glue and not people food. Just link the website. And, like, if you go to the website, this is the website. It literally shows the website that they're telling people not to talk about. I wonder who wrote this. I <laughs> Think of how stupid that is. <laughs> Think of how stupid that is. It's like, you're like, please don't look at this article right here. I'm going to link it for you. <laughs> if this is false, e this is false, incorrect information. I I'm sure it's someone who's really smart. <laughs> how do you do this to yourself? How do you do this? Like, this is crazy. It's very smart. Yeah. It's a Streisand effect in action. It's not, though, because they're doing it themselves. This is glorious. Like, watching this all play out, it, it truly is one of the great trolls uh, uh, in reverse because they're trolling themselves right now. And again, they deserve it. When they're putting statements out there like this, gamers that thought the industry revolved around them and their comforts are now realizing it doesn't. That puts it in perspective. That puts it into perspective right here with the type of people that you are dealing with. They hate you. They hate gaming. They hate the gaming industry. They hate anyone that considers themselves a gamer. And if you go and look at the article on thatparkplace.com, you know, the thing that the Black Girl Gamers Group linked to, then you, actually, we could just do that right now. Why, why don't we just click? Okay, look. 
Oh, okay. Well, I'm Black Girl Gamers puts out a tweet. Well, let me let me click on this link right here. Oh, that takes me to thatparkplace.com. Uh, okay, well, that seems like a pretty cool website. Let me see what they have going on. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah. I mean, I have my, my uh, ratio messed up right here, but you literally can go to their website and look for yourself, and it's here, live and in living color. Absolutely fantastic. This is one of the great backfires I've ever seen, and it's just playing out right before our very eyes. So you guys let me know your thoughts in the comments. A brilliant video by Jeremy over there at Geeks and Gamers. Give him a like, give him a follow. You know, they're just a plucky little crew. They're trying to make they're trying to make it work. So <laughs> there you go. That's a brilliant report. I really love that. Um You know, th this I share that with you because, folks, you, this is good news. Like, they are getting ho hoisted on their own petard because wind the clock back two years. Twitter was in the hands of these kinds of left-wing wackos. And you know what happened? They they have no idea how good they had it, Black Girl Gamers. They have no idea how good they had it back then because they could say the most vicious, vile things they wanted with impunity. And uh, anyone who would... Who would expressed any kind of dissent to this would have been shadow banned, uh, deplatformed, removed. So what's happened is they actually now live in an actual, in an actual democracy. See, they live in a real one now. They thought they lived in one before. Well, now they live in a real one. And in a real democracy, you don't get everything you want all the time. You are held to account by your fellow citizens when they disagree with you. You have to you have to earn your ideas must earn their place in the marketplace of ideas and that requires debate and public discourse. Uh in other words, work. Work. Lazy fools don't like doing work and that's what all that's what left-wing activists well, I mean, they do have a work ethic. I take that back. I would say that their worldview is a, is a lazy worldview because it's low resolution and it depends upon them being protected from all criticism and all dissent. And now, now they have to... Exp now, is, is Elon removing them from the platform? No. In fact, in fact, Elon even said, like, this is unacceptable. He said their views are unacceptable. Check this out right here. I got it right here. Uh, I'll pull this up. And this is to make a point, right? Because they say that Elon Musk is anti-free speech. The, the, that would be the wackos. That's what they say. Um, and he, quote, tweeted, organizations like, uh, or actually, no, this is me. <laughs> this is me, quote, tweeting him. Uh, yes, this is on the Swords and Starships chat. That's right. I put it in here because I wanted to plug my uh, Twitter. Okay. Swords and Starships is at the SNS channel on X, formerly Twitter. So check it out. Give us a like. Give us a follow. We are live streaming there right now. And uh, this was my quote tweet of Elon's quote tweet. And we'll see, we'll see who does better in the algorithm. We'll just check. We'll just may the best man win. Organizations like Sweet Baby Inc. and Black Girl Gamers want to claim they are being harassed, but by pushing their own brands of bigotry and sexism, they fail to understand. Either racism is unacceptable for any group, or it's acceptable. Or it's acceptable. Because if it is acceptable for any one group, then it is acceptable in our society. And uh, I am of the mind that racism is unacceptable for anyone. For it's a bad, it's a bad way of looking at humanity, and it will shoot you in the foot as it is doing here. So they have become the very thing they claim to fight. Now, Elon Musk's tweet right here is, it should not be acceptable for any company in the gaming industry to be racist and sexist against, quote, white guys. Now, is he deplatforming any of these people? No. Is he removing their Twitter feed? No. But he's replying to it. So in other words, they are existing in a in a in the zone of free speech in which everybody gets their say. That's actual inclusion. That's actual inclusion. That's actual democracy. And they hate it. <laughs> they hate it. It's awful. They're like, oh, this is no fun. Democracy is where I live in a society where everyone agrees with me or the ones that don't are banned. That's democracy. Here, here, says Fu Man Blue. Thank you, Fu Man Blue. Dude, Fu Man Blue, $30 in super chats, but you're too generous, my friend. 
You're too generous. Foo Man Blue says, like that meme of the guy playing all the instruments to that hall and and uh, Oat song, and then just says, uh, <laughs> okay, I'll, you know what? I'll just leave that one in the chat. Uh, I must protect the integrity of... I, I mean, the... the TOS, YouTube TOS, render under Caesar. What is Caesar's? You understand. Stoff Yuri says, everyone is included, um, except if you are a tad, a tad pale colored. Yes, colored. I'm sorry, I mispronounced that, Stoff Yuri. It's colored. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, Star Fury. I can't put this one on the screen, Star Fury. <laughs> Jeez. I know what you're talking about, though. I know what button you're talking about. Ah, oh, look at that. I can put this one up, though. 199. Hail the 199. Dude, Cobra Cast is like my favorite show. It's like my favorite thing. And I, I don't even... And I don't mean this as a dig, because I love Jeremy. I love Jeremy. I don't actually think he's the best political commentator ever, but he's the, he's getting better all the time. Uh, but he is the funnest political commentator ever. So that is 100% the, a fact, you know? So, <laughs> and I, that is uh, in no way is that anything but affectionate. I really do mean that. <laughs> you know, sometimes that's a feature, not a bug. Because, you know, I just get tired, you know, even when it's like views I agree with, I get really tired of of some of the, the dramatics and uh, which frankly is probably a critique for myself as much as anyone. But uh, in any case, uh, there was a comment in here. I think it was in Discord. Redoubt Productions in the Discord. Link is in the description if you want to join us on the Discord, and we welcome you. We welcome you. Redoubt says, The only thing I have to respond to continual Gamergate drama is this. To quote Gene Hackman in Mississippi Burning, quote, Looks like the rattlesnakes are starting to commit suicide. <laughs> so uh, I... I haven't seen that movie, so I don't really know the context, but I would just say that if what you're saying is they're being hoisted on their own petard, they are. And uh, don't misunderstand, I'm bringing this up to give you good news. Good news. Because two years ago, two years ago, there, there would have been no no pushback to this. There would have been, they would have been suffering. Sweet Baby Inc., there, there would have, I'm telling you, they probably would have gotten uh, Sweet Baby Inc. detected banned. That probably would have happened two years ago. They would have suppressed all of this dissent. Uh, but what's happening is they now are they now are having to live in a world where the only thing that has changed, literally the only thing that has changed is they have to hear, well, not necessarily hear, because they can block anyone they want. In fact, uh, Elon, one of Elon Musk's uh, employees posted, hey, here's a screenshot of how, of how, detailed you can block things you don't want to see or people you don't want to interact with you like you can definitely protect your account uh but but the world gets to hear what people think about what they think which is fair that's the fairest system you know the reason that i am an americanist an americanist not a republican not a democrat I am an Americanist. I What is an Americanist? Well, an Americanist is someone who believes in the American way. What is the American way? Well, read the Declaration of Independence. Read the Federalist Papers. Read the Constitution. Read the writings of the framers and the founders. And uh, read the Gettysburg Address. Read the works of Frederick Douglass, Martin Luther King. Uh, even a few of the, you know, the speeches of Ronald Reagan, the speeches of John F. Kennedy. Those are the things that those are roughly the things I believe, but specifically, specifically the founding documents. That is Americanism. That is what I believe in. It's very simple. It's written in plain language. It does not need, contrary to popular belief, uh, a bunch of tedious, arcane interpretation. And it roughly says, here's a social contract. Why do I support that social contract? Because it's fair. It's fair. Free speech. Everyone gets free speech. Doesn't matter how disgusting or deplorable or odious I find someone's views. Doesn't matter. They have a right to say it. Obviously, short of direct calls for violence, which is against the law, that is not free speech. Direct calls for violence, that, that is equivalent to assault. That's not protected under free speech. Other than that, Whatever vile, vicious... I mean, what, what Sweet Baby Inc. does and says is disgusting to me. It's disgusting. 
Uh, what what Black Girl Gamers said, just the name, Black Girls Gamers. That's an awful thing. That's an awful thing to name your group. You're naming it based on, uh, you, you know, it, it, you're essentially naming it after your race and your gender, which by its very nature, these are the inclusion crowd. These are the inclusion people. The inclusion people who in the very name of their organizations are excluding people. You know what I mean? So, so what I'm saying is, I don't believe in free speech because I want to hear their disgusting, vile filth. I, I don't believe in freedom of speech and freedom of expression because I want to see the American Society of Magical Negroes. I don't. I don't want to see it. I don't want to hear it. But it's fair. They get their say. I get my say. And what does that result in? That results in, generally, a peaceful way of resolving differences. The alternative is the thousands of years of bloodshed in human history. That's the alternative to, to the social contract of freedom. You have your say, I have my say. If we break that contract, we risk regressing to an earlier stage uh, of pure tribalism. And, uh, and what I'm glad to report to you, my dear sailors and starnuts, is the tide is turning and the culture is being taken back from people who would seek to break that contract. I actually think that the good news here is that it turns out that most people in Western civilization, that, that most people generally, they may be normies, they may not know much about politics or pop culture or games or whatever, but the average person is tired of this, tired of it. The average person doesn't like bullies. The average person doesn't like censors. The average person really doesn't like hypocrites. Hypocrites who claim representation and diversity and inclusion while excluding people that don't look like them. Because we all know, as uh, that as that one lady put it, uh, what was her name? Danielle something. And she was just saying, like, uh, because we all know that the safest environment is one where everybody looks just like me. Oh, God, the way they say that, too. just like me. Why are you saying it like you're like you're singing it in some creepy Orwellian musical? Uh, <laughs> you know, the, people don't like that. People don't like that. And that's why they're losing. And, and uh, I, 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 I'm sorry to report that while it's helpful that that, uh, you know, people on the other side of the aisle have finally found their balls and are pushing back. And now, finally, gamers and moviegoers are really pushing back. I mean, that that ratio in the Acolyte trailer is legendary, folks. Like, that is legendary. So the fact that we're pushing back is great, but I think that it is it is their own actions. That would be the Wokies, the intersectional feminists, uh, the, the sexual activists. They are Their meanness, their mean-spiritedness, their hypocrisy, their uh, censoriousness, their bullying behavior, they have undone themselves. And it's a beautiful thing to see. Never interrupt your enemy when they're making a mistake. And that is what we're witnessing unfold. So that is to say, uh, my dear sailors and star knots, it's all good news today because while, while the battlefield is littered, with the corpses of our IPs, we are winning. And don't you ever doubt it. And so you of the Iron Age, of the Fellowship, and of the Swords and Starships audience, I salute you. I salute you. Fu Man Boo says, uh, yeah, woke people are on, uh, are on the nose like Ben Affleck in The Accountant. <laughs> yeah, that was not a bad movie. The, I thought the third act kind of kind of fell apart a little bit. It kind of got bogged down, but whatever. Stop, Fury. <laughs> no, come on now, Stop, Fury. He's so gentle. So meek is Stop, Fury. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I Stop, he says hypocrisy is the central tenant of of uh, woke radicals. I mean, I would say that it it's a lack of principles. Like having principles is not easy. It's not easy to have principles because having principles means that, you know, who you are as a person is who you are when nobody's looking, you know, and, and living by those principles when you can get away with breaking those principles, you know, like, uh, for example, um, 
I'm a big fan of Grant Cardone. He's a real estate investor, motivational speaker, sales trainer, etc. And uh, in one of his seminars that I attended, he was talking uh, live, I attended, and he was talking about like, you know, if you're working wherever you work, no matter how much you hate your job or whatever your feelings about it are or whatever, how, however they pay you or don't pay you, if you walk by a piece of trash, on the floor and you say to yourself, oh, that's not my job to pick it up. Pick it up anyway. Pick it up. Pick it up, put it in the trash. Why? Because you're taking you're taking action. You're taking control of your environment. You are acting according to your own ethics and integrity, regardless of what other people are doing. Yeah, everybody else ignores the piece of trash because it's not their job. You don't because your principle is, I leave things better than I found them. Right. And so I started applying that in my own life. I'm like, okay, I'm going to do that. So like I'd be walking out to the trash, uh, the dumpsters at, an, at my apartment or something. I'd be walking out to the dumpsters and I would see that someone had, you know, left some trash on the side. And usually my thought would be, I don't have to pick that up. That's not my fault. And I'd throw my trash in there. And so I started to say, you know what, I'll throw that in there too. And so I started picking up trash that other people left behind. And it's like, well, they'll just leave more and you'll just have to pick up more. It's like, yeah, I know. It's about my, it's not about them. It's about my principles. And so one day uh, I was at my job and I was walking by a mess that was on the floor and I was busy. I had a lot to do and I saw the mess and I thought, well, that's maintenance's job. That's not my job. Um, but then I thought someone could slip on that and someone could get hurt. And if I walked by it, um, and in the time between me passing it and a maintenance person pa seeing it, someone gets hurt in a way that's on me. And I thought, am I committed to this principle or am I not? Am I committed to this principle that Grant Cardone uh, so eloquently suggested, take control of my environment, act on my principles? Um, yes, I am. And so I went and I cleaned up the mess and it was a giant inconvenience. And I got very frustrated because I couldn't find a good mop and it was a big Pain. but i did it and so my point is that's what having principles is it's difficult it requires you to do things that are uncomfortable it requires you to bear stress when thing when it's not convenient and that is the problem with radical left-wing activists the the very second that it's inconvenient for them to live up to their own principles of diversity equity inclusion tolerance the very second that that becomes inconvenient for them they abandon it Without us, and then they and then they are shocked. They are shocked when people call them out on it. It's it's like uh, you said that you're against racism. Yes, that's true. I'm I'm anti-racist. Okay, but you also said that you will not allow white people in your club. That's racist. No, it's not. I don't understand. <laughs> like that's how they react. They're like I don't see the difference. <laughs> it's like what. I it's, I don't even know where how where you start with people that are that dense. But whatever. <laughs> Uh, but not us here on the Swords of Starships channel. Oh, yes. Uh, Stafiori says they definitely need a 1.1 patch update to their decision trees. Uh, they really do. And he goes on to say, learn to speak English, damn it. <laughs> One day my typing will catch up to my ideas. Are you referring to my pronunciation of Kalur? I'm pronouncing it phonetically, Stafiori. <laughs> I'm pronouncing it phonetically. It's C-O-L-O-U-R. That's how you spelled it. You know, we Americans, we are nothing if not efficient. We just drop letters we don't need. I, we don't need that, you. Get rid of it. It's out of here. <laughs> Stop here. He says, that is just good health and safety advocacy. Looking after your colleagues is a great thing. And you should feel good about yourself no matter the inconvenience. Well, I do. I do. Um, to, you know, you can't see it, but I have a halo. It's right here. <laughs> no, I... Now, I guess what my point is, there's plenty of times where I have walked past it. There's times where I have said, I'm not picking up that piece of trash. It's not my job. Or I don't have time. Or I'm supposed to be doing X. I don't, I'm not supposed to be doing Y. And it's like, um, I appreciate, I appreciate that someone called me on that. And it's like, that's, that. I, and that's what I would say is like, it's not convenient to be a free speech absolutist. It's not. There's definitely people that say ghastly terrible things, terrible things that when I hear them, I'm like, my God, 
You know, it's like I, I, it makes me start to doubt, like, should there be limits? But but then I know that like, but no, because you either believe in this principle or you don't. So the day I say that there should be limits on free speech, there should be a kind of, you know, anti-Christian rhetoric, you know, uh, pro protest or something should be banned. It's like the day I'm willing to say that is the day I no longer believe in free speech. And uh, and but it has often prompted me to wonder, is free speech in and of itself a flawed philosophy because it has within it the seeds of its own destruction? Um, but at the end of the day, it's like, well, there's only one alternative, which is authoritarian regulation of speech. And I already know how that ends because history history has, you know, endless records of how that ends. So I think on balance, it's always better to err on the side of liberty, always. In my view, because if everybody has a say, we can work it out. We can work it out peacefully. By the way, the original Star Trek series, uh, Star Trek Next Generation, the core five, the original five, but especially the original series, were founded on a future which was simply taking the democratic and, uh, and essentially, I would even say, American revolutionary views of Western civilization, English common law, Star Trek was taking that farther, farther, to its farther extent in, the, in a future where essentially what I would argue is the utopian future that Star Trek portrays is really, it's really just a future in which we are living up to our highest ideals that already exist in our society of freedom of speech, uh, justice under the law, equal protection under the law, uh, democracy, all those ideas we believe in, we know that those are our ideas and those are the things that our societies are founded on, but we also know that we fail to live up to them. Star Trek simply portrays a future in which we have succeeded wildly in living up to those ideas. Perfect example, watch the episode of Star Trek The Next Generation, The Drumhead. It's a perfect example of this. The ideals that Picard is using to argue against the witch hunt of his Romulan crewman. He's a half Romulan crewman who is being put on trial in a military witch hunt uh, because of his Romulan half race, basically, um, under suspicion of sabotage. And there's no evidence, and it's a, t it's a complete show trial, and, and Picard is trying to put a stop to it. But it's getting out of hand. It's just like basically today. A mob is trying to like take this guy down. The way that, that Picard invokes all these ideals, well, what he's evoking is Western civilizational ideals. That's what he's invoking. And that episode was written when Gene Roddenberry was still alive and well and was still executing his vision on Star Trek The Next Generation. So what I'm trying to say is that's what Star Trek was. It was Western civilization values writ large. That's not what Kurtzman Trek is, and that's not what radical wokeism is. It hates those ideals. It hates them. That They could never make that episode the drumhead today. They could never make that episode. Because wokeys, for example, don't believe. They believe that um, anyone who protests for, let's just say, Antifa, deserves to have their bail paid for. And anyone who showed up, let's just say, at a certain Capitol building on a certain day, they can be held in solitary confinement indefinitely without trial. Well, then you don't believe in the ideals of, of Gene Roddenberry. You don't believe in the ideals of Kirk or Picard's Star Trek. You don't. Because Kirk or Picard or Janeway or Archer... Uh, Cisco, they would have been there. Cisco has a great episode for these ideals. Uh, it's an episode called, I think it's called The Ordeal in Deep Space Nine. It's like in season three. Oh, it's a really good episode. This utopian communist babe tries to puts him in a box. Uh, what is it? Deep Space Nine. I think that's the name of the episode. No, maybe not. I forget. I'd have to look it up for you. But it's an episode where they they go to this planet in the Gamma Quadrant, and there's this woman who's running this utopian society, 
and Cisco starts to question some of how she runs things, and so they they torture him, and he won't break. It's freaking great. It's an excellent episode. A Avery Brooks is amazing in that episode. So what I'm saying is the original Star Trek captains lived the ideals of Western civilization. They lived the ideals, and in their in their world, there were no exceptions. It doesn't matter which partisan side it is. They are entitled to a fair trial. They are entitled to their rights under the law. Under the law. So it's not convenient to support freedom of speech. It's not convenient, but it is necessary. And it is. It is our birthright. It is our birthright. By supporting free speech, we're not supporting a law. We're not supporting a, a government's position. We are supporting our birthright. Our birthright. We are born with it. It is. It is. The only question is whether or not our government is protecting those rights. That's the only question. Free speech is the birthright of all human beings. Liberty. Liberty. Oh, you're right, Star Fury. Awesome. That is. That's the name of the episode. Paradise. The name of the episode is. Deep, I don't know. I don't remember which season. I think it's in like season two or three. If my, if unless I missed my guess, uh, but yes, uh, that so the drumhead, at the episode with Picard, that's a great one. Uh, Paradise is another great episode for sort of the ideas of like you know the ideals of Western civilization. Um, the Measure of a Man, also another good next gen episode for that. Uh, if you want a Voyager episode, the episode uh, author author with the Doctor, that's a really good one. Um, Archer had a couple really good ones too. They all did. Um, there, if you want a good Kirk episode, the episode where I forget the name of it, but it was the episode where he makes the, he discovers the planet where the way they conduct wars is they have a computer calculate the casualties and people just walk into like in a, a machine and they just get vaporized. Uh, oh, you're right. Chain of command, Star Fury. That's another good one in next gen. Uh, Wait, wait, where, who said, what am I saying? Oh yeah, Fu Man Blue, Fu Man Blue, Four Lights. That's what you're talking about. That's Chain of Command. It's a two-part episode with Picard. Really good. One of my all-time favorite episodes ever. That was a brilliant uh, couple of episodes. Uh, but yes, Staff Yuri, DS9, uh, it's season two, episode 15, Paradise. Uh, one, of, one of the best ever Cisco episodes in my view. I, I mean, that episode should have got an Emmy if it didn't. And and it's definitely on the level of that of the episode. It is chain of command, right? Where Picard gets tortured by the Cardassian. I mean, it's up there. It's on par with that Cisco episode, Paradise, as well. I'm pretty sure that's the yeah. It is. It is because that's the episode where they put uh, Edward Jellico is put in charge of the Enterprise, and he's a total asshole. <laughs> and it's like, no, you're not the captain of the Enterprise, and he's doing, he's mean, he's being mean to the crew because he's got a different way of doing things. Oh my God, he's even got the, he's even got the line where he's taken over the Enterprise, and Picard is no longer in charge of the Enterprise. Now it's Captain Jellico, and and Jellico is giving all these orders that are making um, Riker uncomfortable, but Riker's fine with it. He's he's putting on a brave face because it's a new command style, a new captain. You got to live with it. Nothing you can do. And uh, and he's and as an afterthought, as an afterthought, Jellico walks out of his ready room and he says to Riker, oh, and by the way, Will, get those fish out of my ready room, please. And I'm like, Picard's fish. <laughs> you can't do that. <laughs> so, Dude, I'm telling you, Mass Effect did a great nod to this, I think, because in the Citadel DLC, when you're trying to steal back the Normandy from your evil clone, uh, you find a you find a bin that's got all of Shepard's cabin stuff stuffed in it, and there's and there's like all the uh, I think that well I guess your fish aren't in there, but like your space hamster is in there, and there's a note that Shepard can read that says, um, you know, please have this ha please have this rodent euthanized as a as a military vessel is not the appropriate place. <laughs> and then Shepard's like, oh no, you didn't. <laughs> it's awesome. It's freaking awesome. So yes. Oh, Star Fury! <laughs> Come on now. It says, yes, it has the best Starfleet captain in it. Jellico is the best Starfleet captain. Oh, come on.
Come on, Star Fury. You can't have such a cold, dead heart as that. You can't possibly. I think he's serious, folks. I think he's serious. Uh, you know, at, like in the words of Alec Baldwin in that movie, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, you think I am fracking with you? I am not fracking with you. Yeah, exactly. Fu Man Blue confirms it. It's chain of command. And we have swerved into Star Trek talk, and uh, and I'm happy. Uh, Ronnie Cox, I presume that's the actor who played Jellico, is such a great bureaucratic type villain. I loathe him in SG-1. Oh, no, you're talking about SG-1? Okay. Oh, oh, no. I think what you're saying is that actor was also in SG-1. And I agree with you. <laughs> Star Fury! <laughs> you think I am fucking with you? I am not fucking with you. Star Fury says I am fucking absolutely serious. <laughs> he thinks, he thinks Edward Jellico is the, you know, normally in a situation like this, I would say, Star Fury, man the guns, get your flamethrower. But the problem is, it's Star Fury that I'm addressing here. It is one of my own trusted officers, my own trusted officer that I am seeing confront me so. Uh, says, oh, I am absolutely, Jellico is the best. Jellico. Jellico is like, well, listen, listen. If I am to be somewhat charitable to Staff Yuri's uh, rather dubious position here, what I would say is that Jellico is he is an effective captain. Like, like I will say this: if if Kurtzman had, if modern Kurtzman Trek had written Jellico, he would have been a malevolent, patriarchal, uh, you know, just bully sob, and he would have been saying mean things to Tilly, and he would have been making fat Tilly cry no he, he probably would have said tilly you're fat you need to you need to jog around the ship and lose some weight because you need to make weight in starfleet and then tilly would have had a good cry about it and she would have gone to michael burnham and just cried and cried and cried and they would have talked about you know i would have thought that ideas like this went out of style uh in 2016 <laughs> during the election of Donald Trump, when the world realized how wrong it was. You know that? I swear to God, they're that on the nose in that show. And it's like, and that's what they would have done. Angelica would have just been a, he would have been dumb, is my point. He would have been a boob. He would have made stupid command decisions that got people killed. He himself would have probably gotten killed walking into some buzzsaw. But in the in the next generation episode written by competent writers who who don't eat glue, I can verify that. Um, Jellico actually was an effective commander. He just was he was kind of like a 20th century commander. And that's sort of my issue with him. He was like a 20th century commander. Um, but but stop here. Uh, he, he was not Picard. And that's why he's a he's a bad captain. He's a bad captain because he wasn't Picard, unfortunately. Unfortunately, you know, 10 years ago, you and I would have had a knockdown drag out over the uh, over this. However, however, I have seen I have seen Picard season one and I've seen Picard season two. And it, it is kind of halfway destroyed Jean-Luc Picard for me. I'm serious. I Picard is almost ruined as a character for me. Um, I, I, I have a hard time even watching next gen episodes now. I'm no lie. It was my very favorite Star Trek anything I loved that show. There was a time when I had the whole DVD collection, all I had, the, my shelf had the whole thing. Um, I almost can't even watch it now because Picard is so ruined for me because of that show, Star Trek Picard. Terry Metalis definitely helped with that third season, kind of save it a little, but um so so yes i i'm probably my defense of picard in this situation is more anemic than it would otherwise have been so, <laughs> stop, what, stop, this is star fury says i love a war pig <laughs> Uh, Fu Man Blue, get in here, Fu Man Blue. What do you think about this? Is Jellico the best Starfleet captain? I need backup from my master at arms here. <laughs> Star Fury says, also, he was right to take Riker out of the command chain. When did he do that? Damn, it's been a while since I saw that episode. What did he do with Riker? He benched Riker. I think I remember that. He benched Riker because Riker was bucking. He was bucking Jellico's Martinet style of leadership. Um... 
Benham. Benham is in the chat. Well, welcome, Benham. Good to see a new face in the chat. Says, uh, wait, you saw Picard season three, right? Yeah, I think uh, I did. And like I said, Picard, look, Terry Metalis, I never would have believed that was possible. I was hostile to season three. I was never going to watch it ever. But then I saw uh, Robert Meyer Burnett on the Critical Drinker stream, and he made a case. And he explained what was going on behind the scenes with Terry Metalis. And I still was very skeptical. I was like, mm, I don't know. I don't know. But Robert Meyer Burnett made a typically eloquent argument that convinced me. Because he he understood the reasons. He understood what was wrong with Picard and what was wrong with Discovery, et, et, et cetera, ad infinitum. And, uh, and he explained why he felt season three was good. And I said, okay. I will give it a shot. And uh, it turned out to be my second favorite. It was the second best TV show of 2023. The The first best was One Piece. One Piece live action. But yes, I did see season three. It helped a great deal. But I'm just telling you, you know, I'm with Red Letter Media on this. Um, <clears throat> you know, um, I, for, I forget the, I forget his name. He's the main guy. He's the one that does Mr. Plinkett. What's his name? I don't, I don't watch him enough, but... He said that he said that seeing that was this was during their reviews of Picard season two. He's like, it's like that movie Stand By Me, where it's all about these these boys that go on this adventure to see a dead body. But when they see the dead body, it changes them. And it's like they've lost they've lost something they can never get back. And he said that's how he felt about Picard. He's like, I've seen the body. You know, I can't unsee it. And it's like, that's how I feel about it. I was like, damn, he's he's saying exactly how I feel, which is I, I try to disregard it in my headcanon. That would be Picard season one and two. But I've seen it. I've seen the body, you know. So it is what it is. But I appreciate the sentiment. I do. Um. Oh, dude, Star Fury. This is awesome. You had them all in VHS. Uh, Star Fury. So. When I was, I think I was like maybe 12, 13 or so, they, the, the v, they, this was back when they were still selling the VHSs and there was a store that had all of the, all of the Star Trek, the next generation in VHS, every episode, one VHS tape. Okay. I would go to that aisle and I would just salivate. I would just be like, oh, wow. Oh my God, if I could have them all. And I started thinking about it because every VHS tape was like $20. Like every one of them was like $20 <clears throat> for one episode. And I calculated, I'm like $20 times all those episodes. It would cost me $2,000. It would cost me like two grand to get the whole. And I would have paid it if I had it. Believe me. I was like, I would pay, but I was a kid. I didn't have that kind of money. But I would dream and fantasize about having the two thousand dollars to buy every VHS episode. Um, and then when they came out on DVD, and every every season was like a hundred dollars for the full DVD season, like that was a steal. I, that was a steal. I was like, seriously, one hundred dollars, and I can have every episode in season one. Awesome. I hate season one, but I'll I'll take one. <laughs> I'll take it. Uh, I'll I'll just I'll just watch Skin of Evil the whole time. I'll just watch that on repeat. I don't need the rest of the episodes. That's worth it to me. Uh, man, what a different world I live in today. What a different world. That's serious respect there, Star Fury. That's I respect for any man that had the whole series on VHS. And uh, Fu Man Blue says, welcome, Benham, welcome. Remember, there is a Discord if you wish to join. The link is in the description. The water is warm, as they say. Uh, what else? Stop here. He says, welcome aboard, Benham. Be ready for broadsides. That's right. We are a ship of war on the Swords and Starships channel. And uh, as such, as we conduct ourselves as proper TARS, we do. Redoubt Production says, still surprised how good One Piece came out. I fear how the second season uh, to the, uh, as well as Arcane are going to go. I mean, I do too. Like season twos don't always have a good track record, but I, I mean, I really hope they continue this trend. But I think Sensei Oda has a significant amount of control. And so I think it will be good. I'll tell you, um, 
a lot of it, the performances of those young actors was brilliant in One Piece. They really are brilliant. Uh, and Yaki Godoy sold it for me. Like, he sold it. I don't know if One Piece works for me without him. I, seriously, because he just, he embodied the charisma of that character of Luffy so well that I believed it. I bought into it. So a lot of it is, I mean, obviously, great writing, great character work, uh, wonderful set design. It all worked. Um, but I don't, some of that really does come down to, you've got to have good actors, you know, you just have to. Wrangler says Riker behaved like an ass in that episode. I didn't like Jellico or what he was doing, but he wasn't in the wrong. I, I actually agree with you on this Wrangler because Riker and, and actually, frankly, this goes to Star Fury's point because Jellico was not a bad commander. He was not a bad commander. The fact that we as viewers liked Riker, because Riker's our friend, and Jellico is ew gross. Uh, but, <laughs> but except if you're Star Fury, uh, but but Riker was he was not acting as a good XO. He was not behaving like a good executive officer at that point. And by the way, Jellico should you know the first officer needs to be a good fit for the commanding officer, or it's not going to work. Hello, Crimson Tide. You got to watch Crimson Tide. Denzel and Gene Hackman, what a great movie that is. Excellent nautical movie is Crimson Tide. Dude, that is nautical porn. That is just nautical porn for me, uh, Crimson Tide. But, so to speak. Uh, but um, I think that Jellico had good reason to fire Riker. So he wasn't a bad commander. He just wasn't our commander, you know, unless you're Stafio, right? Now, Benham says, uh, we don't have to acknowledge the existence of season one and two. Just block them out like childhood trauma. Believe me, Benham, it's not for lack of trying. It's not for lack of trying. I actually kind of did think that way. I was like, I, I truly did not watch most of season two. I just watched the Red Letter Media reviews, which were, oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> I was like, it's so bad. It's so insanely bad. I can't even believe it. Um. And yeah, I kind of had that attitude. I'm like, I'm just going to block it out. Uh, just for me, I. But then I would go back and I would watch an episode of Next Generation. I'd watch like, I'd watch like the Drumhead, you know, and I would see the proud Picard saying, you know, when there are some words I have remembered as a boy, uh, I have remembered since I was a boy. When the first link is forged in the chain, when the first man's rights are curtailed, we have all lost something. You know, just this powerful, passionate speech. And I'm watching it, and all I can think of is, Rafi! Rafi! And I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> it's all ruined. It's all ruined. But, yeah, I understand. It's it's a... I, I, maybe there's a day. There's a day when I will get back to it. Um... All right, what else in the chat? Season three was good. Uh, yeah, it was it was good. In fact, I probably liked it more than even some of the real diehards like it. Uh, because some of the die like I'm a big fan of Star Trek First Contact. I love Star Trek First Contact. I even like Star Trek Generations, although I acknowledge the reasons why people uh, hate it. They they did Kirk pretty dirty in that, so that's definitely a reasonable. Critique, but the reason I like Star Trek Generations is, uh, for one thing, Malcolm McDowell as Tolian Soren is one of the. He's a great villain. He's a fantastic villain. Um, but also, it was the most. It it was like a full film production budget of an episode. It was like an episode of the Next Generation. It was good. So. Um, it just it just struggled in Act Three, and I think showing the 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 world of the Nexus was a mistake. That was a mistake. Granted. Um, other than that, though, I really liked it. Um, I, I like Star Trek Insurrection, and we all know that Nemesis, uh, definitely, ne Nemesis is a problem. As cheesy as it is, I still like, actually, Tom Hardy's performance as Praetor Shinzon. I thought that, you know, there, but it is so over the top, and it is, yeah, it's definitely... You think the darkness is your ally, but I was born in it. Darth Merlin says, I've seen it. I've seen it all. <laughs> oh, that, oh, that's right. You're talking You're talking about the Ricky Gervais sketch with uh, Patrick Stewart when he's talking about his fantasy <laughs> of like a, a woman's skirt getting blown up. And he's like, and, and she tries to cover herself, uh, but it's too late. 
I've seen it. I've seen everything. <laughs> it's so twisted. Uh, yeah, Star Fury, you collected those VHS tapes over seven years. You know, Gary over at Nerd Rotic would be, he would be impressed. He would be impressed, as am I. Jellico Stavieri goes on, portrays the real war dogs of Starfleet. They are hidden until the Federation is threatened. You know, that's a good point. Jellico is probably the type of captain that was like interning the changelings in that in that hideous Daystrom facility and torturing them and turning them into evil changelings for Star Picard season three. So so you have a good point there. You know who's a character though that I really loved? I loved Captain Shaw. Liam Shaw, the captain of the Titan in Picard season three, was a great character. And he was very similar to Jellico in that way, in that he's kind of he's kind of the guest captain. And he doesn't do things the way Kirk or Picard or our usual captains do things. He does things the by the book way. Uh, but what a great story arc he had. What a great and he but the thing too about Shaw that was great is he's funny. He was funny. He was very, like, I love it when he, when they're like, oh, those were the days. And he's like, oh, yeah, the days when you were saving the galaxy. Like when you hot dropped the saucer section of the, uh, of the Enterprise D on Viridian 3. Or how about the time that you threw the, the prime directive out the window so you could snog a villager on Baku? <laughs> he starts listing all the things they've done. And he's like, yeah, you guys have a real chicken or the egg thing going on when it comes to saving the galaxy. Dude, Shaw's a great character. Uh, what else? Fu Man Blue says, but I like the idea of the older guys that think more like Klingons or like Kirk or that were around the movie times. Yes, definitely. Uh, stuff here. He says, I played the Starfleet RPG and the amount of proper militaristic stuff that the Federation had under the system made me rethink Starfleet. They had Marines on most ships. Yeah, you know, there was a great uh, video game called Star Trek Voyager Elite Force. Do you remember this? Does anyone remember this? It was a first person shooter in the Star Trek Voyager timeline. And it was meant to actually fit within the canon of the Star Trek Voyager show. It was a great video game because basically uh, Seven of Nine and Janeway are fighting the Borg and Janeway decides that they've got to have a better class of like of tactical officer. And so they create this new group called the Elite Force on the Voyager. And they're basically like a special forces team. And you play as one of them and you have to like fight Borg and and a bunch of other enemies. It was a lot of fun and you get all kinds of different weapons. It was cool. <clears throat> and you can vaporize, like you can vaporize the bad guy. It was cool. And then they made a sequel to that called Elite Force 2, which took place on the Enterprise E under Picard. They had the original actors voicing them. Um, it was awesome. Like they had Kate Mulgrew, uh, <clears throat> Robert Beltran, all of them voicing the original characters. I think the only one they didn't have was Jerry Ryan. I don't think they had Jerry Ryan voicing Seven of Nine, which was a bummer. But they did get Marina Sirtis and Patrick Stewart to voice their characters in the second one, and they were great games. <clears throat> but what I'm getting at is I loved that point that like, yes, yes, you need an elite force. You need like some kind of actual like Marine that can fight seriously. They implied some of that in Deep Space Nine, though. Like in Deep Space Nine, uh, during the Dominion War, they, there's an episode called The Siege of AR something. I forget the name of it. Um, like AR-250. I can't say that on YouTube because they'll think I'm saying the other thing. But um, yeah, it was a great episode where they imply that there is like a standing army that the Federation can deploy. You just never see them because it's very rare. Starfury says, I'm so grateful for you, Swords and Starships, and others of your ilk, saving me from watching all this woke crap. I never watched Picard 1 or 2, so Season 3 is somewhat unsullied. Have you seen Season 3, Starfury? Because uh, it's worth watching. You, you, your gratitude is appreciated. You know, you know what? I'm tempted to give you the Batman line. It's like, I never thanked you for watching all these woke disasters for me. And you'll never have to. <laughs> That's my answer, Star Fury. You didn't thank me for watching all these, and you'll never have to. Where is the trigger? <laughs> uh, 
you know, Captain Garrett is not the hero that the internet deserves, but it's the hero the internet needs. <laughs> no, he's so heroic. Uh, honest to God, Star Fury. Uh, I'm more. I am far more grateful for you watching me <laughs> review these woke disasters. I'm grateful you're here. It makes my Sundays. It's my favorite day of the week. Sunday is my favorite day of the week now, and that's due to you, my dear sailors and starnuts. So it is. That is to say, it is my genuine pleasure, Star Fury. It is no. It is no trouble whatsoever. And I'm even going to watch Godzilla X Kong for you. <laughs> Unless you're interested. I mean, you know. <clears throat> Don't let me hold you back if you're interested. But uh, yeah, with Godzilla with pink spines and then baby Grogu. I, I mean, baby King Kong. Tell, Dude, I'm starting to feel like a child. Every uh, I said this. I said this the last time I went to the theater. I was like, you know what my problem with modern CGI is? It's like I'm watching a cartoon, but it's supposed to be a live action movie. And it's like, well, just make it a cartoon. If it's just a car, because I like animation. I like anime. I like animated things when that's what they are. What I don't like is this is supposed to be a live action movie, but I'm watching a cartoon. And I I cannot stand the scene where like a baby King Kong is like, Mwah. I'm like, oh my God, it's Grogu. It's Grogu all over again. <laughs> it's so bad. What are we becoming as a society, Starfield? What are we becoming? That's like the only thing that makes us happy now is is uh, colorful lightsabers and uh, and baby animals. Oh my God, Godzilla minus one, man. I like. I don't want. I don't want to see any other Godzilla unless Ta Takashi Yamazaki is directing. That's the only time I want to see it. Uh, that is, he is the man. He is the absolute man. Uh, what is, let me find the Rotten Tomatoes on this. Because I'm curious how it's doing. I really would have watched it this weekend, but I had other things going on. So I'm going to have to catch it next weekend. But I am curious. I am curious, Stavieri. What are they saying about Kong versus uh, Godzilla versus, is it Godzilla versus Kong? Godzilla versus Kong. Oh, no, that's okay. The, they're putting it on their front page. That's the old one. Okay, that's not the one I'm looking for. I'm looking for Godzilla X Kong. Godzilla X Kong. Where is it? Dude, what? Rotten Tomatoes is such shit anymore. Godzilla X. There it is. Thank you. You're going to make me search for it? It's in theaters, Rotten Tomatoes. Why is it not at the top? I don't understand that. Okay, here we go. All right, share screen. Hang on. Uh, stop, share, present new tab. I wish there was a way to just change tabs in StreamYards, but like it makes you stop the share and restart it. It's very cumbersome. I'm looking for new ways to stream, so stay tuned on that. But this is Rotten Tomatoes, so we've got a 55% critics score. Not that I put much stock in the credits, but we have a 93% audience score. Am, am I dead wrong? Am I off my rocker on that? Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe this is a great movie. Let's take a look, shall we? I am curious, though. What is Re Rebel Moon? 21% critic score, 58% audience. Dude, I was so excited when I thought I had someone in the chat who was going to tell me about Rebel Moon. Not because I was going to be mean or me meme on them or anything like that. Because I genuinely like, okay, convince me. Convince me I'm wrong about Rebel Moon. But uh, look, folks, I'm going to tell you, uh, yes, we have fun about the shills. And yes, we have a... I would never, I would never shame anyone for loving something. If you love a movie, I'm never going to shame. That does not mean I'm going to not point out what's wrong with it. Like I have people, I know people who enjoyed Mandalorian season three, and I'm fine. That's fine. I'm like, enjoy it. That doesn't change the fact that the pterodactyl, <laughs> you know, regurgitating the kid was weird. That was weird. Or, or the uh, the boring blacksmith fighting. Oh my god, I forgot about that. The blacksmith flies into battle with flying stormtroopers. They fly now. Flies into battle with the flying stormtroopers. And she's using her blacksmith hammer <laughs> to fight the stormtroopers. And I'm like, uh, hello, Dave Filoni. I think you took the idea of like character flavor a bit literally here. 
Okay. <laughs> you, you you took my you took Raz Agul's advice about theatricality a bit literally. Okay, so here we have uh, some reviews. Uh, let's take a look. Dumbed down and stripped of the symbolic subtext of the earlier movies, I agree with that. The picture is not without seat-shuddering uh, thrills, but it, it's like a tag-team wrestling bout for monsters rather than a picture with meaning and even a modicum of thought. On the one hand, I think this reviewer is probably right, but also that is a very snooty critic's review, of course. If there are to be any more MonsterVerse movies, something I don't favor, turn them over to Takashi Yamazaki. He knows how to do it right. That would be James Bertinelli, and I agree 100,000 ridiculous percent. Dude, based. Based. He's saying, I don't want any MonsterVerse movies, but if you're going to make them, turn them over to a professional. That would be Takashi Yamazaki, writer, director, and VFX director of Godzilla Minus One. Made, made the best film I've seen maybe in a decade. Maybe in a decade, folks. Best film I've seen in maybe a decade. He did it with less than $15 million and like uh, 30 people in a room doing the VFX. Um, told a masterful, masterful story. I mean, it is, it is a dude. Re, if you're interested, read Save the Cat, right? Read Save the Cat, and you will see that, like, when movies are good, it's because they are following those, they are following that Swiss watch of perfection, right? And uh, I mean, is it absolutely perfect? No, there's a couple little things in Godzilla minus one plot wise that I have issues with. But I'm telling you, on the on balance, it's a Swiss watch, man. It's just ticking along. That movie, every level of it works so beautifully. Oh, man. I, I wish I could watch it right now. Folks, I cannot wait until I can buy the DVD of Godzilla Minus One. I would have seen it like seven times in the theaters. I literally could not. It was not in the theaters long enough for me to see it enough times. I barely got to see it three times. And that's only because they brought it back for the Minus Color. I'm, I'm dying to see it again. I need it in my life. It's just, I do. I love that movie so much. Where did it come from? Where did it come from? I was not looking for that. And bam, it appeared. It restored, dude, Godzilla minus one. It restored my faith in humanity. It truly did. It's a beautiful film. Okay. Back to the reviews of Godzilla X Kong. Godzilla X Kong is as big and loud as expected. But when the dust is settled, there's nothing to hold on to. The kaiju clash is a crushing bore. Oh my god, I don't want to watch it. <laughs> I so don't want to watch this movie. <laughs> Stop, Yuri. Your gratitude strengthens me, sir. It strengthens me. <laughs> I'm going to endure. How long is this movie? I got to find out. Okay, how long is Godzilla... X Kong, the new empire, and the ballad of song songbirds and snakes. These titles are ridiculous. They're ridiculous, folks. An hour and 55 minutes. Well, that could be worse. I mean, at least it's not two hours and 45 minutes or some odd. Still, still, that's a full, that's a full ticket. That's an hour and 55 minutes. I'm definitely going to plan to miss the previews because I don't need to add to that. I'm definitely going to deliberately miss the previews. Um, quote, being in hollow... Oh, jeez. This, this is the one thing alone that makes me not want to watch this movie. Being in hollow earth... <laughs> hollow earth. Hollow earth. Oh my god. <laughs> Just it's so unbelievable. I'd like I compare compare the heartbreaking gut-wrenching story of a failed kamikaze pilot coming home to the ruins of Tokyo after the fire bombings his parents are dead. He's lost everything. He winds up with a woman who's adopted an, a, an orphaned baby and he's just he, she's squatting in his apartment. He has to take on a dangerous job as a minesweeper just to make ends meet. And what should happen but Godzilla attacks and nukes half of Tokyo? No hope. 
no way to defeat this monster. His one chance at a family and it's about to be destroyed. And what do I have on the other side of the bargain? I have Hollow Earth. Fucking Jesus. Is it so much to ask? Is it so much to ask to have some reality, some some something to something real in a movie to grab onto? I'm not saying it can't be a fantasy, Elvin. I'm not saying you can't have science fiction. I'm saying something that's real. A real human experience. Uh, being in Hollow Earth takes some of the fun out of things. That also <clears throat> leaves Godzilla X Kong residing in a purely CGI arena without even tenuous uh, connections to reality. It's an empty chamber for movie spectacle and nothing else. God, that's going to be awful. <clears throat> The underwhelming effects give you new appreciation for what Godzilla Minus One did at a fraction of the cost. Yeah, I'm catching a theme here. The live action and motion capture performances are mostly marvelous, despite the bum dialogue and Wingard's tendency to rush through sequences and whole relationships that might have been extraordinary had they been presented with patience and elegance. Yeah, that, that is definitely the hallmark of the Monarch universe right here. The Hallmark universe always has this problem of... They stuff them full of human characters, but then they don't give the... It's it's actually a lot like Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. It is stuffed with characters, but those characters all have... They all have ridiculous plot. Oh my god, it's uh, Millie Bobby Brown is running from a government spy organization. It's... Oh, jeez. <laughs> you know, it's so... It's like... It's so ridiculous. Just, you've got to give these characters time to breathe. We got They got to worm their way in the way that Shkishkima did. The way that Akiko did. You know, the way that, uh, what was it? Noriko. Oda. You've got to let the characters worm their way in for us to be invested. For us to want the, the, the monster to be stopped or to win, as the case may be. Do I need to pull this out again? I really need to. I need to find the Godzilla thing again. I'll, I'll pull it up in a second. Okay, here's someone who liked it. Godzilla x Kong, the new empire and the uh, Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, for better or worse, is a kid's movie. This is a throwback. No, I disagree, sir. It is not a kid's movie. Look, when I was a kid, do you want to know the kind of movies I liked as a kid? Back me up on this, chat. Do you know what I liked when I was a kid? Star Trek The Next Generation. That's what I liked when I was a kid. Do you know what I liked? I liked reading deep scientific explanations for how Spider-Man got his powers. I liked that Spider-Man had to make decisions about not killing. Spider-Man Spider wanted to kill the man that killed Uncle Ben, but, but he, he knew it would be bad. He had to live with, with serious moral consequences for not stopping the scumbag that robbed the guy at the wrestling arena, and, and that was why... Uh, Uncle Ben was killed. Like, that was a big deal. He got his uncle killed. Like, that's heavy. That's what I was interested in as a kid. The Ghostbusters movie. I loved the Ghostbusters movie. You know what's funny about this? It's like, when I was a kid, I the things that bothered me were actually, usually, it was the type of thing where, like, the kids were running things. That Seriously. Like, I, like there were movies, like, like, when I was a kid, something like Spy Kids, I hated shit like that. I hated shit like that. I wanted to see the adults in charge when I was a kid. Why? Because I wanted to grow up to be like uh, Ray Stance. I wanted to grow up to be like He-Man, to be like Peter Parker. I looked up to them. I wanted to grow up and be like Captain Picard. You know, it's like those were those were the things that I looked up to. I liked competent people fighting competent villains like i liked my villains to be scary when i was a kid i wanted villains that were dude dude take one kid's book from 300 years ago um 200 years ago i should say uh treasure island by robert louis stevenson i read that as a kid in high in uh middle school i read that i loved it do you understand that like in treasure island uh the pirate long john silver he is murderous he is psychopathic. He is, he is, uh, he is, he's an enemy. He's dangerous. <laughs> like, he's a bad dude. Corn Pop was a bad dude. <laughs> like, like, uh, Long John Silver. He was a bad dude. I'm not joking. I'm not joking, folks. 
from Scranton. <laughs> no, so, um, so so why why this meme? Why this straw man argument that like uh ch- like kids don't want kids want to watch they want to watch mindless CGI gobbledygook with no moral stakes? Really, that's what kids want. I disagree, sir. I disagree. Wingard, upscaling pure Saturday morning cartoon energy to accommodate his big screen vision for chaos and destruction, delivers all that as well as fully earned, if fleeting, beats of wonder and emotion. Lame. The plot is a little convoluted, and some of the lines are a bit clunky, but I enjoyed it for what it was. Just a classic monster movie. Well, I do defend Avatar on those grounds, so fair enough, but still. A soulless, empty endeavor. Yeah, so there you go. What What is the audience saying about this? Let me see the audience ratings. Uh, the movie was great. Love that. Oh, yeah. These, these seem like bot reviews here. Hands down, best movie of the year so far. Which movie? This one? Great family action. Mind-blowing fun. We never wanted it to end. Dude, these are these are bot farms. These are bots. <laughs> fun monster movie, quickly paced. Good movie. I would recommend it. Two hours long, but didn't feel like it at all. Uh, this one's not a bot, probably. Uh, if you're a if you're a fan of both Godzilla and Kong, you'll love this movie. It has a lot of fillers that answers questions I didn't even know I had. Very exciting and made the Titans more than just destructive. Okay, that's a legit review. I'm willing to grant that. Uh, this movie has spun too far from any King Kong and Godzilla storyline. Did you like Hollow Earth? This was a great movie to watch with your kids and very entertaining. You know. I, I apologize for my generation of parents. We are we are really letting the younger generation down. Kids deserve the kind of movies I had when I in the 90s and the 80s. They deserve that class of heroes and villains. Dude, He-Man was cheesy. I will grant you that. But he was a great hero. He was a great hero. He had morals. He taught you a lesson at the end. He had to fight bad guys doing bad things. I mean, granted, that was one of the tamer ones. But like... Uh, Dude, there were movies and cartoons when I was a kid. That's what I wanted to see. I wanted to see real adult heroes. And I don't, I would not have enjoyed, I would not have enjoyed the characters in in, uh, Ghostbusters Afterlife. I wouldn't. Phoebe would have annoyed me as a kid. She would have annoyed me. I would have been more interested in like Winston's character, quite frankly. I would have wanted to know what he was doing running, you know, these experiments on ghosts. I would have been curious about him. I wouldn't have been curious about her. Uh, resuming with the reviews, Arthur says, lots of good, lots of action, good all around movie, said the bot. Me and my family loved it. Great movie. Effects were awesome. A little cheesy here and there, but all in all, it was awesome. D- dude, you just copy pasted that from your last 10 reviews, didn't you? Loved everything about it. Great action, great story. Loved the new look to God's. Oh, jeez. Oh, jeez. You like the pink spines, do you? Fine. This is a big, dumb, fun movie. I wish it had a better plot and story, but this movie is only interested in its own visuals, like a string of great action scenes with a thin plot that connects them. Oh, you mean like every freaking movie we get now? Really? The movie is fast paced, so you don't ha- you don't think about the plot holes until the credits. Re- is, th- is this part of your recommendation? You're giving it four stars for that? What was he giving? He's yeah, he's giving it four stars. Nowhere near as compelling as Godzilla minus one. Thank you, thank you for your honesty, sir. Thank you for your honesty. You're you're kind of underselling it a bit. That that's putting it. That's that's uh, that's a bit of an understatement. But I appreciate that. But a fun time, regardless. Godzilla fighting Titans was especially cool to watch. I mean, it is the film equivalent of an amusement ride. I will grant you that. I will grant you that. And I do not, and so is Avatar. I like the Avatar movies. They are not, they are not really great stories, but they are, they are fun amusement rides that I enjoy. So I would never begrudge anyone their amusement ride. I would not do that. This is not an amusement ride that I'm going to get in line for. It just isn't. I'm just not into that. 
But dude, this looks like a lot of bots though. Uh, I liked the continuous action. Well, <laughs> that's a J.J. Abrams fan if I ever heard of one. <laughs> All right, that's Godzilla X Kong. Fun times, folks. Fun times. Uh, let's see, what else we got? Fu Man Blues has cracked me up. Uh, Makos versus Stormtroopers fight. Oh, that would be the Makos Military Assault Command. I forget what the O stands for. In uh, Star Trek Enterprise, which I love Star Trek Enterprise. I really do. Yes, the first season was a bit rough. A uh, lot of good episodes, but a bit rough. Uh, but man, did that show hit its stride. Right about the second half of season two, it starts to really get good. And then season three, season four, excellent. I mean, really good. And uh, I really came to love Scott Bakula's very kind of odd performance of a star. I, I always considered his performance of a Starfleet captain odd. And at first I didn't like it. I didn't like his odd uh, cadence to his speech. Uh, but then after a while, I came to appreciate Scott Bakula's unique way of delivering lines as a Starfleet captain does. I understand that you don't know my species, but we are out here on a mission of peace. And I'm simply asking if you can help us. <laughs> he has such a weird way of talking in that show, but but it became a feature instead of a bug as the series went on, you know? Because once in a while, Archer would lose his shit when he just had... Because the, the thing I liked about it was Archer was meant to be a less enlightened captain than Kirk or Picard's generation. Like, you know, Kirk, Picard, Sisko, Janeway, they're all in the in the super enlightened utopian future. Uh, uh, Bakula's... Archer was meant to be kind of in the middle. He was more enlightened than us, but he still was a little bit more rough and rugged than a Kirk, right? So I liked it that, you know, occasionally Archer would be like, um, you know, he'd be like, stop wasting my time, you son of a bitch. <laughs> he would just, he would lose it. And he'd, he'd get all angry. Uh, I, I love the episode in season three when, you know, Earth is on the line. There's a super weapon that's going to destroy Earth, and there's this pirate that won't answer him. And normally he would not he would not cross the line, but he has no choice, and he just kind of loses his shit. And so he puts the guy in an airlock, and he starts to drain the air in the airlock. And the guy's like, "You, you wouldn't know." And he's like, "He's like, hmm, are you, is your memory starting to come back to you? Hmm." And he's like, ah, ah, ah. and he's knocking on the door. He's like, "Say again." <laughs> and they're like, Captain, Captain, what are you doing? It's like, and he, he's like, as you were. <laughs> oh, dude, it's a great scene. It's like, so Archer had that ability to lose his shit, and I like that. But most of the time, he would be reasonable and a fair minded captain. Uh, Benham says, I love the depiction of the tactical teams that were basically Marines in Enterprise. Yeah, the Makos. Yes, definitely. We're talking Makos. Makos versus Storm. Dude. Can stormtroopers seriously defeat anything? Although I will say the one thing about Andor, Andor, that was excellent, excellent, was the stormtroopers. Like when they portray the Imperial troops and especially the ISB, the Imperial Security Bureau, uh, excellent. Like that was that was really the that and Stellan Skarsgård. Those were the reasons to watch Andor. And literally, you can just fast forward a lot of the other stuff. But, like, the scenes where they're fighting with blasters were scary. Like, scary. Because, like, the, the stormtroopers had, like, sniper rifles, and you'd see a beam just go through someone's, you know, head, and they're dead. It's like It was like a war movie. It was like, dude, that's what it would be like, and that was super cool. So, yeah, Andor did have its positives. I will admit that. I still don't really like I'm not as wild about it as Mahler. I think Mahler likes it. He likes it more than I do because I just felt there was so much filler in that show that, that that's what bothered me. If it had been like tighter, I think it would have been perfect. But dude, Stellan Skarsgård's speech in that movie is an all timer or show. I mean, uh, it is an all timer when he 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 is literally forcing. He is forcing this man to risk his life as a deep cover operative. He promised he would let him out and he's going back on that promise and he is screwing him. He is screwing him. He's like, uh, you're going back and if they kill you, too bad because if you try and get out, I'll kill you. And the guy's like, how can you do this to me? He's like, do you have any idea what I've sacrificed? What have you sacrificed? And then Stella and Scars are like, what have I sacrificed? What have I sacrificed? Everything. I 
am working for a cause for a future I will never see. And he just goes on this long explanation. He's like, I have nothing left of my soul. No life to look forward to. I betrayed everyone I've ever loved. What have I sacrificed? Everything. <laughs> it's so good. It's so good. It's the re I'm, I'm paraphrasing. I don't remember the exact line. You just got to watch it. I was like, dude, <laughs> dude, if I, I, I don't understand why the shills don't demand that from Ahsoka. Why don't the shills want that? You know what I mean? I don't understand why they don't want that. Don't you want that experience in like with Balon or Admiral Thrawn? Like, listen, if Admiral Thrawn had a speech like Stellan Skarsgård had in Andor, it would have been a different story, folks. I would have been a different story. I would have been into that. I would have been super into that. Stellan Skarsgård's character is a better villain than Admiral Thrawn is. You got that. that that's kind of worth seeing it for. Uh, Andor? Andor is boring as hell. Like Andor himself is boring as hell to me. So anyhow, uh, but I did not mean to swerve into Andor talk. Mm. What else do we have? Oh, dude, I am way behind in the chat. I am sorry, my dear chat. I have uh, I have neglected you. Uh, Stafiori says, I still think the hero should have died at the end of Godzilla Minus One. I have seen it five times now, and that opinion hasn't changed. Don't stop, Yuri. Tell the truth, stop, Yuri. I have it on record. You told me on my live stream that I convinced you. I changed your mind. So maybe you changed it back, but I changed it for a little while. I changed it for a little while. I, I stand by the fact. L listen, Star Fury, there's plenty of movies where the hero dies at the end. There's plenty of them. There are a dime a dozen. Why not? Why not just for once in a while enjoy a movie where the good guy lives? But here's the deal, Star Fury. You do kind of get your wish because you know how they have that lovely ending where Shkishkima is embracing uh, Noriko and he's and his war is over and the family's back together? They show that there's a little bit of some weird thing under her skin. There's this black mark under her skin crawling up her neck implying that she's infected she's infected with something and then the very next thing they show is the remains of godzilla regenerating so like they gave you they gave you two nasty scary little things at the end to to promise you that trust me the ending's not as happy as it seems why is it that enough for you star fury <laughs> why can't that satisfy you no shishkiva has to die he has to die at the end you know what's funny, though? I mean, structurally, I kind of would have agreed with you. I mean, I really was expecting him to die. That's why it was a surprise that he lived, because I was kind of reading it that way. But but actually, when he survives, I thought, well, that's nice. But when I left the theater, I was like, damn, that was perfect. Like, that was perfect, because the whole theme of the film was about the value of life and uh, and the value of humanity and Shishkima Sh surviving I won't I won't bore you with a re repetition of my case but I just the fact that Shkishkima survives was fulfilling the promise of the premise to me the promise of the premise of the film was that it was about the value of life and his survival was a testament to that and he he earned it he earned the right to survive because he faced Tachibana and here I am swerving right back into it uh but he he's he faced Tachibana and he owned his cowardice he owned his cowardice. And it was Tachibana, the guy who called him a coward and blamed him for the deaths of all of his men um, and, and put their blood on, on uh, Shkishkima's hands. It was Tachibana who says, live. Live. That's brilliant. Stop, Yuri, that's brilliant. <laughs> How can you not see that? I'm just messing with you, Stop, Yuri. But I'm just telling you, it's brilliant. It's perfect. Don't mess with it. Uh, yes. Uh, what else we have? What else we have? Uh, Fu Man Blue says, I thought the $6 million man was cooler than Han Solo when I was a kid. Dude, MacGyver! MacGyver! I was like seven years old. I loved MacGyver. MacGyver. He's an adult man who is solving problems with duct tape and a Swiss Army knife. I loved that. And he's explaining science to me. Dude, that was my favorite part. Richard Dean Anderson's voiceover explaining the science was my favorite part. I'm seven years old, okay? Seven years old, that's my favorite part. Screw Spy Kids. I mean, I know Spy Kids wasn't out back then, but I just, something like that. Screw something like that. I wanted to see MacGyver. So, by the way, superheroes in the 80s, like superheroes in the 80s were adults. 
They were not high schoolers. They were not high schoolers uh, that were whining about their dating life. They were adults. Like when they did the Flash TV series, um, Barry Allen was a man. <laughs> he was like, he was a man with an adult man's job. He was a forensic investigator, like in CSI. Like that's what he was. I am a kid. I'm like seven or eight years old. I loved it. I loved it. Dude, I would have hated, I would have hated Ezra Miller's portrayal of Barry Allen when I was a kid. I would have hated that. So no, kids deserve a higher, the kids these days deserve a higher class of storytelling and I'm going to give it to them. Uh, what else we got? <laughs> Star Fury says he also likes fried spam and Trisket. Seriously, old school. I, I may occasionally catch chats that are out of context. And for that, I apologize. Mm -mm. Skimming through. Wrangler, yes, 80s and 90s were the best, or perhaps I'm just biased because that's what I had the privilege to watch. I mean, there were stupid things in the 80s and 90s. Believe me, the 80s was, was as full of good things as the 80s were. There were like two times as many things that were bizarre, wacky, what the hell is that? Like, I mean, I still to this day don't understand the never-ending story. What the hell was that? What a nightmare fever dream is the never-ending story. And they're remaking it. They're remaking it. Of course they are. Because of course they are. <laughs> they're going to remake everything. Wait, dude, Full Man Blue, they're going to remake the $6 million man. Wait till they do that. Gen X, dude, Gen X. Gen X was like, other than the greatest generation uh, and the Revolutionary War generation and maybe the Civil War generation. Gen X, man. Gen X for the win. Uh, what it, What was that? Fu Man Blue says, Mahler has an unnatural attraction to Andor. Well, he is a, he is a Cthulhu type, uh, interdimensional god. So his motives are mysterious. They are not to be intuited by us mere mortals. Mahler is a fucking Andor shell. <laughs> you know what? I don't mind crapping on Mahler for his love of Andor because, uh, because he doesn't mind crapping on things I love. So so there. There. Take that, Mahler. <laughs> oh, I love the long man. Salute to the long man. M the long man is the greatest... Um, What's the word I'm looking for? He is the greatest analyst of storytelling structure, or as Gary Nerdrotic would say, analyst, of, uh, of story structure on the internet. But the critical drinker is the best. He is the best film review creator on the internet. I mean, hands down. In fact, uh, some, I think Jeremy was saying, no, it was Gary who was saying that like his ability to distill a whole movie into seven minutes. I mean, it's he has gotten it to a fine art. I mean, if I sound like I'm envious, it's because I'm envious. That is such talent. That is such talent that he's developed on that channel. But any case, okay, enough shilling for the critical drinker. Uh, let's see. Uh... Starfury said he's always had suspicions about hell gods from Wales. Yes, the Welsh. They're, they're almost as weird as the Dutch. Starfury said, <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's an Austin Powers joke. All you need is the one scene where the brethren from Oda Island are calling him home to the afterlife and his death would have been perfect. Starfury. Starfury's not giving it up, folks. He's, dude, it's, I'm going to find the clip where you, you said you agreed with me, Starfury. I'm holding you to that. There's a legal record. There's a legal record stuff, Yari. Fu Man Blue says, MacGyver was the bomb. Yep, the science was the best part. Made it interesting. Same thing numbers uh, numbers the show did for me. Oh, dude. Greatest American Hero says Wrangler. Star Fury says, <laughs> fuck you people. I was too old to watch that show. Stop making me feel antiquated, you assholes. What show, Star Fury? Don't be upset. Star Fury. Yeah. What? What? Full Man Blue, what did you do? You've upset, you've upset Starfury. And I take great umbrage, sir. I shall, I shall have satisfaction. Uh, what else? Yes, uh, the drinker is succinct. He is, like, brevity is the soul of wit, as Shakespeare once said. As Shakespeare once said. Man, we're having a great time. We're four hours in, folks. Four hours in. And we ain't done yet. Oh, dude. Okay. Let me just share something I thought was amazing, though. I got to share this with you. <laughs> 
we'll probably be winding it down here. We're entering our last segment of the show, um, but I definitely want to show you this. So the hat tip geeks and gamers, uh, this was on Geeks and Gamers Daily. Uh, apropos of nothing, but I saw this and I was cracking up <laughs> and I thought I got to share this with the with the stream. <laughs> uh, Dan Vaz donates a dollar, which Who cares? is around 20 cents, <laughs> which is then, you know, I, I, then it's about 14 cents after YouTube takes their 30 percent cut. And if Dan Vask purchased this on, say, like an iPhone or something like that, then there's another app store charge. So that's about 10 cents right there. So thank you, Dan. <laughs> Appreciate that, buddy. Thanks. Yay. <laughs> Top dog for one nine. And then we had to waste time acknowledging it and it. Like, he gets way too much out of these. It's bullshit. I use it to shame him, so I feel like God, it kind of works that way, I guess. Uh, dude. I, hate, I, I hate Dan Vask. Yeah, me too. Uh, Tomok or not? Not. Oh my God, that just was so funny. <laughs> I was dude the way Ryan breaks it down. I was just dying. He's like, "Well, it's ninety nine cents in Brazilian money, which is really like you know thirty cents American." But then YouTube takes its cut, um, and then if he bought it on an iPhone, that that's like ten cents. <laughs> so so we're losing money basically. <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> I love I love how he trolls him with that because he knows <laughs> he donates a dollar. <laughs> oh, it just cracks me up. <laughs> a star fury. Uh, you know, he should donate a proper pound sterling like our star fury. Uh, Brazilians always running from rabid street kids. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, those damn kids. They'll be the death of Dan. Oh my God, that I was. So... <laughs> I love how I love how like irritated they look. <laughs> Jeremy's like, oh wow, a dollar. Thanks, Dan. Oh, <laughs> uh, dude. One more time. I do one more time. So my top dog. I hate I, he get, Thank yeah. you, Dan. Something like that. If Dan Vass, I, 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 that sense, oh, yeah. which is then, you know, I, I, then it's about 14 cents after YouTube takes their 30% cut. And if Dan Vask purchased this on, say, like an iPhone or something like that, then there's another app store charge so that's about 10 cents right there thank, thank you, dan. you dan appreciate that buddy thanks <laughs> yay <laughs> top dog for <laughs> thank you thanks dan yay <laughs> jeremy's such a dick <laughs> oh that is so funny <laughs> It's the, I just love the math. It's so funny. Uh, he's like, oh, so that's about, oh, that's about 10 cents when you work out all the fees. I think the part that really killed me though, because I was already laughing, but then when Ryan says, and then if he bought it on an iPhone, <laughs> the app store, and then I just lost it. <laughs> if he bought it on an iPhone. You know he did. You know he did. If he, if he didn't, he will next time. <laughs> you know it'd be funny? Oh my god, you know it'd be hilarious? If he changed his name to Dan Vask's iPhone. <laughs> the, the next time he donates, he should have it say Dan Vask's iPhone 99 cents. <laughs> and then Ryan, he'll just send Ryan into orbit. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god that'd be so good i wish i want to do that you know what i'll do i'll just log it well but then it would be 99 cents i, I could put dan vass iphone and just send it myself yeah you know what maybe i will but the thing is because i'm not sending it from brazil it won't have the red banner so it won't have the same impact <laughs> you know uh, uh let's see what uh what did i miss 
Fu Man Blue, appreciation has its limits too. <laughs> no, no, that's only for Dan Vask. Anyone here who donates a dollar, there there will be no such math mathematics. Uh, Stav here, he says, guess why I love coming here every Sunday? Just call me the ball buster. I know, Stav Fury, and we would we expect nothing less. A good master gunner, his purpose on the ship is to keep us all in fighting, fit fighting form. And that is what Star Fury does aboard this vessel. Fu Man Blue says, no doubt the extra four cents is getting taken off. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, that's not a bad idea, Fu Man. Get a VPN on your phone and log in from Brazil. But the purchase would still be from my account, which would be in American. So I don't know if that would work. That's not a bad idea, though. I, don't know. I would love to. Really? You think so, Wrangler? If I can, if the captain can figure it out, I'll do it. Dan Vass's iPhone. <laughs> I'll copy the picture of Dan Vask. I'll send it. It's 99 cents. <laughs> Just because I want to see Ryan react to it. I really do. Uh, Ryan Cannell, the angriest man on the internet. That would be Ryan. <laughs> So I wanted to clip, like, so on Friday Night Tights, they played a clip of him on Sports Wars where he lost his shit, and he just, because the the other uh, guys in the panel kept changing the subject that he wanted to talk about, and he kept kind of bringing him back to the subject, and and finally he just like, so what the fuck are you talking about? And he just exploded, and it was like on a dime. It was like on a dime, just lost his shit, and it was so funny. I was like, dude, I want that as a meme, but the problem is the Friday Night Tights guys were laughing over it, and I could not find it. Like, I looked for that live stream. I even became a channel member just to see if I could get it. And I was like, I want to clip that so bad. But I can't find it. It's not on Sports Wars. I don't know where that was. So uh, it sucks. But that would be great. I would love to have the angriest man on the internet with just a quick clip of a big, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> if I could just hit that once in a while. Oh, that'd be awesome. Uh, but you know what's almost as good as that, chat? What's almost as good as that is, uh... Oh, hey, fuck you. Oh, hey. <laughs> no, that wasn't the one I was going to show. I mean, I was, but then I, I... It's too hard to choose. I have a few good ones in here. Where is it? Dude, I have mislabeled these things. Where? As... Where is oh there it is. Guess what? Fucking pronouns. Fuck off. That's the one. I did add a new one. I haven't come up with a reason to use it yet. But uh Jim Dangle from Reno 911. Wait, what? I'm just goofing. New boot goofing. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Dude, I got to use that for the shills. Remind me chat. Remind me chat when the shills are really excited about something. I got to Wait, what? I'm just goofing. New boot goofing. Oh. Dude, Jim Tangle is such a funny character. Dude, Reno 901 was a hilarious show. <clears throat> Trudy. <laughs> Trudy is so funny. You can't even say on YouTube the things Trudy would say on that show. Oh, my God. That show was hilarious. I loved the movies, too. Reno. I miss Reno 911. <clears throat> Star Fury says, Ryan Cannell, the angriest racist seven THR manager ever. Uh, you know what's funny about Ryan is like, uh, that meme will never die that he's a racist, which of course the joke, he's not. But what's so funny, about, but he is kind of an asshole. <laughs> he is kind, he's a very angry, bitter guy. <laughs> so, but you know what's funny though? I met him at the meetup last year and, uh, you know, Actually, he's very much, he's exactly, he's exactly what you expect. But he's, he's easy to talk to. He's fun to talk to. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's Brian Cannell for you. That's him. Dude, Chris Gore is the funnest guy in the world to talk to. I'm telling you. I, that, he was the, he was the funnest guy. That, they're all fun. They all, they're all fun. I met Lila. I met, uh. Chrissy, I just, I met everybody. They were all su super cool, super warm, very awesome people, all of them. Um, Gary is, he's awesome. He's just a really cool guy. 
And uh, but Chris Gore, like, dude, it was like it was like we'd been friends for years. Everyone that walked up to him, it was like they were already his friend. They'd walk up and start. Oh, yeah. Hey, Chris, did you see that movie? What'd you think about? Oh, yeah, yeah. And he'd, he'd start doing his Chris thing. He's talking about, oh, yeah, it's such a good movie. Yeah, it's like I don't like there it is. <laughs> That's my Chris Gore impression. It's really frustrating. <laughs> uh, dude, I would one day. One day there are going to be swords and starships meetups. Mock my words, chat. One day and we're going to pack the house. Star Fury says, A for asshole, keeping it simple. That's how Star Fury learned to spell. <laughs> Dude, how do they do it in Britain? They're like, uh, yes, and as you'll see here, uh, you will now insert a U right here. Yes, right there. There you go. Bra brilliant. Bravo. Bravo. <clears throat> I, that must be how you learn letters in England. I just, I can only imagine. Um, let's see, where else? What, where else do we want to go? Oh, dude, dude. Star Trek. Star Trek is announcing more stuff. This is so... Should we, since we were on the subject of Star Trek, after all. Allow me to share my screen. Uh, Fu Man Blue says, what makes Ryan different than your average asshole is his quick wit. Sets him apart from the rest on most panels. You know, he's a he's a very smart guy. He's a great commentator. <clears throat> he's a great commentator. He is. So, uh, there we go. This from Variety. Star Trek origin story movie set from and or director. Star Trek IV still in the works as final chapter of the main series. And uh, what what caught my attention about this is they are, folks, folks, <laughs> this is unbelievable to me. Star Trek Enterprise was a prequel at a time when there had never been a Star Trek prequel. That era of Starfleet had never been explored. Furthermore, the movie Star Trek First Contact had created a basis for that story because before Star Trek First Contact, they actually had never shown really any depiction of how the Federation actually came to exist. So Star Trek First Contact really did, did establish a framing point for a prequel for Star Trek. Um, and so then you had Enterprise. And Enterprise, you know, um, it, 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 was, it was a quaint, charming little series that finally hit its stride was it the best Star Trek series ever? No, but I came to quite love it, and it has a special place in my heart. And as a, as a Star Trek fan, I have to admit that while it's not perfect, it's done its best. And that's all we can really hope. Then we get Alex Kurtzman, the dumbest man in entertainment. Have I said it lately? Screw Alex Kurtzman. Uh, he decides to create Star Trek Discovery. Sorry, Star Trek Discovery takes place 10 years. Now, now listen, we've already gotten a J.J. Abrams movie that goes back in time and rewrites Kirk's history. Okay, great. Thanks for that. Now, we're going to tell a story 10 years in the prime timeline, not in the Kelvin timeline, in the prime timeline before Star Trek, the original series. Who needed or was asking for, by the way, this is exactly how I felt before Discovery came out. I've said before I was blue-pilled, but even then I did not like this concept. I was like, whoever asked for a 10 years before Kirk? I didn't, I don't wanna see that. So we get 10 years before Kirk, then that becomes a futuristic story about 900 years in the future after the freaking temporal wars referenced in Enterprise for God's sake. Uh, now, they're saying we're going to tell the origin story of Star Trek. So so you're saying that Star Trek First Contact, Star Trek Enterprise, the Star Trek reboot, and Star Trek Discovery, you are saying that those weren't origin stories? <laughs> like, what? This is ridiculous. These, these are stupid people. And th th I really hope they don't make these films. I'm so tired of this crap. Star Trek Beyond was such crap. From the article, a new Star Trek film is in the works at Paramount with Andor's Toby Haynes on board to direct and Seth Graham Smith penning the script Variety has confirmed. 
While plot details are being kept under wraps, the upcoming feature will be an origin story that is set decades before 2009's Star Trek, as well as an expansion. How, how can you go back in time to tell a prequel which is now hamstrung by all the future events that it's now riffing on? How can you go back in time and expand the universe? You're not expand. You expand the universe by going forward in time. You know what the worst part is, though. This is the worst part, chat. Any any story, <clears throat> any story in the Star Trek universe that takes place before the 29th century is now a prequel. Do you realize this, chat? Because of the events of Star Trek Discovery, in which Michael Burnham, a.k.a. Diverse Space Jesus, as the critical drinker would have it, uh, because she is now in the future with the, the crew of the Discovery in the 29th century, because of that, <laughs> any Star Trek show that takes place in the 25th, 26th, 27th century is now effectively a prequel in the lore. Oh, no. <laughs> Oh, God, I hate Kurtz Patrek with such a passion. Quote, Meanwhile, the fourth installment of the rebooted Star Trek film series remains in development, with the studio describing it as the final bloody chapter in the, in the third film, 2016's Star Trek Beyond. The crew, what, damn, was it that long ago? Shit. In the third film, 20, that's eight years ago, folks. Eight years ago? Dude, <laughs> Let it, in the words of Captain, per, uh, in the words of Captain Kirk, let them die. <laughs> let them go. Quote, in the third film, 2016 Star Trek Beyond, the crew of the USS Enterprise crash lands on a mysterious world boring after being attacked by the lizard-like dictator Krall. A fourth Star Trek movie starring Chris Pine was first announced in July of 2016. With Zachary Quinto, Zoe Saldana, Carl Urban, John Cho, and Simon Pegg expected to return. Chris Hemsworth, who appeared in the 2009 original, was set to return in the space saga as George Kirk. Oh, great. The father of Captain James T. Kirk Pine. According to Paramount at the time, Star Trek IV would see Pine's Captain Kirk cross paths with his father, who was a man he never had a chance to meet, but whose legacy had haunted him since the day he was born and drove his stepfather's hot rod off a cliff for no reason. During a Paramount Global Investors Day presentation in February of 2022, Abrams announced that a new Star Trek movie, this is the second announcement, folks, in case you're keeping track, uh, a new Star Trek movie would begin shooting by the end of that year with the Pine-led crew. Uh, with the, <laughs> the Pine-scented crew, that's what I'm going to call them, the Pine-scented crew. Pine and his Pine-scented co-stars reportedly had no idea that Paramount was moving forward with yet another Star Trek film with fresh Pine scent, which was eventually removed from the studio's film slate in September of that year. Haynes recently directed six episodes of the Star Wars <coughs> Disney Star Wars series Andor, beloved by Mahler, a.k.a. The Longman, starring Diego Luna as the titular role. He also helmed the Star Trek-inspired episode of Black Mirror, titled USS Callister, which, I admit, disgusting, woke, and uh, nihilistic as it was, I liked. The captain liked. But it's, it's anti-Star Trek. It's Kurtzman Trek uh, that's unironic Kurtzman Trek is what it is. Quote, Haynes is repped by WME and attorney Peter Nelson, who is that, who cares? Graham Smith is best known as the author of the best-selling novels Pride and Prejudice and Zombies and Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter. He also wrote and produced 2017's The Lego Batman Movie. Graham Smith is ripped by WME and attorneys, blah, 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 blah. There you have it. There you have it, folks. A new, a new Star Trek film is in the works with fresh Chris Pine scent. For all day freshness. <laughs> I don't know what the fuck that is. <laughs> so uh, I'm cracking up, folks. They're trying. They're, they're doing me head in. They're doing me head in, as you would say, Star Fury. Uh, the Callister episode was freaky. Yeah, that's a tough one because I know what they're doing. They 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 sort of did the. They sort of gave Star Trek the kind of uh, 
kind of the Ryan Johnson treatment a little bit, but because it was its own separate world and it was meant to be kind of a parody, uh, a Twilight Zone episode, I could sort of forgive it. But yes, it was... It, but let, let's leaving aside, you know, just the fact that it's boring, that this is such an overused trope. It was a good episode, though. I mean, it was really good. I liked it. I know. I know. It's full of the message. But I just, it's really well written, though. So, hey, when it's good, it's good. Also, there is a really great episode of Black Mirror in the final season with uh, Aaron Paul, who played Jesse Pinkman. And uh, what's his name? Oh, he was like the he was like the teenage heartthrob back in the '90s. Uh, Josh Hartnett. Josh Hartnett. He's he plays. They play these astronauts who have robot bodies on Earth, and once again, I think I've it was something like the word C was in the name of the episode. Something like that. Uh, really good episode as well. Horrific, horrific. Like Black Mirror is a disturbing, dark, nihilistic show. Uh, and Star Fury, it's, it's, you would love it. You would love it. <laughs> what? Uh, no, but seriously, Star Fury, do you like Black Mirror Star Fury? Let me know. Let me know what you think about it. Dude, you know, but the worst thing in that headline is that they're working on an origin, a prequel, another prequel. Oh, great. That'll be awesome. I'm so excited for that. Uh, yeah, what else do we have? Oh wait, no, that's that's old stuff there. I know I had some a couple other things in the stack of stuff. There was this article about the X-Men ratings bombing, but like I read the article and I was like, ah, I don't know. The the evidence seems a bit thin. Seems a bit thin on that. So maybe we'll just uh we'll wrap it up with uh, one more story here. Uh try this from Cosmic Book News. Pirates of the Caribbean is getting rebooted, confirmed by producer, could be a female-led version which had Margot Robbie attached as one at one time, but now is rumored to have a new actress. Well, at least Margot Robbie is a talented actress, but my God, folks. <laughs> my God. Can you say dead on arrival? Can you say DOA? I mean, can... You think the Marvels went down in flames? You think Echo went down in flames? You think the Acolyte is about to go down in flames? You think the Ray movie is going to go down in flames? Can you even imagine a, a Pirates of the Caribbean just packed with girl boss crap? Oh, it's going to be such a disaster. Dude, look, look, look. Here's the deal with Pirates of the Caribbean. There was a time when... Look, when it came out, I was all about it because I am a nautical man, if you don't know. The captain is a nautical man, and they did create the era pretty faithfully. The The costumes, the ships, great. And, uh, and I loved the cannons uh, when they were there. There weren't enough of them. Uh, but when the cannons were firing, they were awesome. Okay, great. And they captured they captured the kind of snooty British officer way of doing things and, and good sword fights and all that. And I love all that. But the fact of the matter is, uh, Johnny Depp in that first P Pirates of the Caribbean was an incredible character. And that was down to his performance. He stole the show. And he wasn't supposed to, folks. Orlando Bloom was the principal character in that first movie. Orlando Bloom is fine. He's fine. But he's analogous to Luke Skywalker in A New Hope. He's not the he's not the one everyone likes. You know, let's face it. Luke Skywalker is an annoying teenager in A New Hope. Han Solo is where it's at. Okay, so so that's the thing. Is like uh, Orlando Bloom's character was meant to be the kind of Luke Skywalker, but it was Johnny Depp who came in and stole the show like Han Solo, and he was brilliant. And then it just became his show. It was like, well, screw Orlando Bloom. His story got less and less interesting and less and less relevant as the story progressed. And Kira Knightley sort of got away with being a girl boss because she was hot. Because she was hot. So what I'm saying is, even on a good day, Pirates of the Caribbean, at this point, in my view, is a long shot. These idiot writers that they have now, uh, they're not capable of rebooting Pirates of the Caribbean with a male cast. Uh, with with th they're not capable of recreating. I think even a serviceable Pirates of the Caribbean without Johnny Depp, 
Now you throw in the mix that they stuff it full of girl bosses. Oh my God, <laughs> folks, it's going to be a Marvel's level disaster. It's going to be a disaster. Star Fury says YouTube kicked me for making a crass. Oh, a Star Fury. Jeez. <laughs> oh, I'm going to put on moderation just so that you don't get yourself kicked from. How how bad is it, Star Fury? Can you come back? Are you just like booted from this stream? Or like, are you like, do you have to make a new account? <laughs> Please tell me you don't have to make a new account. <laughs> Star Fury, just avoid the World War II stuff, okay, man? <laughs> just avoid that. Listen, listen. I know that it sucks being on a platform that is not, shall we say, free speech absolutist, okay? I know that kind of sucks. Um, and I'm not a fan of it either. My personal view, my morality is I'm a free speech absolutist, okay? Um, but since it is Easter Sunday, why don't we go to uh, sweet baby Jesus for some advice here? And uh, there is a there is a very important verse in the Bible in which Jesus is being asked, Hey, shouldn't we fight the Pharisees at every turn? Shouldn't we stop paying our taxes to the Roman Empire? I mean, if we really do think God is the highest law, uh, shouldn't we just say, screw the government and, uh, and, and owe nothing to any? And, and what does Jesus say? He says, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and render unto God what is God's. And what I view that line as meaning is, uh, is basically what Jesus is saying is we live in the world we live in. And... There, there's a difference between, there's a line between our morality and our ethics. And our morality is our personal, how we live in the world and what we value and what's important to us and how we, we uh, show up in the world. And then there's our ethics, which are things like our professional obligations, our duty to pay our taxes, things like that. And he's saying, do what you got to do in the world of ethics. Don't forget who you are. And who you really owe your feet. Those two things can live in the same place. So what I'm saying is, yes, it sucks. Uh, but YouTube has given us a great platform. And an, I could not build this community without YouTube. And so I'm very grateful for that. So while I may disagree with YouTube's policies, we are on YouTube's platform. And so all I would say is, render unto Caesar what is Caesar. And in, and in Discord, you can render unto God what is God's. <laughs> if that makes any sense. Star Fury says, I am listening, but can't message. YouTube kick kick me for making I'm not even gonna say it, Star Fury, because it's it's not it's nothing uh it's nothing, you know. I'm just not even gonna risk it, okay? It's not that bad though. Uh are is it a timeout, Star Fury? Is it a timeout? Can you come back? All right, let me stay on the di by the way, it's good to see you on the Discord. I think you just joined stay let me know how that's going. We'll we'll get you back in here. Uh, Star Fury's one of my mods, man. They booted my mod. <laughs> I, I did. Now, now maybe maybe I shouldn't have him as a mod. <laughs> it's probably I probably shouldn't. <laughs> but what can I say? Uh, I trust Star Fury. I trust him. Uh, let's see. Benham says they basically shat on it for two hours on open bar and spent maybe one third of the F and T discussion, giving it tepid praise. They seem more concerned about pushing back on the enthusiasm. What are we talking about? Uh, let's see. Oh, oh, uh, you're talking about Dune part two. You're saying was anyone else completely baffled at the incredibly dismissive and critical attitude that the entire F and T and G and G crew seem to have towards Dune part two. Um, yeah, that's an interesting point. Yeah, I'm, I'm very, I differ from them a lot on Dune Part 2. Actually, most of them liked it, I think. I think it was Jeremy. Jeremy was the one that kind of, and, and they all kept saying, like, I really liked the movie. I just had these issues with it. Um, um, they frequently disagree with my takes on pretty much everything. Well, for, for one thing, I am a great fan of Stranger Things, and I love all four seasons. And I, I actually, although it's probably the weakest, mm, um, I'm kind of 50-50 on it. I have my, yeah, I would say it's the weakest. Season three is the weakest of the, of the Stranger Things seasons. And no, actually, I take that back. I think season two is the weakest for me. 
I seriously mean that. I think season two is the weakest for me. That being said, um, they hate, like, almost Mahler, Drinker, uh, Gary, Jeremy, all of them. They all agree that season two and season three, especially season three of Stranger Things, was awful. It was terrible. And it was the death of the series. And then they all sort of love season four. And I actually kind of have a lot of issues with season four. I don't like that they converted the villain, the mind flayer, into a human villain. I don't like that. I think it takes away the Lovecraftian Cthulhu, you know, scariness of the upside down, and it makes it something less uh, cosmic horror. And I don't like that. I think cosmic horror is what Stranger Things is about. So I quite differ with them on this. Um, I'm fine with that. Like, I'm fine with that. I appreciate their thoughts. I appreciate... I would like to hear their reasons. They just never have... On that specific issue, I would like to know their reasons why they don't like season two and three. I can tell you, I do know there are problems in season three. They sort of turn Hopper and Joyce into clowns, and I don't like that. Um, they, nah, that's kind of my main thing. There's a lot of characters. They Oh, they turn Jonathan into a clown in season four, and I definitely don't like that. Uh, so yeah, they, they, they have a problem with characters staying true to their character in the later seasons. So that is an issue. Part of that is they just didn't really have much for Joyce and Hopper to do. Like, Joyce is an incredible character. Her journey in season one of Stranger Things is one of the most brilliant things I've ever seen. Her her absolute, her, her absolute determination to bring her son back no matter what is, it's beautiful, folks. It's beautiful. It's an absolutely amazing story. I love Hopper. Hopper is probably my favorite character in Stranger Things. Uh, they got him wearing Hawaiian shirts and being kind of a doofus in season three, so I get it. However, however, the story arc of the Mind Flayer in season three is excellent. I love that he's building this big flesh monster to kill to kill Eleven. I love the malevolent conversation when he's kind of in her mind in the form of Billy and he's confronting her. That was amazing. I actually think season four kind of ruins that a little bit because season four says uh, that the mind flayer is actually a human, is actually number one, who Eleven had years ago put in the Upside Down. I actually think that cheapens that moment a little bit. I like the idea that Eleven is being confront confronted by this uh, super alien entity that's like a god to her, and it's it's threatening her. You know, and it's just like, you know, we've been building it. For you. It's like, that was terrifying. It was great. They hate it. <laughs> like, that crew hates it. They hate that. And I, all right, fine. I respect Mahler greatly. Uh, he thinks it's crap. He thinks it's absolute crap. That's how it goes, man. That's how it goes. So I don't really begrudge them their take on Dune Part 2. I love Dune Part 2 as much as the first one. I thought it was magnificent. I left the theater feeling like, wow, I, you know, I just left this awesome world. Uh, I had a weird thought, too. I was like, every man needs to have a battle to the death, single combat in order to find his true destiny. <laughs> you know, I, it was, it, it's totally irrational, but I just, I had this primal feeling of like, that's what life is about. Facing your own death. <laughs> it's like, so I'm going to go skydiving. See you later, folks. Anyway, um, however, having said that, there are some storytelling, I would say mostly pacing issues in Dune Part 3 that I do kind of have issues with. There were a couple parts of it that had a weird pace. There was not enough Fade Rotha. There was not enough Fade Rotha. I wanted to see probably, I think that a, a good chunk of that movie should have been Fade Rotha just dismembering the Fremen resistance. And we really only got one good scene of Austin Butler's incredible performance as this psychopathic character. We only got one good scene of Fade Rotha blowing up the Fremen, and that disappointed me because really uh, the moment in the movie where Fade Rotha is tearing apart the Fremen, that should have been analogous to, hey, we're going back to it, Redoubt Productions, in The Patriot when uh, Tavington starts turning the tables on Benjamin Martin and he starts he starts uh, breaking apart uh, Taving or uh, Martin's resistance to the British that's a really that's a really scary run of the movie because a lot of bad things happen in quick su succession in save the cat terms this is a beat in the movie that's called bad guys close in it's very important every film without exception even if there's not technically bad guys in a human form 
there must be a bad guys close in part of the movie. And so I felt that in Dune part two, the bad guys close in was very weak and uh, which sucks because Fade Rotha was incredible and brilliant. I love that Coliseum scene with him. Um, awesome. Super awesome. I I should have just watched Dune 2 again instead of Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. But it's for you, Starfury. It's for you. Uh, what did Starfury? I, I can't even read Starfury's chats anymore because he's been he's been exiled to Discord. Link in the description. <laughs> is Starfury saying to Fu Man Blue, I am misunderstood? <laughs> oh, Starfury. You are. You are. Our sweet prince, Starfury. He's a misunderstood man. Um, yeah, I feel you, though, Brett Br Benham. I kind of feel you on, like, it. it's, it. I don't know. It's human nature, I guess. We're tribalistic by nature. It sucks when people we like and respect and and uh, we value their opinions on things and they don't, they don't see it our way. It can be frustrating. But it is what it is. Um, I appreciate their perspective on it. But yeah, it was kind of weird, though, that they did have a very they did have a very lukewarm response to Dune. I think a lot of it has to do with how how poorly received Zendaya is. And uh, I guess I'm a different breed because uh, I, I'm not a big fan of Zendaya as an actor, but I liked her character in the movie. Yes, I understand she had this kind of resting bitch face the whole movie, which I won't call the most charismatic performance I've ever seen. So I, I take their point on that. Um, but I thought her character within the world she lives in makes sense. And uh, I thought her story, her and Paul, was tragic and sort of heartbreaking. And that spoke to me. So I liked that a lot. Um, but really, really, the star of the movie, the star of the movie is Paul Atreides and Fade Rotha. Like, they, they are absolutely where it's at in that movie. So... So, yeah, I kind of get where you're at. Starfury says at uh, Benham, Oh, you're back, Starfury. Is your timeout over? Or did you make a new account? <laughs> uh, it says, I was frustrated with the failure to follow the lore, but I have loved the book for 50 years, and uh, so I am a tad biased. I mean, I totally get that. Like, uh, I understand if you're a fan of the books and you felt like it wasn't. That, that could be... Uh, I don't think there was a lot of book readers, though, in that crowd on uh, Friday night tight. So yeah, I'm definitely, I'm definitely not as lukewarm on it, Benham, as they were. I, I love that movie, but also I love Avatar and about half of them hate that movie with a passion. Jeremy agrees with me. He liked Avatar part two, but I do agree with them that it's weird that Avatar has no footprint. I've now I have offered my explanation of why Avatar has no footprint. It's because it's a, it's an, in, it's not an adventure story. It's not a go. It's not a golden flea story like star Wars or Indiana Jones. Um, it is an institutionalized story and it's about a dying planet. Actually, it's about two dying planets that do not have a future. It's about Earth is dying and humans don't have a future, and the Navi are dying because humans are killing them off, and they don't have a future, nor do they have any hope ever of defeating the humans. So that's why it's not selling toys. That's why nobody wants to go back to Pandora. That's why it makes $2 billion and then nobody talks about it, uh, because if that's what Star Wars was, it would have been the same story. It would have been like, wow! What an incredible world George Lucas just took me to. But it's depressing, and now I'm back to real world, right? That's the problem with that's the problem with Avatar. James Cameron is not telling a Star Wars or a Star Trek type of story with that. He's not telling a classical adventure story. He's telling a sad, tragic tale, a sh a Greek tragedy. He's telling a he's telling a Greek tragedy about doomed people. That's what Avatar is. So. I still kind of love it, uh, but that's what it is. So anyway. But my point was just to say that they all, most of them hate Avatar. And frankly, I think it, not with bad, not without good reason, um, but I, I enjoy it. And uh, mostly because I like Jake Sully's story. He's sort of a classic, uh, he's sort of a classic adventure character. You know, he's just in this, he's caught between worlds and he has to make a choice and he builds this family and he lives in this, uh, in this other planet. And I will say that Cameron is very good at creating lifelike science fiction technology. And I do appreciate that. 
Strangely, the Avatar future is very well thought out. It's very grounded science fiction. It's hard sci-fi. He's got detailed notes on like how all of the technology works, getting to and from Pandora, all of that. But he never explains it in the movies. He never explores it, which is one of my main issues with it. But whatever. This chat's probably sick of hearing my Pandora opinion. Stormcrow said something, and I missed it. You said... Uh, Looked into your message in Discord, just left you my character's backstory. All right, awesome. For That would be for the Fallout Dead Man's Cash tabletop RPG, which will be live streaming on this channel in April, which is uh, soon. Soon. I might, I might be going to the meetup. <clears throat> so we might have to push out the debut of that past that week. So we'll talk about it on Discord. We've got our Fallout server to chat about it. Um, this week, we're going to be working on creating your characters. And then we're going to have our session zero on Friday. So that's for players of the new Fallout show, which is coming out soon on this channel. And uh, just to kind of share this again, in case anyone's coming to the stream late, I created... I, it's going to be using the Fate Core rules, which are an open source rules that's very story-driven... Um, it's very easy to learn. It's a very awesome system. But we're going to be using the lore of the Fallout world, and we're going to be using, like, the weapons, armor, and uh, skills that you find in the official uh, Fallout RPG system. So let me show you this. There it is. So this is our... This is our custom character sheet. So in the Fate Core rules, every character has aspects which are narrative, story-driven details about their character, which have a gameplay mechanic. And I've renamed it Karma for flavor. And then we're going to have perks selected from the Fallout perks list. We're going to have skills such as lockpick, sneak, big guns. We're going to have the special system. I'm particularly proud of this chat. So uh, for the players, make sure that you go check the links I pinned because I sent you our custom rules. So this is how I'm doing the special system in this, okay? Um, because in Fate Core rules, there's really not a mechanic for special, but I gave it some thought, and I decided I think there's a really cool mechanic for this. Uh, let me just pull up my notes real quick. I just want to plug my Fallout, uh, my Fallout game a little bit here. Uh, that's maybe the document I need. No, it is not. Where is it? Fall there it is. I found it. So we so we did a little some homebrew rules basically. Um, and uh, by the way, for the players, uh, make sure to incorporate in your backstory. Each of you had an encounter with the mysterious stranger. Details are in the document that I linked in Discord. Um, rads rads will be a will be a factor in this. So, oh, dude, I got to talk about that. That's actually super cool. And then the special mechanic is this. So if you take strength, every point of, of special, of strength, that is, gives you plus 25 carry weight. Uh, perception is going to determine turn order, and it's going to be used in detecting enemies. Endurance is going to be used um, to determine how much physical stress you get, which is basically your health bar. And then charisma is going to determine how much um, mental stress you get, which is your psychological health bar. Uh, that's right. That's one thing I love in Fate. Uh, there's actually two kinds of combat. There's mental combat, which is like an argument, an attempt to persuade someone, or just a psychological trauma. And then there's physical combat, which is obviously like having a shootout. Every two points you spend in intelligence is going to give you an additional skill point you can use to buy skills. Agility is going to be used in defense against projectile weapons. Now, this is the one I think is going to be the most fun. Luck. Here's how luck works. Luck can be rolled in lieu of any skill, but the but the catch is you have to role play how your dumb luck saved your sorry ass. So I think that's going to be fun. So in other words, like, let's say you're in a bar fight, but you have, like, no melee skill. But let's say that you have four in luck. You could roll luck instead of melee, right? But the but the catch is you've got to describe to me <laughs> how you were able to win this bar fight by dumb luck, which I think is going to be a lot of fun. Um, and then also every two points you take in luck gives you an additional fate point uh, when you start a session. So it's going to be fun, folks. 
We're going to have a great time. And folks, folks, the captain doesn't do half measures in storytelling. The captain does not do, uh, you know, by the numbers dungeon crawls. We do epic storytelling here on the Swords and Starships channel. So get ready, folks. It's going to be an adventure. It's going to be an adventure. And you're not going to believe where it leaves you at the end. So the captain, cat, we're going to have some fun because let's face it, Amazon sucks and their, their pathetic attempt to adapt the Fallout universe makes me sick. <laughs> and so I'm going to do my own. But but to be fair, I have not seen the Fallout show. And, you know, Grace Randolph did say that I should not prejudge it. Well, I'm not because I'm basing, I'm basing this prediction on the trailer. I'm basing it on the trailer. The trailer is just like the Acolyte trailer. It's just like the Ahsoka trailer. It's just like the Secret Invasion trailer. It's just like all, it's like the Echo trailer. All of those trailers, they don't actually tell you what's happening. They don't actually give you a story arc. They don't suggest them. They, the Acolyte trailer doesn't even suggest a main character, but the Fallout show, what does she want, right? So that's my issue is I think that they are hiding the fact. I think they're hiding the fact that they don't really have a story in this. And then they release the first scene and she totally gets saved by plot armor. So I, I have evidence. I have evidence to back up my prejudgment of this show. Star Fury says, we always do epic and asks, uh, are you streaming? Yes, yes. I want to make that clear. This is a this will be a live stream on this channel on uh, tentatively. We're thinking Fridays, but I got to coordinate with the players and we'll see. I'm thinking Friday night. So after Friday night tights, you can uh, come over here and watch a Fallout RPG live stream. And uh, I will try to now I've never done a I've never done an RPG where I'm the game master on like live. So balancing that with the chat. I might, that might be kind of a, a learning curve for me, but I will try to involve the chat as much as I can. So show up, participate in the chat. By the way, you can call players on their bullshit. You you can help the GM uh, make his, actually, you can help the players against the GM. There could be a lot of potential for mutiny aboard. They're serious. Yeah, so. Stop here. He says, cool, more content on Friday. Wonderful. I Dude, I'd love to do it. So we'll see. No, um, this is probably going to be, I'm possibly the week of, you know, I'm just going to call it. I'm going to, I would love to do it when Amazon drops the episodes. That's kind of what I'd like to do, but realistically, I don't think I can make that. So what I am going to commit to is the week of April 15th to 19th. So the third week of April, is that right? Uh, yeah. Third week of April. So that's three weeks from now is when it's going to debut. Uh, and we're going to do uh, 10 sessions, one every week. And uh, sessions, when I run them, typically run about four hours, four to five hours, I would say. So, and we'll we'll have the restream available as well. Uh, Bredham says, yes, I totally understand people not liking Zendaya, but she did fine in this movie. The problem is she's just okay at her best, and she was surrounded by heavy hitters. I totally agree. I, I mean, that's pretty much, I'm pretty much in exact agreement with you on that, Benham. Uh, wasn't terrible, obviously. Uh, you know, she, she's kind of in the category of Millie Bobby Brown for me. You know, Millie Bobby Brown is is amazing as the character of Eleven, and that's it. That's it. She kind of was born to play Eleven. And unfortunately, they keep trying to shoehorn her into roles she's just not ready for. And, you know, no shade at Millie Bobby Brown. She's a fine actor, you know, for what she does. But she's not, she's got a long way to go, right? And so I, it's strange that they're always, sh and I feel bad for her because I get this feeling that, like, she's, you know, she's so young all these Hollywood wackos are probably filling her head full of all this garbage about you got to be a strong whammon, and they're putting her in all these roles that are crap and nobody like the damsel thing. It's like, it's like, dude, I hope she's got someone with, uh, with a good head on their shoulders that gets her some good advice so she can actually have a real career and do challenging roles that are complex and interesting. Uh, that whole stranger things group of kids are kind of in a weird like like Finn Wolfhard in in Ghostbusters 
he's kind of an odd one for me. He's not a great actor either. So it's like, and his character in Ghostbusters is almost, he would be the the most deletable character, except that the mom is the most deletable character in the new Ghostbusters movies. I have never seen a character less suited to the role they put her in in Frozen Empire. She is a soccer mom with no scientific knowledge whatsoever who did not like her father Egon's legacy and and was estranged from him who for some reason is running the Ghostbusters. What? <laughs> it's so bizarre. And she's boring. Oh my God, she's so boring. <laughs> she's the most boring vanilla. She's like the mom in a freaking orange juice commercial. It's awful. It's awful. So, uh, so yeah. So yeah, there's lots of problems there. I'll tell you what, I I really don't like Zendaya as MJ in the Tom Holland Spider-Man movies, but I will tell you this, Spider-Man No Way Home, her storyline with Peter was so well written that once again, just like in Dune 2, she I I warmed up to her. But part of it was she wasn't being such a B.I. itch, you know? It was like she actually had like a tender side, you know, in uh in No Way Home. So she kind of won me over in No Way Home. And even her kind of oddball negative personality started to kind of... It started to worm its way in because she kind of balanced it with... I, I think this is kind of the key. Like, if you notice in No Way Home, she encourages Peter. Like, when Peter is seriously has his dark night of the soul, when Aunt May has just passed away, uh, Aunt May's been killed by the malevolent Green Goblin, uh, which, by the way, Green Goblin is my favorite Spider-Man villain, and Willem Dafoe is, like, one of my favorite all-time live-action performances of a villain, of a comic book villain. Spider-Man is my favorite superhero of all time. So so uh, seeing seeing him at that low, and then, and then her character, you know, coming to his rescue in the sense of, like, encouraging him, and like helping him pick himself back up. Like, you know, that's the kind of, that's like Rocky and Adrian, like that's classic right there. So, so she kind of won me over in spite of Zendaya. And again, nothing against Zendaya. I'm only commenting on her work. I'm not commenting on her as a person. I'm just saying her work as an actor just leaves much to be desired. So I get it. But, but the thing that saved her, though, is that Dune is extremely well-written, if not perfectly edited, because the pacing was a bit off. But the writing is brilliant in Dune. It really is. Uh, so it was. it's a very good adaptation of the novel, which needs be said. Uh, Benham says, well said. Young actors, especially females, over-promoted, over-used by Hall. Used is the operative word right there. They are used. They are used to carry the message. They're filled with a bunch of bullshit about how they're victims and men hate them. You know, what an awful thing. I, I just think they get their hands on, like, like the, act, the actor who played Reva in Obi-Wan Kenobi. Look what they did to that woman. The minute she, she had not even, like, they hadn't even gotten any backlash. They hadn't even released the trailer, and they already were telling her internal, get ready. The Star Wars fans are a bunch of KKK racists, and they're going to come after you because they hate that you're a woman and they hate that you're in their Star Wars. They hate your guts. So you just better be ready. And it's like, look what they did to that woman. They had her ready to receive every criticism her character got as a personal attack on her because of the color of her skin. I find that evil in the extreme. I find that despicable. They primed her to be a victim when when what was happening was we were responding to the fact that she does. She is a she is not a she is usurping a legacy character, which is typical of modern Hollywood. She is a new character who is usur who is usurping legacy characters like Darth Vader and Obi-Wan, which is ridiculous. But look what they did to her. They filled her head full of a bunch of propaganda. They turned her into a victim. They made her believe she was under attack by a bunch of racists. I mean, yes. Is there an oddball once or twice out there who's who's just someone nasty? Sure. But everyone's going to experience that on the internet. Everyone. Everyone gets something like that on the internet. That's the internet. So so they fill their heads full. of So, so yeah, they, they're doing that to Millie Bobby Brown. They I'm, I'm amazed that uh, Iman Volani, who played uh, Miss Marvel... I'm kind of amazed that she has such a good head on her shoulders. Um, ditto in Yaki Godoy, who plays Luffy 
in uh, One Piece live action. He has an amazing professional mindset as well. You know, they asked him about, you know, how does it feel to be a, an actor, you know, like a successful actor? And he just said, you know, nothing is promised. I'm just grateful to be here and I'm just going to have as much fun as I can while it lasts. And it's like, that's a classy attitude. You know, I mean, I would say a bit fatalistic, but it makes sense. He's saying, you know, this is showbiz. You never know. But uh, so it's it's a weird thing where they 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 make these people um, who are young and impressionable. And they are also sort of at the mercy of these professionals because they're new. They're they're newcomers to the industry. And they abuse that power. I mean, that's really what Hollywood, the legacy media, um, even some of the shills, uh, some of the shills, uh, they are abusing power. Sweet Baby Inc., um, Black Girl Gamers, these are people that are abusing power. You know, that's really the line. You know, the people often, what do you mean by woke? What do you mean by intersectional feminist? What do you mean by radical leftist or whatever? Um, it's very simple, folks. Um, I have no issue with anyone who has liberal or progressive views. I have plenty. Uh, I have plenty of friends, plenty, uh, all of my life, who have very liberal, progressive views that disagree with me on everything. I love them to death. Uh, we have a, you know, some of them have changed their minds in recent years, by the way, um, like a lot. <laughs> trust me, uh, you know. Uh, and what I would say is that's not my issue. I love disagreement. I mean, I thought for a moment I had someone in the chat that totally disagreed with me on a on a on something and I was I was excited, not because I'm like, "Oh, I'm going to beat up on the No, because I want to have a discussion. I want to talk about it. I want to exchange ideas. I'm excited for that." Um what it comes down to is people who abuse power in order to use it against others. That's it. That's what wokeness is. That's what intersectional feminism is. Um, by the way, that's what old school Jim Crow racism was. That's what it was. It was an abuse of power against people. And that's what I oppose. I oppose it. I don't care where it comes from. I oppose it. And in the words of the Vedic on Deep Space Nine, evil must be opposed. It must. So, so yeah, Hollywood is, a, is an industry that, that abuses its power. And, you know, we've seen that very clearly in uh, recent days, especially. So, uh, so what, what was that star fury? I'm, I'm, uh, I'm spy. I'm eavesdropping on the, uh, on the chat, on the internal chat here. Blue man blue says, uh, I, I think I missed the context on that one. Oh, I know. I think I get what you're saying. Uh, I'm just saying if his dad had been a digital guy, he wouldn't have had the old movies after the net went away, LOL. Okay, I don't, I did miss the context. Um, Star Fury says, <laughs> I, Star Fury, you just got back from your timeout. Just, you know, be careful is all I'm saying. Okay, I did say that myself just a minute ago. So. I, you know, honestly, YouTube, it's a bit of a crapshoot. Like, obviously, if I'm mentioning the, you know, the the K the, 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 that I mentioned, I'm mentioning it for historical context, but it's like, you know, you never know with the, the algorithm what's going to set it off. But um, <clears throat> Storm Crow. What else? Okay, I think I caught up on the chat. Stafiari says, search for the mythic uh, Eastwood treasure trove of DVDs and Blu-rays. But the second mission search for is a working Blu-ray player. Dude, I am excited. I want to build a Blu-ray collection, like, seriously, like, big time. And you know what's funny, too, is uh, um, I saw in the store the other day Star Trek Picard, the complete series, on the shelf. And I thought, you know, as much as I want to own Star Trek Picard Season 3, like, I want to own it in physical media, I refuse. I flat refuse to buy any product which includes season one and two. Even to get Terry Metalis' brilliant season three, I won't do it. I will not allow one cent of mine to go towards Alex Kurtzman's shit. <laughs> so, so yeah. Uh, absolutely, absolutely will not buy it unless I can get season three by itself. That's the only, only situation that's going to work for me. Only situation is going to work for me, so... Yeah, chat. We've just had a barn burner today. Uh, five hours on an Easter Sunday. Are we just animals or what? Dude, I can't even imagine. 
Um, I can't even imagine what our Fallout stream is going to be like. It's going to be great. It's going to be lit. That's what the all, that's what the devil all these kids are saying these days. It's going to be lit. It's going <laughs> to you know, you know, that reminds me of the shill. <laughs> Remember the shill? She's like uh <laughs> she's like, "Wait. So you're telling me that Darth Plagueis was Palpatine's mentor and that Palpatine had him killed?" <laughs> which which is implied in Revenge of the Sith. And she's like, "That's sick." <laughs> like Grizzy's like fake fan. <laughs> fake fan, you are fake news. <laughs> oh man, I would just I, you know, the thing about live streams is they don't really they don't build your audience, which is why I'm doing clips and I'm working on some shorts and I'm trying to get that going. 5,000 views last month. Thank you. But I would love to build that Fallout stream into something awesome one day. One day, my dear sailors and starnauts. We're going to just... It's going to be a packed house. You will see. You will see. Stone Crow, send the writers to the gulags with no food or water. What? Why is the chap fighting? Don't fight, chap. Hey, folks, we're winning. We're winning. It's good news. Take a look around. The Wokies are in full tactical retreat everywhere. They're threatening lawsuits. They're crying. Oh, to wrap it. They're protecting their Twitter accounts because they're losing. And we are winning. We stand at the dawn of a new age, an Iron Age, an age of renaissance, an age of storytelling, an age of classical heroes, dastardly villains. And you and I will build it together. We, we are the media now. And I am grateful for each and every one of you, my dear sailors and starnauts. Thank you for joining me on the Captain's Cast. Thank you for being here. Someone said thank you when uh, we did our, our Fallout RPG planning session. I'm like, no, no, thank you. Because I, you're the reason that I get to have fun on a Sunday. You're the reason that we're going to have a great time playing Fallout. It's going to be awesome. Uh, yeah. So I think we're wrapping it up, folks. Yeah. And until next time, this is Captain Garrett saying I will see you out there.